wanna do it how we wanna, yeah, yeah. Stop trying to tell us to behave and go, go at your favorite age. Don't stop, drop, just stop and roll. We keep on cooking, no, we can't say no, so. We gonna do it how we wanna. We gonna do it how we like it. We gonna do it how we wanna. We gonna do it how we like it. Better leave your worries at the door Release that energy on the floor 
Welcome back to Rising Legends Golden Spatula Cup number three. And despite Morgan being a menace to me behind the scenes, he's still here, I'm still here, and we brought reinforcements. Stuart, welcome to the main desk. And uh, how have you been? How have you been liking day one? It's been good, no? Yeah, I was watching the whole of day one behind the scenes. It was super exciting to see all these different compositions come out. And maybe might not be as cool as Mod Dog, but I bring a bit of different style and everything as well. So I'm excited, honored to be part of the main desk again after covering some of the TRCs. Yeah, we're so happy to have you. And Morgan, uh, I know you're trying to throw me in with a curveball but tell me one thing you loved about yesterday. One thing I loved about yesterday is all of our convos and uh, behind the scenes because all of us flexing these bench press conversations, they never really get old ever. But one thing I really loved is when we got all of these lovely forecast three stars, all these lovely built over cash outs. That one HP win from Asad Fuego yesterday, I love these clutchy plays. And also when Lelouch just went fourth, I mean, first in four lobbies in a row, that was nuts. I hope that the last two games were just him testing phases and today he can actually go for again one more four wins in a row. And if you are new to this, if you're just clicked on the stream trying to figure out what's going on, Yemie is the premier region in TFT, according to some, not all, and Rising Legends is their circuit. So we're here to cover who's going to make it to our finals and then possibly to the world championship that's later down the line this set. Now, we do have a little bit of a recap of yesterday ready to kind of catch you up in case you weren't watching. I'll expect your apologies on that. So uh, please post them into chat, letting us know where you were because that's unacceptable. But nonetheless, we are keen on catching you up. So here is our recap of day one. Welcome back to Rising Legends and this is the Golden Spatula Cup number three. We have been waiting for this one to ki finally come around, not your way. And if you want stuff to go your way, we have something lined up for you because it's a new Twitter contest. Yeah, that's right. I keep saying Twitter, sue me. Uh, what the? <laughs> that's not our contest. The Nico cast is just gonna blow up the entire backline right here. Kyle and... Ooh. But again, it's just not enough without that heal. It does get through. Oh, okay, Rek'Sai did the job here. This is good, gonna keep this alive. All of these brawlers slicing them into Salami. It's a very quick matchup of both summits. Survives a few seconds longer, but I think the power isn't quite there for us, Pat. As you said, Morgan, this has become an incredibly close lobby. Noxians are getting right up into that Jace's face. They're starting to crumble the respawn on the Aatrox by a few more seconds, but the Jace will die, and there's just not enough left in the tank. A heroic showing from the Turkish King, but Shukyu will take first place. Prepare for trouble. And make it double, or triple? Triple, I guess. 
Zaya is staying alive thankfully to all that healing coming in. And that Ari is not going to be able to one-shot the Zaya enough. The boss stays alive, takes another win. Damage in this front line. Maybe she can take out enough units to serve a win potentially. Okay, I'm copiuming. It is going to be Lyris. We'll take a hit here. Asad Fuego holding on against a board that Lyris has built here. The Cassiopeia is one against seven, I think, if I counted that right in the last couple of seconds. That will be a massive loss. Then the front line is crumbling. The Soraka 3 is not doing enough. Gets charged a little bit of CC, delaying the power of the Mordekaiser. But check out the sheer damage that he has as he is shredding through boards left and right. Nothing will stay alive here if given the fate of the Mordekaiser. Nine Noxus board, Beakris taking this one home. And you can see he just chilling knowing that he's made it. And I know, Morgan, you were there as well, but give me a break. It was my birthday, so Richie treated me with a very special highlight. I think that's what's going on here. But <laughs> there was so much going on yesterday. Of course, a big cut into the players. So we do want to see who actually made it to day two, because that is going to be a big narrative. We'll talk about the Golden Spatula Cup later down the lines as well. But with both of you here, we do have Mena and the Northern Region represented, Stuart. Let me hear about that a little bit more. Who are you excited about in these top 64? I, I got to bring my bias out. I have to come on here. I know Counterfeit is also going to be in the behind the scenes as well, also cheering on the UK. But a player, you know, Blast at Moon, doing insanely well. One of his first GSCs coming into this. Lalana still in it as well. You can see on screen now, 41st, so just sneaking into that top 64. But I'm hoping, I'm praying that both of these players can do their best and try and make it to day number three. Because play like Lalana, it's super important to try and get them GSC points. From my POV, I'm obviously going to be very excited about Bricks again and Arzu. Sadly, we didn't get Den Denzitsu to make it to day two, but however, it was his very first appearance in any competitive experience. As much as I know when we spoke with him, he said he would rather keep it a secret, but I remember seeing Denzitsu before. We've seen players like Mujuara, um, Karino, so many other players from Egypt, but now we got two Tunisian representatives representing the entire region. And what's exciting is that both of them are from the same home country, so yes, I'm also keeping the bias, and I'm also sticking with these two players, but I'm also very excited about Lelouch, honestly. Okay, bias aside, yeah. that guy <laughs> wrecked Havoc and Lobbies yesterday. I've never in my entire life seen someone go first in four games in a row. And hey, this is not just any competition. This is the pinnacle of competitive, competitive experience between all of these players. So going first in these lobbies four times in a row, Lelouch is such a beast. He's a player that I'll definitely keep my eyes on for day two. I mean, absolutely same, right? Just a small throwback. When he won the EMEA Championship, which is what we're calling the Rising Legends Finals now, uh, I predicted that. So just just putting it out there, I, I know this player. He's a very good player when he's up to his best format. And I'm very excited to see him here. But of course, some more Germans coming through. Kevin Parker finally having a good Golden Spatula Cup is something I'm super excited about. And EXO also leading day one is quite cool as well. But there's more players that we do want to talk about. And one of them is RNG Uzi. I think I said it right this time, Morgan. Correct me if I didn't. We were talking about this yesterday. There were a couple of comms coming out of Uzi that we did want to mention. Now, uh, this player has, first of all, Build a windshield wiper Nila, Morgan. That's a reroll I can get behind. What about you? Yeah, same. I told you that I'm very excited about all these forecast rerolls. And if I meant one board, this is the one that came in my mind. Something that I really love, if you looked at all of these little legends, you see that they were Poro. So he didn't really go in the game with the direction or the idea of, yo, you know what, I'm going to do this. No, it was just Poro. He got that Ionia spad early in the game. He was win streaking really heavily. And just that one game, just that one game, we were very special not to see all these players having at least a Nila one on their board. So when Mad Black went out, he had the chance to go play both. It was a nine Ionia game, and it was also there was also a, a three-star Nila game. Uzi has got one of these. So the Ionia spats have them really well. Soon as all the other players went out and he had infinite gold, he used it. He got that Nila three, and she was just whipping wins right and forth. <laughs> Absolutely, but that wasn't the only Ionia Vanquisher board that we saw out of him, Morgan. There was another one coming in here at the very top, even beating Canvas in this lobby here. And 
that's basically the most capped any of these boards can be, right? Yeah, honestly, looking at Canvas's board, yesterday you could tell that he did have such a perfect mix between augments. It allowed him with Ezreal, which is one of the little legends that we don't see players, I mean legends, not little ones. These are the legends that players really have shut up line on to kinda after the nerfs from Beard Treasures like three patches ago. You see players still choosing Poro, Ezreal, and we've also seen Decog choose Twisted Fate. But Ionia is one of these regions that have been seeing a lot of the spotlight recently, okay? It's really easy to get one Zarya, one star, that can make your board stable just as Weedo was saying when we were <laughs> before even the stream started. All you need is a Shen frontline, Ionians by default get extra stats according to their passives, so it's really easy to stable with an Ionian board and continue going with it. I think the ease of transition as well between like the early game as well with, you know, going for uh, units like Jin and Set and Irelia and having that ease of transition into that four Ionia board. Going for something like Scope Weapons as well means that Neela doesn't really need the, the RFC so you can go for Ionia Spat instead. Every single time she uses her ability, she's going to get an insane amount of attack speed and she's just an insane carry right now. She absolutely is, but speaking of insane players we do have rng uzi fan with us today so welcome to the desk thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and this is your second golden spatula cup how are you feeling about this one in comparison to the first one that you played is there anything that's different maybe i mean obviously i have like a lot more confidence in this spatula because i have the experience from the previous one it didn't go quite well last time but uh, I took the experience, like, this time I'm not, like, very nervous, but experience helped me a lot in this one. Awesome. RG Juicy fan, it's, it's nice to speak to you, obviously coming from the ROEMEA scene as well. I've, I think I covered you a few times over on the TRC. I know the Lithuanian scene is growing and is really, really big. A player called Sponsorius was a player that you might know as, as well personally. What's the scene like in, in TFT over in, in Lithuania at the moment with all these great players? No, we have a lot of good players in Lithuania. Like it's growing like quite fast. Like we started like meeting each other like one year ago, like awesome. in set seven or eight. So we have like a lot of good players. Like we are learning the game together. Like we are discussing the decks, leaking each other, like uh, learning from each other. So yeah, shout out to them. I love it. I love that you spoke up a lot about how great everything is going on, about how communication has been going, and you guys are very cooperative. So give us more insights on these preparation groups. We see that each and every region always have some sort of preparation group that they practice stuff on. So how have these been going? Do you think that these prep groups really had an impact on the games yesterday? Or was it more of, um, let's say, solo effort? So are you giving them a lot of credit? Did these prep groups really make that effort in your insane gameplay yesterday? uh yeah of course like they help me like to to like see the different angles like i am like very one-dimensional player so they help me a lot like seeing different options like different compositions like of course i'm aiming to the ionia bars because they're like the highest cap available yep. but yeah they help me a lot with the with the tech like it, keeping myself calm like because i like to like confuse myself and get dizzy so they help me a lot <laughs> yeah we honestly as that. someone as someone who also likes uzi i can relate to that i love your name <laughs> by the way i kept speaking about your name for like five minutes from broadcast yesterday shout out to you man <laughs> he did it's true <laughs> now you already said it you've been leaning a lot into that ionia vanquisher line we even saw you really aggressively open fort in order to make it happen. Is that one of the things that you've been kind of leaning on to to reliably get the econ up and get a good position to actually play this board? Uh, if I don't get a very good opener, like it's it's okay to lose to like five five rounds in a row. But that game, I like I didn't have a lot of gold, so I just tried to lose to until the carousel. But after I got like one unit loss. Like it was my ninth loss, so I told like I'm second one. I'm going for for one all in, go win the lottery, and like that worked out somehow. Yeah, and that's I, really cool to watch. Uh, I think the the big thing coming into this is as well. You know, you talk about your preparation and things with with Sponsorius and the whole Lithuanian scene. What's what's like your goals now? Because day one was such a, a great result for you getting to your getting to day number two, I believe, for the first time. Do you think you can make it to, to day number three? Do you think you can keep that consistency going? 
I mean, if I hire hire a lot of my mind once again, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like, I need to win like two to three games. That's enough for me. Like, I'm pretty sure three out of six. It's like, it's more than possible. But of course, Mordo has to got me. <laughs> Mordo has to got me. I love that you say this now that he's not on the broadcast. So, how do you actually know that he's not in the chat trying to to bless your boards now, Uzi? It's something that we always love to do, so allow me to steal Makes' job here and do it for her because I think she gave me all the right to, right, Makes? Right? Okay, yes. Yeah, I did. did. Go ahead. <laughs> She's happy. We always love to give shout outs to the players. So you spoke about preparation groups. We spoke about how great Lithuanian players are. So is, is there anyone, anything you would lo- like to specifically shout out? It doesn't even have to be one of these players. Your friend, your parents, your friends. The mic is yours. Grandma. Yeah, of course, my friends, my like uh, co-workers that like allowed me to leave work early to just play in this qualifier. Oh my god! Of course, <laughs> wow. Uh, of course, Papi, <laughs> Chill, SSTS, Grushchuk, Mojo, like all of them, like deserve a special shout out. Giga Chat teammates, they allowed him to leave for him to go and wreck havoc in TFT. I love this. Spirit. Awesome, we <laughs> love it. Thank you so much for for taking the time to speak to us today. Good luck on the convergence. We'll see you out there. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the meta. Now, it is a new mid set. Many of us have been trying their best on the ladder, just like climbing and falling. Maybe you can relate to one of the two a little bit more. I know I can. I've been Heartstuck Diamond 4 for a couple of weeks now. It's been <laughs> troubling at most, but we do have the meta talks ready, Stuart. And here's a little bit of stat food from what was most played on day one. Yeah, I was I was hard stock diamond like yourself, but luckily I got to master before I was able to get onto the main <laughs> broadcast. Uh, so yeah, these are some of the crazy compositions we already heard from from um, from RNG Uzi talking about the Ionia boards. I think the Ionia boards are by far the most you know, most important right now, averaging a crazy amount. I think it averaged like at least one. Uh, one time or one person per game yesterday had a, you had at least one player going for uh, Ionia. So going for you know units like the Nila, uh, like the Zaya, with them backline carries. And if you have something like scope weapons, it means you can play these more flexible items that maybe you don't really see too much on units like Nila, like the Hextech Gunblade, like the Edge of Night, allowing Nila to rack up the attack speed as much as possible. And then you have the Cho'Gath by him as well. I think if people watched my TRC, I hated Cho'Gath because every single game felt like Cho'Gath Biton was just all over the place and it was just every single game you saw Cho'Gath but such a consistent unit even after he getting hit by some of the nerfs. Well my I... heart is with you Swart honestly oh. because I honestly makes completely agree with that show by them comes being absolutely dominant but just in case you guys are tired of all these real compositions I have a cheesy tactic that you guys can use if you can get to Ooh. level 9. This is a comp or not really a comp it's just a cheesy tactic that requires a very specific t- stake. It has to be one of these frail yard portals, whether hearth, home, on forge, or falars. And the thing is, you slam two rise units. Whether do be it with tricksters, double trouble, level up whatever gets you to these rises. Because here is how it works: when the frail yard portal comes, it applies a permafrost to everyone for three seconds. Now, if another cast happens again, or if they were already chilled by a Sejuani, an Ash, a frail yard, they get stunned instead. So having two rises on your board when it's frail yard. Make sure, pun intended, that you get everyone on that board stunned so that you cannot cast and you get a lot of CC for free. And this is one of the texts that only work in Freljord, so pay attention. You know, I love that you, of all people, presented us a Raj tactic. That's really, really nice to see come <laughs> out here. The double rise being a menace with the Freljord portals. But of course, then I have to come in and kind of give you a reroll comp, right? Flamed by Mordok himself. Take this one with a little bit of spice. He said it's not good. I'm not so sure about that. We've seen a couple of players go for it and we've seen it wreak havoc on the SEA servers. The Zinedine Zerwald, the Void reroll comp, all relying on getting that hurled online and then rerolling units in order to buff up your Voidling. The way it works is that you try to get six Void over everything else uh, you want to itemize that Velkos as your main carry and then the Kaisa 2 that you'll get later down the line. And the most important item to have is that Ionix because it buffs up the Herald so much. You'll be knocking down people left and right and you're going to have a fantastic time. Now, when you finally then get to level 7, you can pick up that Talia. And that's actually one of the boards that I feel has been working really well with 
augments like the Infernal Contract, but of course also something like a Void Emblem is going to allow you to hit those six Void while not having to spend as much and having an easier time to reworld. If you are like me and you like hard forcing comps, then you can lock in that Lee Sin and spam your heart's content avoid rerolling. Only people that are going to contest you are those Cho Biden players, and since Cho is a one cost, it's not going to be too bad. So why don't you give it a try? Maybe it'll work for you. Now, what have you guys been playing? I know Morgan is a little bit of a sweaty player. He tries, you know, like rice techniques where you put two legendary units on your board. What about you, Stuart? Uh, I mean, I've been really enjoying, I think, what you just mentioned with the, the Lee Sin uh, legend in general. I think Lee Sin as a legend is a bit underrated. We didn't really see it too much yesterday. We saw a lot of Poro and also Earth trying to get the spatulas. But I think Lee Sin as a legend uh, is really exciting to play because you can go for these gold augments like Trade Sector, which allows you to either play the reroll comps or try and go for the late game comps where you get the free refresh of the shop every single time. Uh, but I want to see more Twisted Fate. I think Twisted Fate multicasters are really, really really fun comp and I want to see more of that today. I'd love to see that. What about you, Morgan? Yeah, I already gave a very small shout out to that rice composition. But something that I really love to see in a comp that I've been enjoying a lot is Mordekaiser. No matter what you're playing, that Mordekaiser just getting ready, a small, a big one on the chest and then bombing up with his mace ready to wreck havoc through the entire board is one of my favorite compositions. You don't have to have scope weapons for it. You can just slam a rapid fire and he already wrecks from all of these backline units. And when he kills someone during his ultimate, the realm of death, he takes their abilities. So he becomes really tanky and still deals a lot of damage. I love watching Mordekaiser boards just 1v9. I agree, you know, I've been enjoying a little bit of Mordekaiser and especially those nine Noxus boards that we got treated to. I think those are incredible to watch. So hopefully we're going to see some more madness on the emblems out there. But to kind of give you an information of where we are, because I think I'm at home, but we're also someplace else in thought, which is the Golden Spatula Cup number three, right before the big final. So mark that in your calendars. October 20th to 22nd is when we'll be in studio. We'll have our little finals of the EMEA and we'll decide who's going to make it all the way to the global championship and who's going to be our EMEA champion. So don't miss that. It's going to be an absolute blast. We're looking forward to that. But of course, uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a sneak idea, there is a championship behind that that you might also want to watch some place, some date. Now, uh, something in our Golden Spatula Cups are those Golden Spatula Cup points, Stuart. Would you mind explaining how they work and how it all comes together? Yeah, of course. So the, the Golden Spatula Cup, obviously we have three of them throughout the, uh, the, the entire set and each player is going to be trying to rack up points. Now, these points are going to add up out over time with each of these Golden Spatula Cups and then the top 21 players will then get into going for, you know, going to the EMEA finals. And that's what the players are all battling for today, because this is the final chance for all of these players to try and get them points, which is going to be, you know, really, really important. It is going to be, and everybody in day two gets those Golden Spatula Cup points. That's a little bit of a change that we had in comparison to the previous set, set eight. So now we are not entirely sure on where that cutoff is going to come in because everybody has a little bit more points, so it's going to move up just a little bit. But why don't we have a look at our current Golden Spatula Cup points leaderboard. Here are your top 32, and the point on the right-hand side marks who's still uh, in contention to get some more points. So those are players that can still make it, that can still rack up the points to need. And uh, that's going to be a big topic for today, whether or not they, they make it to day three, how many points are we getting, specifically for players that only have like one golden spatula cup down the line. If you're looking like somebody like Little Bit Pro down there, well, he's not playing anymore, bad example, like Canvas, who has 45 <laughs> points. He wants to get as many points as possible and the placement here matters. So that's going to be a big point for all of these players to get as high as possible on that day too, whereas the top 16, Morgan, they're looking a little bit more comfortable. 
Yeah, to be honest, looking at all of these players, you can tell that only Skivius and Sonar so far have had over 100 points. However, it doesn't really mean that they have 100% made sure that they are qualifying if they weren't really sure about Golden Spatula Cup 3 points. Because again, someone like Sonar yesterday is one of these legends that we lost yesterday in day one of the Golden Spatula Cup 3 makes, which was an insane surprise for me. Same thing goes with Enzo. Enzo also did not end up qualifying yesterday, so these players been quite unlucky when it came to Golden Spatula Cup 3, but at least they have a lot of points that make sure they do qualify for the EMEA Finals. So, despite the fact that if not might have had the best run, Golden Spatula Cup 3, they already had some very good history in Golden Spatula Cup 1 and 2, so they qualified to EMEA Finals already. We'll see. There's also ladder spots that go into EMEA Finals and the Golden Spatula Cup precedes the ladder spot. So, for example, if Lelouch now qualifies in the Golden Spatula Cup, that makes room on the ladder for one more person to kind of scoot in and get another slot. So it'll all come down to how this cup plays out on who is going to go into the EMEA Finals. But we do have something else. And today it is not going to be a meme picture. Can you hear my cats? They're being crazy right now. But uh, we do have our socials contest, Morgan. So why don't you take me through what I need to do here? All you need to do is go on our Twitter and you're going to see the tagline at TFT Esports Semia. And right now we have another set of units for you guys to choose from. Ilawi and Milio and Melzahar. You guys have to decide what to do with these. Do you buy the Ilawi? Do you force her? Do you sell her? Same thing goes for the Milio and the Melzahar. Now, you need to come up with the funniest answers as much as you can. And of course, the funniest answers are going to be given a free egg. Maybe a bunch of eggs. I don't know. Depends on how generous the mods and the admins feel. So all you need to do is go on Twitter. Give us your best answers. Tell us which one are you buying, forcing, or deleting on TFT Esports Simia on Twitter. Only there on Twitter. Oh, wait, that's the wrong direction. Only there on Twitter. And then you can actually win one of these eggs. Yeah, only there. I mean, feel free to also be funny in our chat. But of course, I'd prefer it if you also were funny on Twitter and everywhere else. So just keep the memes rolling. And with that, we also want to shout out our co-streamers because there's a lot of them, Stuart. And we are trying to get everything covered that EMEA has to offer. I mean, EMEA is huge. You've got so many different languages, so many different countries that we want to make sure that we you, we have you covered. So if you want to go check out one of these co-streamers, they're all amazing people as well. I know Maisie is sitting uh, down there as well. So, you know, if you're a fan of any of these uh, people, then make sure you go check them out in your language and you can tune in to TFT in many different streams as well, which is super exciting. It absolutely is. If you're looking for the links, you can check them out. I think our scores are pinned to chat, so click those. And then on the very front page, you will find the co-streamers as well. Now, for today, we do have a lot of exciting players. I cannot wait to see them. I've been saying the Golden Spatula Cup 3 this time is the most stacked tournament. So really quickly, Morgan, one player you're looking forward to today to make it to day three, hopefully. Uh, one player, just one? Just one. Um, I know okay. it's a hard choice. Bricks, bricks. I'm gonna be shutting out. Okay. All right. What about you, Stuart? I'm gonna have to go for for Ging. I think after yesterday's performance, you know, he had a bit of a slow start, but went one two one two at the end yesterday. So I think he's gonna carry on that momentum and blast through today, number three. I will look forward to both of them. Personally, I really hope Kevin makes it. So we'll see how they do down the line. Here is game number one with your in-game casters, Counterfeit and Wita. Thank you so much. It's going to be absolutely a fantastic day of play. Of course, we don't, you know, we saw so many players being cut away yesterday, but I do want to bring front and center some of the historical concerns or recent historical concerns come with this one. I mean, coming out of GSC 2, we saw France just absolutely taking over the shop, getting top two finishes in every single day, and even a top three finish in day two. Day one of this tournament has been a little bit different. It definitely has, right? And that's something you gotta keep in mind here that's gonna be really interesting to follow is that we know how stacked this French scene is, but are they gonna be able to lay claim to, to yet another GSC, right? That's the big thing we gotta keep in mind here. Absolutely. I mean, with again, with Sasa from Germany being our only two-time GSC champion, certainly Germany are in the spotlight. And again, taking first and third place out of day one is no mean feat at all. But as we come into our next lobby, we're going to be seeing some of those big names 
from day one. So Exo, of course, who did take first place in day one, didn't get any bot fours at all. We showing us if he kept up his form between days one and two. Yeah, and we also have some interesting players in here as well. Like Karus, this is his first GSC, right? This is the first time he's also like first day two for him, right? Be Chris first uh, day two of a GSC does sat. Noel is back, right? Had a good G had, a, had a day two in GSC one, did not do anything in GSC two. Same thing goes for Snooty, right? These are all players that need really strong performances today, making it through the day three, and then even then tomorrow, they have to have absolutely amazing performances if they want to make it to the Rising Legends finals here. So I'm honestly just super excited for everything that's going to happen here in this lobby. I think it's a particularly big day for Ging and Caro as well. You know, certainly for Turkey coming in with 15 players. These two in this lobby are the last remaining players from those 15 to survive in the tournament as well. And our Danish players, both of the remaining ones in the tournament from the three that started are in this lobby as well. So it's a very good measure of how the day is going to be going based on this lobby. Yeah, I mean, uh, yes. Uh, but also looking at this, like, I think like I'm super excited to see like how the meta is going to, to kind of warp around. Because we, we saw in the pre-show as well, it has been a very science-centric meta, right? It's absolutely insane. Like 169 times I believe it's been played yesterday, 4.12 average. That's just kind of insane looking at it here. So we are going to be starting out with Fresh Sanctum potentially or Cardinal Arcology. That was a little bit difficult for me to say. <laughs> Yeah, always nice to have these new words that you just never get in any other context in the world being thrown in here. I'm pretty sure there's a dartboard which was made out of a thesaurus that is why we end up with some of these names. Yeah, when you're going with the French Sanctum, I think this is a really interesting one for sure because there are a lot of small things you can do to kind of get your get them get them sooner, right? Because like. You can play on one free, for example. You can play some weaker uh, ranged units and then backline a, a frontline unit, right? To kind of just guarantee that your frontline unit may, might die and you get an extra tick of fresh signs. Oh boy. So, so again, let's let's bring us out to the big pitch, of course, because yeah, we've got six games across the whole today. We'll be cutting away 32 of our 64 players. We've already mentioned, you know, as expected, we've seen that you know we've got ourselves a lot of vanquishes in play but in terms of any of the kind of more unusual comps from day one are there any ones that you would like to see our players move into maybe in this lobby or just in this day overall a little bit more i mean i think that mordecai's might even be a little bit underrepresented even though it was like the second most popular forecast comp right um that's something we gotta gotta keep in mind um but also peter only a singular Ezreal, everyone else here is on Poro. We are in the Giga Chat route here, but Visor deciding to frontline the Aurelia here is a bit of a mistake, unless you won't be able, you should be able to get this Silk, this, uh, this Silco. That would be pretty extreme, right? Having a Silco already. <laughs> but getting the Jin in this example, if you backline both the Nafiri and the Aurelia should also get him an extra tick because he did also did that on the previous stage. So that's not gonna be the case though, but he is looking for a very strong tempo line here. Any sort of gold, he can hold the Nafiri pair, has to sell off, but if he gets like a challenger spat, anything of the likes right here, he could be in for a very strong stage too. Yeah, it'll be really fascinating to see if that does come in. We've got a few of different ones emerging here. Support cash, of course, one of those that allows access to some of those newly minted and changed around items. But you know, since we are in the graveyard and we've got the reward for the extra kills coming in, I'm kind of curious to see which which direction our players go, whether they go more aggro in the early game or try and sit back instead. Yeah, there are diff different ways of doing it because, like, ideally, you would like to have very close fights, right? That's the thing that you got to keep in mind here. But I think this is good. You can even start holding on to these and build towards an Ionia open here. Buried treasures. This is why you pick Astral Peter, right? Like, you get that constant flow of items coming through, and then you can kind of build from that. Yeah, we definitely saw buried treasures creeping out yesterday. And doing decently well, but one of the organs we saw make a massive impact. We can see Snooty Boo is very pleased about having this one. Is the boss, but he's not the only boss in town. Espat as well picks it up immediately. And they both got blood thirsters. It's just like looking in the mirror. And you like you also just see Snooty's camera reaction as well, right? He was also just kind of laughing it up just a little bit because of that. Because it is one of those things where 
you can have games where you sometimes see even four people click on this augment. It's like three people pl click it two one, and another person clicks it three two sometimes. And it's, it's kind of crazy to to look in the mirror and kind of see here that even though it looked like Snooty was winning that for a second, it actually is just gonna be S pad. It's like what the boss does and why it's so good. Uh, in the earliest things of the game, it's because it's so we'll talk a bit about how this affects the game going forward. Then you, you know, at least you, know, you come to the boss, you think I want to have a really strong say here. I'd love to have the three star version in here. How is this going to affect things for S Pat and for Snooty, knowing that that's a lot less likely than it would be otherwise? Yeah, as you're pointing out, it's going to be a little less viable to go for the reroll line, um, but also just means that if the second you get a two star set, that's going to be stable for so long, it's going to be able to almost like rocket propel you towards a, a an easy level seven, level eight transition even maybe because of just so much power there is going to be in that set. You have an additional frontline carry that does so much to kind of clutch up fights. Yeah, up against Ging's ball with stars are born. Again, for anyone who's unfamiliar, Ging, being a perennial visitor to the Global Championship again and again, doing very well. I think, honestly, you know, I know Turkish fans will always be very happy to see Ging doing well in any given game, but you know, given that we've got a couple of the bosses running around, it does feel like some of our players are moving more towards trying to get the more dominant wins that they can. Yeah, and also let's kind of stick with, with Ging for some. He's one of the few players today that does really have a lot of pressure on him in terms of making it to another Rising Legends Finals. King has been at every single finals that he's been eligible for in the EMEA region, whether that's pre or, pre or post Rising Legends. As you're talking about, he's made it to all those championships. He's such a good player, and he's high up there on the ladder standings. He's already on the GSC standings as well. So the likelihood of him getting a trickle down spot, no matter how he performs today, is gonna be very, very high. And this gives him a lot of freedom to just kind of play his own game. Well, Exo is going for something a little bit different here. He's managed to find the Void Emblem from very early on in the game. And this was a topic of discussion yesterday. You know, the Headbutt Herald composition. Certainly a decent setup, though not with the best performance. We know the Mort Dog and the Riot team internally weren't necessarily rating it, but it does seem like at least our players in day one were willing to give it more of a shot than perhaps Mort was. You know what, Peter? It's just it's fun, right? That's the that's the key thing here about it. <laughs> it it's fun. And that, that's what all matters in TFT is about having fun. But now also, when you have the emblem, it becomes a lot easier to kind of activate and play a secondary carry alongside the Kaiser. You can bring in the Fiora, for example, or any other carry that really makes a lot of sense. So that's the thing to keep in mind, because if you have to play all six Void units on their own, they can be a little bit subpar, and the Emblem as well. On top of that, once you stabilize, once you start hitting those levels, it allows you to get that Baron online if you find a Belveth. All right, so let's take stock of where we are. Visa and Snooty Boo, both on 100 HP. All right, it's Noel and Ging taking the L's in the early going. The rest of the players are sticking pretty much in the middle. Now, no, so Snooty Boo, of course, remember from before, one of our boss players, the Visor, picking up a cut above. And we'll check in with this board now, as this is something we haven't seen a ton of, but we have got an early move in towards making use of Nefiri, putting the itemization on her. Yeah, this was exactly the spot I was talking about when we looked at a spot at 1-4, right? The fact that he prioritized getting that Nefiri pair online. And what you are going to be seeing here is Nefiri is one of the most like most versatile AD item holders in the game. In the old challenger compositions, she was used to hold Fiora items very well. She just still does that, obviously. But now you can see here with the Rune Ants, with the Death Blade, we are looking towards a potential Sire line somewhere down the road. All right, we'll see how it does up against Snooty Boos. Boss board, we can see Snooty hasn't slowed down at all from the opening start, having beefed out his dark reflection in s -Pap. No extra items coming through as of yet, but we can see one of the weaknesses here for the set, that if the rest of the board evaporates a little bit too quickly, that he doesn't get to just free farm massive damage. I think this time will just about fall down and cut that win streak short. And this is very rough for Snooty, right? Because this is a pretty expensive situation for him to be in as well, economically speaking, because he has that two-star, uh, two-cost already. And also, he's lost his streak twice. And yet again, it's like every time he loses, he finds an upgrade to a two-cost, to a two right? Because last time after he lost, he found the set to. Now he lost again, then he found the Warwick to the popped up, right? So he's just getting these upgrades in a little bit too late. But someone that has their upgrades right on time, Peter, well, we are hmm. looking at an Evoker board with a Nico as well as a Soraka 2 already. Wow. I mean, we've certainly seen a lot of this in day one. It's worked extremely well. You can see 
Uh, Chris is just completely chill out there in the corner, very much happy with how things are going so far. I mean, yeah, to get the level ups already is extremely good. Itemization, of course, we know the Crown Guard, absolutely core to making this composition work already online. Things are looking pretty good for B's long-term potential. Yeah, and as you can see here, right, Vice's win streak has now been broken. He does have the, he did get the uh, fresh Sign proc in here, which was a component, which is good for him. But Noel is probably the only one with a consistent streak right now, right? You're looking at Snooty had a streak broken twice. And we can also see that the other player in the lobby that was on, Espat is on, sorry, Espat has a false streak, right? But outside of that, this is not like a hundred streakers or anything like that. That's going to be an interesting one to follow because we are going to be seeing less extreme measures taken around 3-1-3-2. And we still got to remember, of course, we're very close, as you can see, from Big Chris here, to proccing the first steps of the Yorix Graveyard. Again, the, every 40 times something dies in the board, we can see this will... Uh, you know, we'll be getting some extra stuff in to help push things further, so... And you noted right back at the beginning of the game that some of our players will be taking full advantage of this, just trying to put their weak units forward and get to that first drop a little bit earlier than they might have otherwise. Yeah, uh, I was talking about less extreme measures. Well, the fact that B Chris just finds that shit already means he can just go to level six early on, start building that win streak he was procuring towards the back end of stage two, right? Shen is normally such a hard unit to find, and it really enables this composition, right? Because he shares the most two important traits, Bastion and Invoker. This means that now when B Chris wants to go to level seven, he will be able to just get this composition fully online. But Ging, well, talk about being fully online, he has that show gap free already but peter there are no items on it right now well, it's going to rely on the pure base stats where the items are instead are on this cassiopeia in the back line who's got extremely good items so far i mean you know that just as long as the bruises survive for a long enough time cassiopeia will tear through most of anything that we can see here against the bastions she's having a lot harder of a time than she would be against nearly any other board yeah, another interesting thing that we can kind of see here was the fact that Ging's economy has kind of been saved by the fact that he got a lot of gold from the Freshest Sanctum. This is one of the consequences of the way these portals will work. So keep that in mind that over the course of the game, hitting these breakpoints here are going to be so important for our players because it can be a potential bailout somewhere down the road. Keep an eye on what King's going to be getting next. We've got more itemization to potentially make the Cassie appear just a little bit stronger. Notice that we've got a, let's say we've got the three star going in there straight away for the Cassiopeia. So we're going to be able to actually try and fit in Noxus early on the board just to try and emphasize on where those items are. You just get that power level going, right? Because King has sacrificed a lot of HP to get this composition online. Then slowly but surely over time, he can round that composition out in different ways. Right, I think that's a, a, another thing to keep in mind. Very often you see players that they might hit the centerpiece of their composition. Uh, well, Snooty has found uh, in Mila already. Well, let's go for round two between the two bosses here. This time around, Espat says, my boss is just a little bit stronger. The Crown Guard Shield will keep him out on the field for just a few moments longer. But I wonder if that might actually be to his disadvantage. Because by the time his set comes back, everybody else is dead. Yeah, and that's kind of why you solo frontline the set here, right? It is to guarantee that you get the set online as soon as possible, but it seems like there's just en enough damage here coming through on the side of Snoopy by him being level 6, by exiting on the board. As Pat still level 5, was trying to breathe out just a little bit, get more econ going. <laughs> Snoopy, okay, um, yeah. Peter? All right. Um, I mean, yes. what? This is just not, this is just what Snoopy does. For anyone, again, for anyone who's unfamiliar with our Spanish friend here who uh, of course, it does some uh, some casting in the Spanish scene as well. Uh, he is a very cool and collector cast. We can see from his, his camera down there, the thoughtful face. Even when everything's going right for him, you can see that he's planning ahead to fit, see if things can get even better than they are. Yeah, we see here, Exarch has not gotten the, the Herald online just yet here, playing a little bit of a weaker board right now around the Sorceress instead here. That's going to be a little bit of an issue um, for him in the short term, but again, he has so much gold that he's probably just prioritizing getting to level 7 instead, trying to roll to some of those free costs. But it's interesting to see where this will go right now. I don't foresee anyone in the lobby taking out Snooty unless it would be Beakrush. That's like the only player I can envision right now unless someone goes massively all-in 3-5 after the carousel. 
Yeah, so B Chris and Snoo, the other two players to fear right now as we head on the carousel. Again, worth noting Noel, who has been taking the early losses, and Caro as well, dropping below 50 HP. We, you know, we had a little bit of a conversation you know, coming today about the idea of open forcing to try and make sure you get the board that you want, but it still feels like it's a pretty risky move. Yeah, and this guy's here. I mean, we're looking at instant pickups away here from the swords for, for some of these players here, right? So that is going to be an interesting one to keep an eye out for. There's so many swords here. Chris just taking this... Um, taking this knee riding, and that could be half of a beat, see, right? Because he already has that cloak right there. So it's a Nico towards him getting that Nico free already, but it's also another good slot item for him on that Nico. So he's going to have so much time, he's going to be able to push here. And I'm very excited to see whether him or Snooty are going to match each other before neutrals here, because it could have huge economic implications for both of the players. Very interesting to see where this one goes long time as. Again, we've got the two potential win streaky players up against each other trying to battle to keep those streaks intact. Four Juggernaut has been put in by Snooty Boo to make sure that this set gets absolute value. Somewhat spread itemization across the team, but I mean we've got you know, we've got the two vanquishers on the back line. Uh, I think things are looking pretty damn good to keep this streak going. Yeah, maybe there won't be quite enough burst here to chew through the, the choke effect. And he's not itemized just yet, right? There's no Bramble Vest to negate all of the crits coming through from these Vanquishers just yet. That's why the item is so important. That's why whenever you commit a Chain Vest to anything else right now, you got to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, is this really necessary? Because as we've seen, there's so much Sai around. It's so prevalent that you really do need to have a Bramble Vest on your main character to buy your backline that time. I suppose it's going to be a concern as well that Zaya stripping out armor permanently from her target to have a respawning unit that will just come back with a lot less armor than it would have otherwise just to die all over again. Chris though, up the top with the maintained win streak. Snooty Boo is no longer untouched. Chris's four Bastion board has been doing exceptionally well. We've noted before the backline itemization is just not there at all, but the front line is immaculate. Yeah, that's the thing you gotta keep in mind here. Yes, Soraka is obviously the secondary carrier slash just, you know, the pocket healer for the Nico, right? But Nico on her own at this point in the game with this item set and with her being a two star already has so much power. And also on that stone hex, giving her all that extra survivability. And yeah, I think that's gonna be a big difference maker. We get to see two pretty damn strong comps up against each other. We can see the Cassiopeia from Ging, a three star along with a three star Chugath up to full itemization. And you can see when the dust settles here, Cassiopeia is left standing on full HP, just ripping apart absolutely everyone. Yeah, now the speed cruiser streak gone, right? It's not the end of the world for him, but he would have liked to keep that going into neutrals, right? That's so important for the overall economy. It's an extra 10 gold he can like more or less not account with anymore. You can see Noel had that roll down on level three, on three, five, level seven, as we were talking about. He has already found the Neil, he has found a side, none of them are upgraded as of right now, but Peter, he has scoped weapons and a duplicator on the bench. And we know how powerful that can be long term to skip the need for the RSC, particularly on Anila. We've even seen some players manage to find ways to shove in Belveth as well, if the situation eventually calls for it. But I do wonder here, you know, Noel has got the lowest HP in the lobby, the least room to maneuver in the game overall. And we've had several people try and establish themselves further up the table as heavy win streakers. Yeah, but the important thing to note here is that because of the fact that he was on a Sire pair and he also has the Duplicator here, it's very easy for him to double level up his carries here if he wants to. He can play a little bit greedy here because he, look at the pairs, he has, like, he also has the Sichuan, he has the Shen right there. If he can hold on to this Duplicator for a long, as long as possible, his comeback potential, as you're talking about, Peter, goes through the roof because as we're talking about Peter, he needs that comeback and he needs a stat. Caro is also on low HP and also needs a comeback. We'll be going against Espat, the pretender to the boss throne. You can see that there's a seemingly Espat. Uh, it's going to be a little way away from getting any chance of hitting the set three. On Karu's side of things, we have got ourselves a scope weapon Mordkaisers times two. Uh, who aren't quite yet strong enough to be able to take down a three item, the boss set. But we know this is one of the units that's been attracting the most attention coming out of day one. So what you're saying, Peter, is that Kara is not like the others. Sure. I'm not sure where you're going with that one, but yes. 
You called him the pretender, no? He'll never surrender. Let's move on. <laughs> Well, what we've got here for Caro, whether he's pretending or otherwise, there's some interesting choices here. We know we've seen the Slayer coming in as well. Total domination, of course, you know, on the, on the vertical Noxus ball would be amazing. But in this case, it's going to be reroll because this is, looks like it's more focused towards building up the Slayer than the Noxus line. Yeah, and I think you're just really looking for, for something else to really empower him here. And the Enema Wizard, for example, or the Internal Windsor could be stronger frontline items. You're also looking for an item that could have gone on to the side here. Oh, I see what he was doing here. Because, like, with, the fact that, because with the fact that he has to reforge in line here, he's much more likely to find a useful item coming through. You're talking about Peter. It's going to be a Slayer centric board coming through. But look at this setup from B Chris right now. He is ever Ooh. so close to having that Soraka free, but he's still very far away from that Nika. Yes, yeah, so we've got another interesting situation where the, the most itemized unit ends up not being the one that's three star, but the one on the board is decent enough. At least we've got the Archangels there for the Serac on the back line to give some longevity. It's looking like even with a big pile of Slayers on the other side for Visa, including that Death Blade from very early on in the game, they're still not strong enough to deny Chris from starting to move back into control. Doesn't have the big win streak, but the units are very, very good. Yeah, another thing that's also worth noting here is that, again, it's another top 50% cut today. So as long as you're in and around that top four area for most of your games today, you will be in with a good shot. You're not in a position right now where you have to go for those first or eight strategies. So even though this spot might not be perfect for chasing a, a first place right now, it is going to be something that pretty much locks him into top four if he's able to continue his galloping instead of just being staying ahead of the rest of the lobby on HP. Yeah, I mean, he's doing incredibly well on HP, as is Snooty. Ging is building up a streak, though, below them in third place, so we'll start to put some pressure on the otherwise secure position. Caro, though, along with Noel, they both took losses in the previous rounds. You can see from Caro's side of things, of course, with that multi Kaiser setup, there is the beginning of something special here. But again, much like for Noel, I wonder if there's enough time to really make it sing. Yeah, you can see on the bench, actually, he's holding on to a Saya pair right now. So that's a transition that could come through at some point. I mean, Giant Slayer goes on both units, right? But again, has that scope weapons as well. So its composition kind of overlaps right now. It would be a very ambitious transition to pull off. I don't think he is going to be doing that, but it's something that he can kind of keep his mind open to should he spike some random units for the composition. And also just denying the Saya from the rest of the lobby is also very powerful for him right now. Honestly, it's a public service, but... I think, you know, since we've got the larger conversation and we saw in the previous round, the Morkais is coming more front and center. For any other players, you know, who maybe haven't been using the Morkais as much in the composition, why are people excited about Morkais right now when Vanquishers have been taking up so much of the conversation? It's because it's very strong to play from Noxus openings, right? Noxus openings are very strong, and also Mordekaiser in of its own just makes use of a lot of other items in mind. Like, it makes use of an RFC, for example, it makes use of the scope weapons. It's a, it's a way to go down if you're not on the... Like, if you're kind of already leaning the side route without the ADMs, for example, right? It's also just you can play it from ahead very well due to the nature of Noxus I was talking about. It's flexible, it just does its job incredibly well. Bison, who we haven't checked in with for a little while, it's running something a little bit different. So the challenges, not something we've been seeing our players prioritizing so far. We do at least have a really good set of items for the Fiora here and a very strong Jarvan on the front line. But the rest of the board maybe needs a little bit more to come together if Vice is going to come back from last place. Yeah, and we can see like his setup was also kind of leading in towards that Sire line. He's kind of been stuck oh. on a line here that is going to be on the challenge as well. If you look through the stats from yesterday, right? Sire was, uh, the Fiora Kaiser line was played quite a bit, but actually kind of struggled quite a lot. So this is something that you kind of got to, to keep in mind. This is not a spot you would want to be in, it's not a spot you play for, but sometimes you just got to play what you're given. And with the with the status of how contested Sire is in this lobby, it was not a really good go down. All right, so let's, again, let's take stock of where we are. A whole bunch of players around 40 and 30 HP. Ging is reigning up at the top with 67 on a win streak. Chris just below, and Snooty and s in roughly the same spot. Vice still seems to be the main, you know, upcoming headline here, because we saw that previous round, those Morkais has just ripped through this board like it was nothing. We just don't have that much defense here if the damage numbers on the other side are too high. Yeah, and that's kind of the issue with the way that this composition kind of 
is right now. It's not as explosive as it was before. It relies you on relies on high rolling a little bit more. It relies on you having like best in slot Kai's items, which are gonna be like very AP focused, and it's very awkward right now to play Fiora uh, as well when it's not in the traditional like KLB roll vertical Dimash lines that we don't see a lot of, but when we see them, they are incredibly powerful. But we can see that it can punish compositions that are not fully there yet, like Espat Spot, that is a little bit awkward right now, where he's currently bleeding out a little bit, but when you look at the, around the rest of the lobby, the bottom three just won here, right? So the players in the middle, they are going to be a little bit more fearful for that position. Yeah, we're really starting to see the, the HP really clamping down from third place all the way down to sixth place. There's barely anything in it at all. And Chris is, you know, is barely above there as well. You noticed before, one of the big you know, points here for Chris is trying to get up to that Nico 3. Because we've seen with the current board setup, this board can be overwhelmed by other players in the lobby. Yeah, absolutely. And Nico 3 is just such a massive power spike. We saw that a lot yesterday, just like how much extra power comes through having that Nico up in the front line. Great setup here, actually, if he wants to go for it. Gets the Nashes to for the Soraka. Will depend on the items coming through on the side of this Anvil, though, because he still needs that final Nico item. It's a little bit of a shame we've already got the Bloodthirster in there for Nico on the front line. As Invoker 4 will come in just to get those cards off a little bit quicker than otherwise. We'll see what the Anvil pops up end up being. At least it means the Chris can put a th likely a third item to tide Nico over until the three star starts. Espap, despite existing in the same lobby as Snooty Boo, has stuck it out and found the three star boss board that he's been holding out for all this time. Now can start moving up levels if and when he can start actually accumulating some more gold. And he's also rolling for a free star gin here instead of going down his just traditional route here. Very often if you're re-rolling the boss, it is going to be that re-roll on the Ash. But that's not been the case here. He's kind of been going down the gin route instead just out of pure desperation, I would assume. Because it's, it's not, as you can see right now, it's not the strongest version available unless the set is fully able to absolutely dominate the rest of this fight. The job in surviving there is actually Ooh. very big in terms of the time it buys for that Mordekaiser in this fight. That's got to be disappointing for Espat to spend all this time going all this distance to still not be good enough based on what players have got already as Visa will be taken out in 8th place. Our Polish player for the lobby, retiring early, is a little bit of a shame, but I think we did have lower expectations for the challenger board. The Snooty Boo, again, who's paired up with Espat in this game as the boss player, diverting away from 3-star in the set to instead reinforce the Vanquishers at the back of board. Yeah, and speaking of free stars, Peter, looking at Exo's spot right now, he's trying to chase down that Velikos free. It's unitemized, but remember, the more star levels you get across on your Void units, the stronger that Baron becomes. So it's kind of a twofold scaling through here. Ooh. We'll have to lock for this, and this is an issue because he is on his penultimate life here, most likely. And he's giving to Gig, who hasn't lost a beat since stage three. A Gig is absolutely monstrous. We can see the Choga has received the full itemization that he was missing from before, so he's chomping his way through the lobby. Unfortunately, bypassing the Baron is a big part of that front line. It's not being used to full efficacy, relying almost exclusively on the Malzahar to get the damage done. But Kaiser in the corner does survive through all of this. Will be the last one standing and just about gets rid of that Cassiopeia. And that's a huge win as well here. He also gets the extra gold coming through from the Freshest Sanctum. Allows him to not having to skip and lock the shop here. Means he continue rolling here. Finds the Kaiser too Ooh. as well as an option now. But would have to give up an Aatrox or the fact he has to give up the Choke F2. He doesn't even have a Choke F2 yet. That's just a consequence of the fact of the way that Ging has been playing this game. Yeah, I mean, we yeah, we were wondering initially if we might see the headbutt composition coming in, but it feels like that's almost impossible when someone else is stealing away all of your shows. But Espat taking the road less travel as you pointed out before. The three-star Jin is in place for Vanquisher, for Juggernaut. This is a strong front and back line, but how does this compare to, you know, where we normally see a Zaya in this kind of spot for Espat? It's gonna be very difficult. It's gonna be. It can be a lot. But it, it, obviously, Jin is a very explosive unit, but the items here aren't necessarily the greatest, right? And that's the thing you gotta keep in mind because, in a normal Saya composition, Jin is just there as an unitemized two star, just randomly one shots a unit with the with the Ionia bonus. Sometimes, the fact that you also had to make use of a normal duplicator 
to to make that gin for he's been sat on he was sat on eight gins for so long as well it's just a massive letdown for s pat but he had to do it out of pure desperation invoker emblem for b chris that is actually very spicy um definitely would have a solid chance to get it and with it being on a shen as well is certainly a nice little extra bonus then taking stock of our HP, we see Noel and Caro both on win streaks, both on 31 HP. You noted before, you know, that our HP totals are really clamping in on each other. And with Noel and Caro in the position now right now, they seem well set up for at least a top four each. Yeah, and actually a quick sidebar here. As I was talking about the fact that that Invoker Emblem was there, B Chris decides to just wander towards the Static Shift because it makes a lot of sense. He has no Shred right now. He's also still not on that Nico Free. He is desperately rolling for it. We were talking about that HP buffer he had, Peter, but well, that has fully dwindled away. Yeah, and there's not too much more to say here when we've got one Nico away. Of course, to point out, this would be a massive increase of power for B Chris. But the road is running very dry. He could be going against Espat in this round, who's also pretty much on a single life. Goes up against Ging instead. We'll see how well the Shen can stand up to that massive Cassiopeia single target damage. Yeah, it's actually going to be the same fight on both screens to a certain extent, right? Espat also facing uh, the Cassiopeia free here on the side of Ging. You can kind of see just like how much damage this unit produces. And it's absolutely crazy. Just wraps, it just like absolutely runs over everything here. But now the set free coming alive on the left side of your screen here makes easy job of this. But again, remember, that is a ghost board. B Chris faced the real deal, and that's why B Chris, he will be going out here most likely. Oh boy, to be short by a single unit of your final board, but it just it didn't seem to be happening for a while there for B Chris from Hungary. So we'll have to settle for seventh place. Snooty Boo and Espa, I think, both quite happy to have avoided the bottom two out of this game. Again, Snooty Boo being contested by the pledge immediately above for such a long time. But, the, you know, without the set three being in place, sure, but the rest of the board is still looking very, very good. It definitely is, but he also has just found that Sire too. That's very important to keep in mind because for the longest time now, Snooty has been rolling for it, and that means that he's like... His board has not been anywhere near its full potential. The question is that even if at full potential, can it take down Ging's monster of a board? Uh, Ging has been acting as the execution of this game, but this time it seems like it might be a little bit different for us. So, players, Snibu loses out on Anila. The set takes a long time to get off of the board, and in that time, Zaya is going to be closed in on and deleted. And we've seen before, this is several big targets are set to take down, and I just don't think, particularly at two-star, he's got enough to make it happen. The question is, is this loss bigger than Espat? Right? These are the, the boss players holding hands, that's kind of interesting. But Espat, at that solid minus one here, almost staying in, but we do have our top four, Peter, and one of them includes this eight void board from the side of Exo. Jeez, it's such a tough thing in a tournament to go into a situation and say, I found the perfect line, I know how to make this work, and then somebody happens to do exactly the same thing, holding hands, as you said, to fifth and sixth place. King, though, I'm still so impressed just generally with how strong the Cassiopeia uh, at three-star fully itemized is for a one-cost unit. Yeah, but also you gotta keep in mind here, this is not the traditional line of play for this competition. He's decided to lean into the Noxus here, staying on the Fall Bruiser instead here. Can even, he just like, he's even on Fall Noxus right now because of the fact that he currently has that Scion online already. It's just a, a good understanding of the different spots that are open to play in some of these very set reroll lines. And I was talking to some of the top players, some top players yesterday, and they were talking about the fact that while Chogath is a reroll composition, it's actually not the worst offender because it, the board is not necessarily set from stage two, depending on which way you want to go down. Yeah, well, it seems to be working pretty darn well to focus more on bringing in more surrounding units rather than purely on those bruises on mass. The Gangplank joining the team makes it even tougher to put Ging down. We see just ripping through the board, the single target damage, the massive AoE CC. Kara gets swept aside. I think grateful for the little bit of HP he's held on to to shrug off that loss. But we've now got three players on single digit HP and Ging on course to hand Turkey the first win of day two. 
Yeah, and Gang just rolling for those final lockers he could be looking for here. Wanted to get that rise, rise online. Wants to get the Aatrox 2 into play as well. And he's just been rolling and rolling desperately on this level 9. He doesn't even have the Mordekaiser 2 as Kara, I believe, picks up his second copy of Mordekaiser 2 on his side of the board. And that's Ooh. the board that Noel will have to face here. Oh boy, Noel, definitely an institution of the scene. See how he handles an absolute cloud of Mordekaisers. Interesting itemization in the back, which will scale up during the round. That Quincy's Rage Blade, not the immediate front loaded pass, it gives a little bit of time for Noel to build up the board and get the damage in. But the Morkai's is just not taking enough damage. Doesn't quite get for the tail end though, as Caro runs right into exactly zero HP. Yeah, now Exo also looking to take quite the heavy hit here off from the side of Ging. And whether or not that's going to be enough, he had a bit more HP to work with, but I do believe he's going to be going out in fourth, and Kara goes into third. It's Noel versus King Peter. It's like it's set seven all over again. <laughs> Certainly, you. We said coming into this one for Turkish players, only two of the remaining, and both of them in this lobby. King has, I think, always been you know the standard bearer for the Turkish scene. As we said before, and we'll say it so many times again, just, you know, Honestly, he should be paying rent at the Global Championship at this point. He's been there so many times, so very often. But I'm fascinated to see if we can see Noel pull off what seems to be a most unlikely turnaround. Does find that Heimerdinger 2, however, which will give him a little more front, a little bit more utility as well here. Now, we got to keep an eye out for the fact, where will this choke up go once it's through the front line? You know, a little bit more time is all this cult needs for Noel just to make sure that we can build up the Nila stacks. She's desperately firing away. The front line, though, is so ridiculous. Even at Bruiser 5, it's insurmountable. Ging does it for Turkey. He gets himself the first in spectacular fashion in round one. Absolutely amazing game, and we got to see the full potential of the Fresher Sanctum here as well, Peter. We got to see how players were optimizing to get those stacks in at the right times. And as I was talking about, that first Fresher Sanctum proc was actually what really enabled Ging, after finding that Choga free, to continue to roll down and not have his economy fully grieved by the time he found that Casio free as well. Yeah, I mean, I certainly did like the other compositions that were coming online here as well. You can only imagine what this game would have looked like if only Snooty Boo or Espat had gone down that boss line. If, you know, how much quicker we might have seen that three-star set and how much better those boards might have performed. But in the end, all credit to Ging. That was a spectacularly played game. Do you remember, of course, that this is only the first of our six games today, after which we will be cutting half of our players away, heading into day number three. Nikosm will be our interview for our break. When we return, of course, we'll have our analyst desk and then we'll be heading into game two. Hey, I'm Nico Sanchez. Nico is 23 in game. Uh, I am 31 years old and I'm from Grenade, Spain. Well, uh, I played many Rising Lion tournaments. The most were open qualifiers. <laughs> I mean, I've never made it through them. Yeah, I think it's very positive to involve all tiercies. You know, players li like me, I. I <laughs> I get a spot through TRC, so yeah, it, I think it could help players around Europe in this case to get more involved in, in TFT, to think they, they could get a get spot to, to Europe and to think they could compete. <laughs> I think the strongest TRC would probably be France. They've been awesome uh, over these years and Germany is very strong too. So I have to say something to <laughs> my community, the Spanish community, um, and so for me, this. they gave me a lot in, in last weeks. Uh, I'm here because of them. They made me a better player, and I know one of, of two of them uh, will be with me in GSC. So let's see them there. Yeah.
Welcome back to our analyst desk. And there was a lot going in in this game. But Stuart, you somehow predicted the future. What kind of five hat move was that? I, I'm normally known as the, the caster curse. I Normally in other games and also in, in other TRCs as well for TFT, I'm normally the one that caster curse someone. But hey, step aside, everyone. I'm not on here too often, but when I'm here, I'm firing. But what an insane showing from Ging. I think being able to carry on the momentum, as I said from yesterday, he had a bit of a shaky start yesterday, but then he went 2-1, 2-1 into his first game in day number two. Getting the first is absolutely incredible. It is 100% and a big, big key factor for him was getting this Cho'Gat early, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. This Cho'Gath early on was insane. But the interesting thing with Ging's comp this time around is he didn't actually go for uh, the six bruiser um, variant, which the caster has, you know, said perfectly during the game. Went instead for this Noxus version, actually slowing down on the bruisers because he hit that Cassio, uh, Cassiopeia three star really early on as well. Being able to get the Noxus, get that Cassio buffed up with pretty much perfect items that he was able to find early on. But yeah, Styles are born. Showing again that Styles are born again is another augment that you can use to try and reroll or try to get the momentum early on and get the win streak. So pretty much flawless game from Ging all around. Absolutely. And you mentioned it already. The Stars of Born was something that Mordok yesterday was also really excited about. Being an augment choice to come through that gives you a lot of direction and in tournament play that can be so valuable. Knowing what you're going to play, finding early strength points. Uh, and King found it naturally. He was playing poor. He wasn't even playing Caitlyn. He just saw it and he was like, yeah, guess that's what I'm picking. So really, really smart play here. And I really wish more players would go for that Caitlyn Morgan. Yeah, honestly, I think Caitlyn is a very underrated legend right now. And something that I want to follow up that you both mentioned, which was a very lovely point, is that Ging didn't really go with the six bruisers, neither did he go for the Malzahar carry, because he noticed that he was contested, all thanks to Chris taking that Malzahar, taking all of these units with the trade sector and everything that he had with the with the Void board. No, it wasn't, I think it was the Ixel, sorry, for the Void Crest. So something that I want to highlight is that you have to get creative with your boards, even if it's always Cho'Gath 3 going with Void, Voids, Malzahar 3, you have to know if you're contested. And this is something that Espat and Snooty didn't notice. Both of them held hands to 5th and 6th with the boss and long distance bells. So there was not a single boss in his lobby. There were two bosses and this time they were both demoted from their positions because none of them went top 4. So you have to scout a lot, specifically when your composition isn't really flexible when it comes to the unit that you're rolling. For example, if, if, if it was a Shogath, you can have a Cassiopeia carry. A Malzahar carry, hell, you can have a Milio Invoker Soraka carry <laughs> if there is no one playing with Sorakas in these games. But Snoody and Bre and uh, Espet, none of them gave any respect to that. Yo, someone is playing with my augment. You know what? They even took the second augment together. So both of them were delayed until they hit that set. And both of them didn't have the best items for them because they had <laughs> to slam it. Yeah, it, you know, I think the, the LDP is kind of forgivable, but going into the set for both of them already told them that they were going to need to make risky moves, and I'm not referring to the augment here, uh, in order to secure it. Now, Espet was able to find that set, but Snooty was able to find that Zaya too. None of them really had everything that they needed, and so two unfinished comps, unfortunately, went bottom for However, there is something else in this lobby that players contested or chose uh, equally, which is that scoped weapons pick. And I just quickly want to highlight that because I think it's a really, really good pick right now because it can work for multiple comps. You can play it with the Neela, you can play it with the Mordekaiser, you can even maybe make it work with the Vanquishers, with the Zaya. So it's really, really versatile. It's really good. It's not as terrifying and horrible as it was with Yasuo a couple sets and patches back, but it's still a very, very good solid choice. So if you see it, often it's an insta pick if you're on any of these AD heavy lines. Okay, so what I think wanted to also yes. speak a little bit more about predictions when it came to the next game, since you are the whisperer of who's going to be first <laughs> in that last lobby. We saw so many versatile comps in this game and we had a lot of diversity. So let me ask you one more question. 
We've seen Choga 3 rolls so many times. In the next lobby, what do you expect to be picked specifically after this one? I've seen all the diversity. Do you think we might see more 2 cost 3 rolls? Demon Flare, Riftwalker, Ravenous Hunter. Are these any good in the meta? I, I was want hoping... to see the Demon Flare. Sorry, but I really do. It's, I'm so excited for it. I need to see it. I, I don't think we've seen. I don't think we've seen Ravenous Hunter too much, if I remember as well. I think Ravenous Hunter we haven't seen too much, but these these hero augments in general are really really fun to um, to, uh, to to play and also to watch at the same yes. time. But in terms of two costs, I was hoping to see like a Twisted Fate as well. I think Twisted Fate is really good. And yes, going yes. back on the fact with the with the trade sector as well, I think trade sector and Lee Sin in general, as I said at the start of the day, is pretty underrated. Uh, even though in Biztex board in that situation, hit a really early Nico two star with the uh with being able to get trade sector hit the early shen as well unfortunately didn't get the roll down that he needed but i think trade sector in general if you can get that augment early on and a lot of people playing poro so there is that opportunity but you get trade sector early on you can again be pretty flexible like you do with stars of born you'd be able to either go for reroll comp or you can try and flex and try and hit them crazy early uh, late game boards yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we're sharing something else here because this is the final lobby that we're still waiting to finish for. Our friend Nemitis is streaming it because his player Ketzer is in this lobby. Utopia is the French orc that we're referring her to. And it's actually between Lires and Ketzer to finish this one out. We're waiting for this lobby to finish in order to get our standings. Uh, but if I see that correctly, there's a little bit of re-rolling going on here, Morgan. Yeah, aside from the re-rolling, I love that accent on the Lires. You just insulted Lires? my French accent in every single way. Yeah, ah, it's go. his name, yeah? <laughs> it's it, it, it his name, yeah? Okay, I love that. I love that. I don't know why, but I didn't have a breakfast that consists of baguette today. I'm, I only have some coffee here, so I don't know if that qualifies as French or not. But hey, we in men appreciate caffeine as well. So we saw a lot of re-rolls in that game. And we saw a lot, a lot, a lot of three-star units. Do not blame these players. It's what you have to do to survive within the current meta. Of course, I know that I was getting flamed a lot when I was speaking with the guys when it comes before the scenes. I was, I was saying, it's a reroll meta. This is why I'm stuck in Master Zero LP. And they were like, no, there's Mord, <laughs> there's Neela, there's Zaya. It's just a skill issue, Morgan. So I'm going to agree with that. And makes, I think, our love is ready. Uh, well, ready is a little bit of a... Of a weird point here it's going on right we're waiting okay, for I'm it to finish excited. <laughs> <laughs> there might be one more round there might be multiple rounds we are going to find out however it is important to mention here that this is a seven player lobby it was delayed because we were waiting for that eighth player unfortunately uh german countryman super eagle didn't manage to show up in time we're trying to still get in touch and hopefully he'll make it but this lobby commenced with seven players at the behest of not being able to find that last player, which of course explains why we're a little bit behind here, but we are seeing both of these comms do really well. Oops, a little bit of a time zoom here. The Bastion seem to be <laughs> able to maybe take down Lirasa's board. I think the the cool thing about this is we're seeing the the uh, the um, Nico reroll again, battling out against the Chogarth reroll. And honestly, I think we're gonna still get another few rounds because unlike in the previous game that we just saw, once you hit that Nico three star, especially as well with that long distance pals, Nico just becomes completely unstoppable. And that's that's the thing I think with in general with reroll compositions is it is very high risk, but it is very high reward at the same time. If you hit your units, then great, you hit an insanely high cap. But there are some situations that in your roll down you can get uh, a little bit unlucky, and you might not be able to hit the units that you want to. Uh, in that game, but we see the the standard Chogarth board there with six Bruiser, which is, I, I think, something really cool as well with, you know, going for Chogarth, playing these flexible boards and just playing with what you're given. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Often in TFT, you're just like thrown into the situations. I believe it was Robin Songs who said that you just have to play the game a bunch in order to have this, this kind of information and the experience to know what to do when you're faced with a little bit of a situation that's new to you. Now, we do have good news to say as well, which is that the final player that was missing here in this lobby will be ready for game number two. But of course, he's now going to play a little bit from behind, having missed out on that very first game. But hopefully he can still make it to day three. It's not all over just yet for him. 
Lires, Ketzer, both getting one more set of upgrades here from the PvE Dragon, though, and I think it's looking good for Ketzer. Okay, you know, spectating this lobby, I'm not sure what what, uh, what language or language region is this, but I was looking at Belveth, and she has something called Neant Imperatress, which I think means Empress, and I was like, yo, what, what season is this Belveth? And then I was like, oh wait, it's another lobby, that's why it has something different. And also, looking at these units, I I don't think I can play TFT in any, in any other language than English, because I'm just gonna be looking for that final void unit, and then it's called ne Neant? Something like that, but <laughs> just look for purple, Morgan. That's all you gotta do. Just don't don't think of the words. Just look for purple. Any of the purple units, boom, click, void. You're done. Okay, but then I'm I'm gonna buy that Jarvan in the shop because he's purple. I'm, yeah. I'm a little bit colorblind. No, I'm in the purple background on the. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? The, the, the purple <laughs> unit, not the purple color of the of the, the gold color. choice. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, this could be our final fight. I think it is going to be the knockout. When have you ever seen a game go to 7-1? Wow. But if the trend continues, Ketzer will take down this Joe board. Let's see if that is going to be the case. Tarek still standing strong, supported by that. Soraka does fall over though. So now it is only the Nico and the Soraka. But check out the damage she's doing. It's so, so much. Will fall to the Kaisa though. And that is it. Kets are taken out. Lila's taking a first place in that lobby there. And with that, we're going to have our standings in just a little bit. So stay tuned before we can get them to you. Going to be as quick as possible. But of course, we've got to make sure everything's correct. So give us a couple more seconds in order to get that sorted. We'll also be re-rolling our lobby. So everything's changing up a little bit depending on standings, which means that we need a little bit of time to get it all in order. Now, Morgan, did you yes. think that the Bastion board was going to win here? No. Honestly, I had all the support and all the love to the Cho boards for one very specific reason. Because he was very creative with it. Again, didn't really rely on having just a Melzahar as a caddy as it goes on. But I think Stewart, looking by his face, he, he's either objecting with me heavily or he wants to support that point. So, Mike is yours. I, I mean, I thought that Nico was going to win it in the end. I mean, he won the last <laughs> few rounds and I was just like, oh, maybe the Nico might win it. But then the Cho'Gaf was like, nope. Not today. Focus the Nico. Bite him down. Nothing in Nico. What can you do as a as a Nico anyway? It's like you got big massive Cho'Gath that's like probably ten times your size walking your way, and you're just a little Nico trying to you know jump around and try and do a little bit of damage. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? I also ask myself that while getting ganked by my very own version of Needly here on the desk. That was Ludwig. <laughs> he just wanted to let us know that he's now ready for our standings, hopefully soon. We do know our next lobby, so I think we're going to check in with the very first players. It's lobby one, so we'll look at Ging once again. But here they are, standings coming through. Of course, I mentioned Super Eagle not being able to play game one. That explains the zero points there, but we will show you all of the 64 players and how they placed. A little bit sad to see our friend Kenobi down there on a seventh, but of course, it's not all over. Over yet there's lots and lots of points that can still be gained and we are checking out the top four players now i have not seen arzo or bricks in these players so i'm guessing that one of them at least is oh. going to be among the top arzo. 16 and there goes arzo he managed to get a win in the first one also i can see that me both and sword have given the reverse cast a curse because he spoke about Ging, Ging one first lobby i speak about arzu and he also has <laughs> an overwhelming amount of eight points baby there is no cast a curses today we're only supporting whoever we're choosing for all right uh i hope that'll work for me as well i i'm not sure where kevin was there were too many names but i didn't see him on that first page so we'll have to check it out i think he got a fourth maybe but with that, I believe our casters are ready to bring you game number two. And with that, we say goodbye, Ludwig, and hello, Counterfeit and Wita. Do we have to say goodbye to Ludwig? Couldn't we just, you know, have him on the tricast? Honestly, I'm very upset. Wita, though, we are moving on to table one, which means that all of our players who did very well in a game one will be coming face to face in this next upcoming game. But before we get into that, on the desk, they were talking about hero augments and how much they enjoyed them. Rita, if you had a hero augment, what would it be? 
I mean, you guys should think about this. And I honestly, um, my hero augment is never being able to fit on planes because I'm too tall. Oh, so no, your no. hero augment would be able to fit on planes? Yeah, I, I guess that's kind of how you got how you got to look at it. But like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe my hero augment would be to remove every single hard plastic back plate on a on a plane, on a plane seat. I think removing removing like hard plastic on planes in general is probably a very bad idea, but. Let's look at the players here at Stat Peter, right? Because these are mm. players that we all kind of know. And then there is Enigma. And Enigma, well, to so some people he might be the Enigma, but to me, we share a background in a very specific card game called Hearthstone. So I've casted this time. Oh. This, I've casted this guy multiple times over the years in, in Hearthstone. Um, so he has, obviously has a very strong strategy background. And actually, like the entire country of the Czech Republic has a very strong strategy game. Uh, background. I think about the fact that Fayeli came in and won the first Super Bowl together with Style. Style obviously being Hungarian, but like Skipeus as well, probably the more shining example of that. Uh, Vrai as well. So we have a very good tradition and a very good scene for these strategy games. No, oh, absolutely. I think you know that's one of the more wonderful things about seeing so many players coming from so many different directions into TFT is how much they'd be able to continue that strategy way. And as we will be bringing something a little bit different in here for this next one. So we're heading into the Cardinal Arcology. Fortunately, this one is a little bit easy to say. One of our Italian ones. This will be a little bit more straightforward. Did you just jab at me for messing that name up in game one, Peter? Sure yes. Enough. Yes, I did. <laughs> cardinal but Arcology. There we go. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's easy. It's, it's easy. a Cardinal. Well, it's certainly hard to be able to pronounce that when you speak English for a living, I suppose, right? But as you can see here, it means that you will be getting a silver gold and a prismatic augment because whenever you dig for gold, you dig even further down and you get yourself some diamonds or prismatic in this case. I can follow the logic there. That's certainly the way which we've learned the whole university workshop dilemma before. But, all right, so this means that our players, you know, particularly we're going to be seeing some of these interesting silver augments coming out. I imagine we're going to be seeing a lot more of the Poros, as we saw from before, doing some good work. We know that there are, you know, even while they might be considered lower powered, some of these silver augments can very much change the way our players approach this game. Yeah, and uh, something that probably won't change what uh, Nick is going to do to approach this game. Well, <laughs> that will be what's in his shop here because he was already hot leaning Cho'Gath. And this might just be a Cho slash Deafen moment right here if you were on ladder. I mean, if you look at the Cho graph, you can see, of course, from our last game, Ging, who's playing in this game as well, had tremendous success with the board. Of course, a big part of that board's success was having an incredibly strong Cassie appear from early on in the game. We can already see that we've got the beginnings of our itemization, a tier, and potentially the building towards a dual gauntlet later on. Things are looking pretty good for Enigma. Yeah, but Peter, what would be like? What's the Y and the X axis on a Cho graph? Like you gotta, uh, you gotta work hmm. with me. Here. Okay, I think at least one's gonna be how large, and I think the other one is how many chomps. I think those those together form a perfect circle. I don't that, do math very often. Oh, that, that, that was like a person that's like a perfect like regular developing graph, no? Because like the amount of chumps directly mm. correlates to the amount of size on Cho'Gath when we're not in a Bandle cafeteria game. That's true. We did enjoy our Bandle cafeteria. Then we don't correct for successful successful chumps, unsuccessful chumps, because it doesn't gain that's HP true. and size when he has an unsuc unsuccessful chump. Well, I mean, so this is one of the changes that have come in, of course, recently to the Cho'Gath, getting nerfed repeatedly, max mana and HP damage into, you know, into the chomps. It does feel like, you know, if you can't get the early chomps in, and Snoobal is apparently directly contesting this composition, you can't get those chomps in, you can't start stacking up Cho as a real big menace. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this is a spot where you're just going to be like, okay, uh, we're going to go down a different route. Because even then, like this board in and of itself, just save HP isn't a horrible idea. You can see on his bench right now, he's still holding on to a potential Vanquisher line as well with the gins and stuff like that. So it's not like he's going to be hard contesting at all here. It's just that he had that opening potentially there and maybe didn't have time to fully scout. Now, as he's Enigma in the lob, he's probably going to pivot off of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that's the thing, I was just saying. If you can't get those successful feats in, this board's going to be tremendously weaker than it was before. Of course, we've got plenty more people to keep track of, and one of those people who is, of course, we can't have Ludwig, but we can have some kind of cat on the stream. It's Travis Cat with the Piltover from looking like the beginning of the game. 
Yeah, meow meow, right? Um, and Charles mm. is a very interesting prospect here as well because he recently won the Ultra League over in Poland going into the Super Brawl. Um, but also, he actually hasn't had a very strong Golden Spatula Cup season. He has, however, been tearing it up on ladder, and by that route, he is already qualified for the Rising Legends Finals. So, he still needs to have a good performance here to have a good understanding of how to start to play a tournament in this set because, well, we are currently two weeks away from the Rising Legends Finals, so no matter what here, he has to have a strong performance to be in good form going into that tournament. Oh, you're right. I mean, that's such, you know, it's the unusual situation. We know we've got our, you know, our GSC champions taking time off. Sarsa will, of course, we'll be hearing from tomorrow as he's taking some time to, you know, to get himself mentally ready, but not necessarily directly playing here. I think it's, I think it does make a lot of sense if you've got the time to bring you in here and, you know, even if you're not playing for your space in the EMEA regional finals, you're playing against the players who are trying their damnedest to get there themselves. So the quality of the competition here in this tournament could not be better. Absolutely not. And also it's worth noting that we are, that's all right here, but we saw Lelouch play Pildo yesterday. Uh, Travis will not have the luxury of being able to toggle. He is just having to do it in a very traditional fashion. Yeah, and we saw it can even go wrong when you have got the ability to drop that emblem in and out, giving you almost a guaranteed streak. Instead, it will be a much tighter tightrope to walk. The king, though, the Vanquisher Heart seems pretty strong, but over the other side, I'm noticing something interesting. Wet Jungler picking up the Pandora's Bench. Looks like going to be doing some rerolls right now for some of the higher cost units. Yeah, and he's looking for what I believe is going to be a Sorakan Nico line here, right? He has at least some invokers going on for himself and also holding on to some Bastion units. Plus a bit of a stronger early to mid game here. And, and Pandora's Bench is one of those augments, Peter. Either it has like zero value to you or it's just going to absolutely carry your game. Because sometimes you look over and someone just has Pandora's Bench just casually rerolling a couple of two stars of a specific cost. And then all of a sudden they just snipe the same unit at the same time. You just get your free star online in the heartbeat, right? So you really got to keep an eye out for that because it's super explosive. Yeah, you sure as heck remember the times when the units you're looking for just don't show up in the game. I think it's really easy to take for granted when it happens and you just get the units you expect. It's like, oh yeah, of course, I'd immediately get up to three star. That's just how it's supposed to work, isn't it? Instead, sometimes you're left in the lurch. Wet Jungler, though, we get a chance to glimpse a little bit what's going on on the board. So we've got the Ishtar set up. You said this does seem to lead very, very well into, into the Soraka ball we saw from before. Well, it's worth noting that in our previous game, the Bastion Invoker for Karu ended up in fourth place. You might be kind of reminding people, you know, is that the expected finish or is, did something go wrong there? I mean, it was one of our most popular compositions yesterday, and I think that it's a comp that has a pretty high top end, but also it relies on you finding that Nico free, right? The Nico is ever so important, just having that additional extra bit of burst here. And that's like kind of the requirement for you to get past that fourth place spot, for example. Right? It's a comp that has a very high floor as well, because you're, you're so stable with two stars or rocket, two star Nico, for example, that you very rarely will go A. So it's a great tournament composition because of that. All right, coming up to the close to the end of stage two, Wet Jungler and Azu both feeling pretty good about themselves, managing to rock in a major win streak. Our Travis Cat Meow Meow is rocking down to some pretty heavy damage in the early going down to 67 way below anybody else yes and that's the consequence of playing a pill of a line where you don't have the flexibility of toggling that Pildo, right? Because he can't play a stronger unit to save some HP because the second he attacks anyone that's even remotely close to him in weakness, he could just risk breaking his entire streak like we saw with Lelouch yesterday. And it's not always possible for you to recover from that. All right, this double vision will be showing both of our win streaking players, seeing if they can bring those streaks forward into stage three. You see from the uh, particularly on Arzu's side of things, managing to keep that win streak going while holding on to an enormous amount of gold, certainly in comparison to Wet Jungler. Yeah, absolutely. But that's also a consequence of Wet Jungler's augment choice, right? Because you can just look at the bench right now, he's holding on to 14 gold, right? Like he's holding on to so much gold here, 13 gold even, sorry, excuse me. Uh, and that is a lot of gold to hold on to, but that's just kind of the investment that you have to put down when you are playing the Pandora Spence, because you are rolling for something that's significantly more cost costly than if you were just building Econ. But like you can see right now, he's now just a singular copy of Nico away from Nico 2 and having that stabilization point online for him. It definitely feels risky to be sucking out so much gold from your economy to make this happen, but 
This might be, in fact, yeah, one of those games where it has it's going to work out longer term for Wet Jungler. Still at level 5, so may have a little bit of trouble finding the Nico for the shops naturally, but so far, so good. We're still expecting these two to end up going face-to-face -face early on into Stage 3 to see who will hold on to their streak. Yeah, and that's the thing now as well, because let's say the Wet Jungler has to go level 6 here, 3-1. That's a risk that he might not even be able to, like, he can afford to level it, obviously, he has a lot of gold, but it's a, it's a risk that comes with a lot more of a an economic uh, deficit than it does for someone like Azu, who's been full on win streaking so far, and someone that's also, like, investing a lot of gold right now here is going to be Enigma, rolling down to around that 30 gold breakpoint to see if he can find that Cho'Gath free. Oh, he keeps going, actually. He's just sensitive because he's so Ooh, close boy. to a variety of units here. Choke a free online, but he's so... Uh, yeah, like, this is always the risky way because rebuilding your economy from this spot can be very difficult, right? But he also isn't winstreaking. He's one copy away from Cho'Gath. So there was a very high likelihood of him being rewarded for this, but it is a fine line to walk here. It's a little awkward with a small win uh, loss streak he has right now for Enigma to run a right headlong into Lyris, who, of course, is doing everything possible to make sure, no, come hell or high water, that we'll be losing out here uh, with the Piltover. Uh, no, sorry, my mistake. Of course, I was looking at the pitch on the top left. That's Travis Cup, of course, with the Piltover from before. I mean, as you said, I mean, talk to me a little bit about Travis's your long term potential here. You noted he has to take these harsh losses because he can't toggle the emblem. How does this affect his late game in this lobby? It means that he will have a shorter amount of time to stabilize and, like, like he'll have like one less turn maybe to, to stabilize after he's cashed out, right? That's a big thing to keep in mind that very often you might not be able to get a full transition, transition out of the way on the first turn after the cash out. So having that extra bit of life to work with very often comes with a lot of value. I've certainly heard people, you know, mutterings of our Piltover players. I think particularly since the Piltover rewards got a little bit taken down in power, we're more inclined to try and go for those bigger cash outs catching up maybe a little bit later than we've been used to, but I'm assuming that's not really going to be the case here for Travis Cat, given his situation. Yeah, I mean, he's just going to have to go with it. He's in, he's in so deep right now that he has no other way out, but someone that also isn't really like massively into deep right now, but he has chosen the direction most likely. Picking up that scoped weapons here, Snoobly has been playing a lot of Saya, like the rest of the lot, like, like the rest of the players, obviously, all throughout the yesterday as well. And this game number one of today was also a Saya game first place here. Scoped weapons falls perfectly in line with that composition. Yeah, of course, we noted before that we had the bruises in play early on for Snoobal did immediately run into the mirrored uh, bruise the board and is just for the time being trying to use some of the temporary front line but still seems to be in a decent spot to change direction a good amount of gold in the bank a good loss streak as well managing to duck running into Travis Cat and having that knocked over we've got our two players who are win streaking up at the top though Arzu completely undefeated in this lobby Lyris moving into that position after one loss we have got even though alongside them, we've got Wet Jungler as well, also on a ton of HP. We've got a very top heavy lobby. Yeah, and the interesting thing about Leo's spot here, right, is that he is playing the Noxus Cassiopeia reroll version of this, right? So a lot of Cassiopeias right now out of the pool, highly coded unit in the early game for the, those Invoker bots that need a transition unit. For the Choke F bots as well, is one of the main carries as we saw in the previous game with King. And here for him now is going to be the main focal point of this Noxus composition until he's able to start leveling up, adding in that, adding in that Mordecai and working him his way through there. As we can see here, he's doing, he's doing coming through here from the side of Lures. Yeah, continuing his winter here is actually very important because he is staying at a lower level that is kind of can be a risk at times because when you are in a win streak, you're gonna have one less unit, and there are so many there, there are so many players right now. Like, so many compositions right now. Spike a little bit heavier on stage six here, and Snoobler will get rewarded for that loss streak. Oh. Finds the Sire on the carousel. And yes, tier not the ideal option always for an item right when you think about the AD lines, but remember, Peter, Hand of Justice scales very, very well with the crit mm. that, and like the innate abilities of the Vanquisher units. So this might not be his Sire item, but it could very well be a Neela item somewhere down the road. 
They're certainly not going to begrudge anyone picking a little bit of healing into their composition, given how much incidental damage is being spread around by the Vanquishers overall. Travis Camp is on 3-5, one of the points we may well be seeing him try and get out of this current nosedive towards 0 HP. We've got a lot of items to potentially slam in here, if this is the moment for him. It is not, I think, right? Because you kind of see that he has chosen not to go all in. Very normally, you'll see people on 3-5 go level 7, roll down all their gold, then stabilize here. And as you were alluding to, Peter, some people have been dragging out their cash outs a lot more. And that is what we're going to be seeing here from Travis Cat. Even though he is down to 24 HP, he also has that last stand to work with. Yeah, last stand that should change everything. It's always good to have that second way out of the hole. It's hilarious, of course. There's no mercy forthcoming. I'm sure Travis would love to be getting some of these softer losses, but that's not the kind of dish that Lyris is serving up. Absolutely not here, right, Peter? You know, last stand, always been a controversial topic across video games. I want to hear your thoughts on the TFT last stand. <laughs> I know it's something that over time we've definitely, as a whole, I know certainly myself, have been seeing a lot from our tournament players and being somewhat disappointed but i think in this situation i don't think travis could have gotten done too much better at least at gold i mean final reserves of course we'd love to see here to add on and make the cash out really really enormous but i think travis is just yeah is running on the edge of the knife here and having last stand i think is a great way to make it happen I mean, he's running on fumes almost right now to a certain extent here. Did go level 7, did roll down just a little bit, but this actually might be the only board in the lobby in this matchup right now he could have beaten here. This is actually a massive boon for Travis, an absolute travesty for the rest of the lobby. Oh my gosh. We should have saved the travesty line for later on. That was fantastic. Okay, we'll, we'll save it for a future game. I hope nobody remembers the first time we used it here. But yeah, the cash out is being threatened. I think it's not quite good enough. No, it will be by just a little bit. So Travis gets a massive cash out ahead of the last stand procking. Yeah, and, and this extra time is what I was talking about, right? It's so important. It's kind of the same thing that goes. You have the extra turn to really start building in towards what will be the case here. The Spear of Hirana, not ideal, but can be reforged by that reforger, right? So depending on which route you're going to have to take out of this spot here, he will have options. And depending on what drops the wolves as well, he'll be able to make his decision. Because while you normally see this as like a J spot, for example, that's not really the case here. Will it be going down the Aphelios route? That is the big question. But also, IE is a little bit... Like, it's not the greatest item right now because there's so much Bramble Vest in the game by the nature of the fact that Vanquishers have been so dominant. Mm. So a lot of potential damage loss coming through there. So for, from Travis's point of view, I'm wondering, you know, if we're going to be seeing, okay, well, I think if I maybe answer my question there, how much of a roll down we're going to be seeing to maybe try and force out some wins here before the last hand kicks in to give him a little bit more reach to move further up the table. Because I want, you know, I was thinking maybe he might be trying to hold back and wait for the last stand to prop before going all in. I mean, this might just be a Jinx reroll spot, to be completely honest. You can see the fact he's shuffling in that frill yard here to get that shred so he doesn't have to go with any shredding items Ooh. at all. And this is actually not as bad as it seems to because Ash is a great holder of a Morello Nomicon here, so she'll be able to spread that across the entirety of the field. No, that's fair enough. So we get to see at least a taste of what Travis is capable of hit there, handing out the L to gang. Do remember, of course, we are in Lobby 1. Every single one of these players won through convincingly in round number 1. Yet, while our players only need to stay in the top half of players to make it through to day number 3, having that surety is everything. As we come into our next Ogwen, it will be prismatic to end us out. And that's obviously, as you know, we are in Cardinal Arcology, so that yeah. is what all the players here expected. Oh, Peter, there's something on the right side of the screen here that I'm not sure it will go down, but I think it has to be binary airdrop. I, it kind of sucks to a certain uh. extent when you're looking at the likes of Jinx already having free items equipped, but you can kind of work your way around that, get more frontline going for the likes of that Sichuani, for example. Well, I mean, we've certainly got the chance here. to switch some items around now and take full advantage. I think, you know, I do like this from Travis's side. Again, last time has not propped yet, but we are looking for immediate power. So we look up the table, of course, plenty of other players are trying to push their own power. Notice in our previous game, our player who was running the Bastion and Ion or Bastion Invocable, rather, 
was struggling to find their way through to the Nico 3. It's looking like Wet Jungler, though, is on an easier path. Yeah, but someone isn't really struggling right now to finding their units. That's going to be Snoola. He's already on that Sire too, Peter, and you can kind of see the combination of that mana burn meat of the like the, the the red buff. Sorry, means that like there's that that Nico in the front line has no ability to actually even try to sustain themselves, Peter. But also, speaking of things that burns right now, the Infernal Contract here has kind of burned Wet Jungler. He's stuck in hell. He hasn't hit anything just yet. And we know that that contract is such a big gamble there. You know, we've seen it work out incredibly well for our players. In other cases, not. That was a ton of money poured in. We are still pretty close to hitting up to the three stars, but I mean, we're still a way away from hitting even the Tarek three, one away from hitting the Soraka. Another Nico does show up. So Wet Jungler is in a okay spot. There's with one three star coming in. It's worth noting as well, this is far Ishtal, so that Soraka will be hitting a little harder than she might otherwise. Yes, and another fun thing I want to talk about here, you can kind of almost see how he got bailed out by the fact that he had that Soraka free come through. Because when you are playing Pandora's Pants or in Shifting Sands, you're playing a reroll composition, you can sometimes end up getting benchlocked more than you would normally because you don't want to hit your units and roll them into something else, right? So you got, you're playing with three less bench spots unless you're able to find a key unit like Soraka here. Checking in with Enigma on the other side of things. We have seen Azir creeping through for a few of our different games here. Not up to full power as of yet, but the board's still looking pretty darn good. Certainly an alternative option to that Cassia Pier, which we've seen work well at times. I think actually, woo, getting a little close for comfort there to taking down Wet Jungler. Yeah, and something I want to keep in mind here when we're looking at Enigma's board, he still has a remover on the bench here, right? So he can actually, instead of having double healing item in Spirit, in Animal Visage, as well as the Redemption, he can go for something like a Bramble Vest, he can go for Declaw, any of the other traditional best in slot items that he's currently lacking. And also, that also means that the belt on the bench currently can go towards a, an Azir item in the Nash's tooth, right? There are many options here that really are going to be enabled with that remover being in play for him. I just want to touch back on some of the augments as we're getting close to stage 5, which will be playing a large part in how things are working out going on. You mentioned for Broken, we had that, you know, we had that Infernal Contract locking him to level 7. Azu in a very different situation. It's got to level up. Potentially could go all the way to level 10. Uh, it's, and on top of that as well, to, to follow up even Broken, uh, I didn't realize, but Wet Jungler and Broken both have the Infernal Contract in play. So we've got a lot more play towards the lower levels than we would have otherwise expected. Yeah, this is a little bit more difficult for someone like Broken than it is going to be for someone like Wet Jungler, right? Because Broken's calm really benefits from being able to push vertically and add into some of the more powerful traits like the Vanquish, like Iona getting those extra breakpoints online. But he will be stuck here in a different setup. He's still trying to find that Ash free. And once that comes online, this setup could be a lot stronger than it currently is. At least we've got a little bit more itemization coming in for our friend Srak. Of course, he is doing a lot of work, but yeah, once that front line is gone, it is gone in a hurry. Broken, I think, feeling pretty okay with how the situation is for out of that last round, but still not comfortable in terms of HP. In fact, as Wet Jungler picks up Nico 3 star, which of course will be a relief, we can see that the HP totals are very close between second and seventh place currently. Yeah, and it's also worth noting that you're not, you don't have someone that's going to be easily able to take that 8th place spot right now. Travis, he's streaking on a pill of a cash out, and he also still has the last stand in hand. So if you're any of the players that currently are in Lyris right now, you are sweating heavily because that 8th here would not be a nice thing to take, but it is definitely very much in play. Oh boy, we've even got a gangplank in here. Of course, with the extra item from the binary airdrop as well. Travis has just been stamping on the accelerator here, and this board is ripping through. You see those three items, even if one of them is going to be somewhat randomized, are working extremely well. You said he's the menace of the lobby right now, along with Lyris at the top. Yeah, you can see, I kind of see like how easily just dispatch off Lyris, right? Even though Lyris has kind of hit everything he kind of needs and still able surely building towards the level 7, that level 8, getting the Mordecai in there, getting even closer to that vertical Noxus setup that he can. But this is a massive 
turn here mm. for Broken. Finds the Sejuani upgrade for the front line. Finds the Ash free, finally, for even more damage across the board. But the next step, Peter, here has to be the itemization. Because as you can see right now, he's pretty far away from having a fully kitted out Ash. And that feels like so important, especially when we've got the inconsistency and the infernal contract in play. Just, you know, just the bring of this economy online. We have got some decent items coming in. Unfortunately, we've already got ourselves a our last whisper on the ash, so don't certainly don't need to have a second one. Do of course have that idealism you noted to get that second dip in to see a little bit more action and get a little bit more damage online. With a chance for a little bit more frontline, perhaps a little bit more in the tank for the Nila as well. But again, do remember. Travis, the big threat at the bottom of the table, is just below where Broken is right now. It's seeming very likely that Travis could come and claim one or two more players in the near future. Yeah, we can see here there was no Bramble Vest option here for the Chogaf at this moment in time here. It could still be picked up on the carousel. Has two removers here in play now as well. And a fully kitted out S here with relatively good items. No attack speed scaling though, which can be an issue in the long run. Checking with Azu, we noted before the level up player looking to try and take flight in a lobby that's been mostly focused around a level 7. We can see it's, that's already starting to pay off. The Morkaiser up here with two items of scope weapons, effectively giving him a third and the potential of a four item Morkaiser longer term. Right now, it's a little dicey. And yes, that Morkaiser is not quite good enough right now. But later on, you'd have to imagine for Azu, he'll be able to leapfrog ahead if he can survive long enough. But it's a testament of strength of this choke position that Enigma finds himself in, right? That's something we gotta keep in mind here. That was a Scion 2 as well. Dive bombing into the backline, getting onto the Asir that just easily dispatched of that. So Asu's board actually is relatively kitted out, all things considered right now, but we gotta figure out if that's gonna be enough in the long run, because Peter, look at the life total as we we're talking about, very close. And with the fact that Travis took a chunk out of Lures, who's also kind of lost some other fights afterwards, the entire lobby is within 40 HP. Yeah, it's getting very, very tight. And I think, you know, respect it from Ging's side of things as well, picking up some Radiant Gloves to make try and make sure the power's online. And so Cho'Gath walks right into the back line and almost kills the Zaya but denied by just a few little H3 XP. That would have turned the round by itself, but instead Ging will stay up and Enigma will take the L. Yeah, very, very close fight, right? I want to fight you looking at it being like, oh my God, and as we're talking about, he was next one in line. It will be taken out by another than Travis here, right? Just Travis just surely but surely guaranteeing himself better and better positions, broken, finding another addition to the board here in that Sire 2, obviously not the greatest items for it, but I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do to survive because he cannot level up and put in better units or different units. Oh, sorry, wait, so give me some predictions here because we're starting to get some, again, some very close HP turtles. It feels like a super volatile lobby. Yeah, you know, what do you think this game's gonna end up looking like in, you know, by the end of stage five? I mean, most likely Travis will just be streaking out from here. Like, I don't even believe that his that his last time will be proc. So we're gonna set up here with the binary airdrop. He has free item units all over the shop. He found that early copy of the, of the GP as well. You can kind of see like how much power there is in this composition on his side of the field. But it is also a somewhat difficult spot to be in at times. It's not gonna be a dominating composition for a lot of these spots, but as you can see, wet jungler broken, both of them taking very low here. It is really going to come down to matchmaking, and that's another thing you got to keep in mind here. Matchmaking will be a big decision factor when everyone is so close in HP. Yeah, I mean, with several eliminations coming up on the card soon, it feels like you couldn't have a better spot to be in with Last Stand, which will just give you that extra round to play with, where people may well end up just dropping out, even if Travis Cat wasn't as dominant as he is right now. Lyris, still at the top of the table, has just a ton of HP where everybody else has been struggling mightily. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another thing here as well. It kind of is a testament to some of these other reroll lines that really excel at the other game and has a like a strong mid game as well. Right? That's why, why Lyris still is very clear to pack because even though he did lose his streak at times, just the overall progression points of his Noxus composition have just been very linear and very strong.
You know what I mean? It's, of course, there's been further good news for Lyris with Arzu going out first. It was, of course, they playing level up and contesting the Mordkaiser. Lyris also playing Noxus at the top. We'll have that much more secure later on game. As Broken goes up against the contract board from Wet Jungler, we have got the three stars online. This board about as strong as it's ever going to be. This is the matchup of Dante, right, Peter? One of these players will be sent into one of the circles of hell right now with that Infernal Contract. That is the fine print. You gotta read this, people. It actually looks like it is going to be... I was about to say broken, but Wet Jungle, oh, Soraka, oh! oh. <laughs> But you can kind of see what like, oh, Soraka can be, right? That's the very finest of margins here, but Enigma's Choga for it also faltering at the seams, Peter. Yeah, for one of just a few HP, we've seen these rounds be right down to the wire. Of course, if you are here, you know, and you're bemoaning the fate of Wet Jungle and Azu here, do bear in mind, they are, this is at table one, the very top of the tournament, so they will have a chance to come back and come back strong into the tournament itself. This has been incredibly close. Single digits HP for three players. Travis on the win streak and almost, well, guaranteed to see another round. Travis will be moving into the top four as Enigma and Broken go face to face. Another elimination on the cards. Travis must be loving it. Yeah, absolutely. The choke out currently uncontested on his way into the back line here. Gonna be going directly onto the Ash, and that's gonna be such a massive issue for Broken. And again, all that gold, but he cannot spend it because he cannot go above, above, above level 7, which means that there's gonna be less filler in the way. And this is like one of the very important things about the choke out here. If you can same side it into a carry that cannot burst out the choke out, it is gonna have a field day getting into the back line. Oh boy. Well, to what you were saying before, just having both of our contract players go out in 6th and 7th place, I think just really speaks to what this lobby has become. We, I mean, we saw this so often during day one that we'd have these absolutely huge late game boards coming together. Enigma close to hitting the... Uh, oh, has the Azir too, close to hitting the RE2 as well. It feels like Arzu had the right kind of idea to try and, you know, leapfrog up and get into the late game as quick as possible, but just couldn't quite make it last long enough to get past what has been an otherwise very fiercely contested lobby. Yeah, absolutely here. And now also another kind of thing I keep in mind here for Travis, now he gets an additional item. He gets two items for the price of one with the fact that he can't step protect his vow onto the Vi, right? So a lot of really powerful things happening on his board right now. Enigma, he's rolling down. He's trying to find a potential RE2 to get a little bit of additional power coming through on this board here. And he will be going up against Snoobler's Sire board. And Enigma for the Czech Republic. His time is running out. We know Travis has got, you know, just, just needs to make contact with Enigma and he's out of here. You can see the other matchups aren't super bad, but Enigma getting knocked out, I think it's only a matter of time. Snoobal also on the win streak now, as Travis will continue to hand out L's to everybody, while again, still having one completely unused orb when that last stand has not procced, and maybe wait till we get to the end of the game, and Travis doesn't even need it. Yeah, and as we, as we know, Peter, right, Snoobal is the most logically strong player in all of TFT. Um, because he broke the Enigma code. Oh, right. Were you expecting me to understand that joke? It's like the... It, uh uh, we'll, we'll let it sit for a second here, but we do have the two <laughs> win streaks going up against each other here, Snoobler versus Travis. But again, keep in mind, even if Travis loses this fight, he got, he's got, okay, Travis gets the Ghost Axe, that's a big thing as well for him here, even having the ability to continually to maintain oh, that last time, that's absolutely massive, Peter. Now, Lyris, you can see the two losses on the record recently. The Morkaiser? Pretty well itemized. You see these matchups are being pretty close. I think that's why Lyris hasn't lost more HP, but the writing is on the wall here. But Travis actually takes the L in the previous round. That does mean last stand is activated, but it also means that Travis, at least as of the last round, was not unbeatable. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big thing as well here because it, we didn't see the fight, so the fight could have been very, very close, right? And the additional combat power that comes through from that last stand could be what is needed here to take him over the finish line, but it is going to be Travis versus Lirez. We can see that right now. Travis rolling down here. Last stand, you could say, to try to find that Aphelios free, but so far, no dice. And as we can see, there's no dice on the opposite side of the field because, well, this Mordecai 2 still hasn't arrived. 
Oh boy, I mean, that would certainly be the get out of jail free card for Travis. We know we did hear from our wonderful observer Danny that Travis lost against Snoobles Ball before, so this could still be, yes, it seems to be one more chance of redemption. Travis trying to push forward for first place. This board is good enough to beat Lyris and not quite good enough to take them out. It looks like Lyris has snuck in a last stand on the sly. Yeah, and also Snoobler lost whoever he was facing, right? That's detrimental for his for him here as well, because like he could be weak on both of the players in the lobby currently with the cash out coming through on the side of Travis's last stand here. No Aphelios free on the carousel to be gifted for the Polish player on the win that was on a wish just a second ago. Instead, just another couple of upgrades here. Snoobler getting a again we can see here Travis denying the vanquish. Oh, Right, and I guess we found the answer to how Aphelios is strong. You just got to freestyle him out of a pill of a cash out. I mean, this has been a hell of a game for Travis. I think you're know, talking about Poland overall as a country. You know, we've had so many players doing very, very well coming into day two. Uh, into day two, I mean, Travis, Lelouch, certainly some of the front runners here, but I mean, this is just an absolutely godlike board. You have to imagine if you're in Snoobles' place saying, I had this lobby, I had this first place, but now you look across the field and you see a glittering golden god ready to sweep away everything you know and love. Yeah, you can see here, it really is no contest, right? Even though the Vanquishers are putting up one hell of a fight, we can see the animation coming through on the side of Travis. Snoobly is out of the picture. Now it's all on Lyris to beat the Ghost Board, and he does. Snoobly somehow goes third in this game, Lyris. Almost like, like that was not an expected second place when you looked at like the makeup of these boards here and now, Peter. Linus is still on Mordecai's at one. It's all on the back of Vertical Noxus and the Casio Payer free. I was good. I was hoping when we looked across the Lyris's board, we we're like, don't worry. There's a more Kaiser 3 just about ready to pop here, but very, very much not the case. I think, yeah, obviously just a victory lap here for Travis Kite. You can see the magnificent pirate hat on his head and its portrait there. He has come up from nothing to steal out this game, but I still can't believe he pulled off something quite this ridiculous. But again, this is at table one, the best performing players in the tournament. The only real question is, how much further can Travis take this success? Can he go on to future games among such a steam company and pull off victories just this ridiculous? It's absolutely amazing. And it just shows that there is still a lot of power to be had in Pildo and why so many players are still opting to play it. If they get it, even after the nerf, it has such a big X factor that you just gotta consider. And whoever cashed him out, right? Like we, we talked about this, that was pretty much the only board at that moment in time that would have given him the cash out. He faced it and he's just able to perfectly transition that into a first place in the lobby. Yeah, honestly, you know, you, you've, everyone's always been in those games where immediately the chat starts, the chat starts getting spammed with, who let him cash out? Who let him become the monster who were afraid he was going to be? But, I mean, still, an absolutely astonishing game. Bear in mind, we're only just getting started here in day two. So we're going to go across to a short break here from our analyst desk and then start moving towards the midway point and again, start to get a good idea of who will be going forward to day number three. So stay tuned and we'll be back in a few minutes time. I go by the name Jambe. I'm from, I'm 26 years old and I'm from Norway and yeah, play TFT for fun. Uh, so I think this uh, new system is uh, great for a broader uh, audience. A lot more people can participate in the TRCs and you will have the chance to free yourself even though you're maybe not uh, uh, on top of the ladder, you don't have the time to play a lot of ladder or etc. Which TRC I think is the strongest? Well, I gotta be honest and say France. They historically have the best group of strong players. Always like a at least a 5 to 10 players that are really, really solid each set. Uh, when I play tournaments, I just try to uh, warm up with a couple of games, uh, read up on a bit of stats, uh, yeah, just to like get comfortable in things I'm already comfortable in, but yeah, just keeping it fresh. Uh, my best performance in a Rising Legends tournament was uh, in uh, Monster Attacks, uh, I think Golden Spatula Cup number two. I think I made it to like top 
40 or something. Uh, I'd like to shout out everyone in the TFD community that puts out content, who's streaming themselves, who's uh, uh, making guides, who's uh, yeah, just putting themselves out there and helping players and entertaining. Welcome back to the Analyst Desk. My name is Vix and I'm here with Morgan and Stuart. And this game, I want to say, was a treat for us all. And that's not just because I like Travis as a player and I, I saw him do well. The fact that the comps that we got, it was just so, so good. And the way that Travis specifically piloted it, I was so ready for it. Now, this is a player that we have a little bit of history with, right? The Travis Cat Meow Meow story I mentioned it yesterday. He got his name because of us. He even has a shirt from his organization with a cat on it. It's become his brand. He's embraced it. And another thing he embraced was that last stand, playing so aggressively with the Piltover, seeing that, seeing his chances with the last stand, going so low before he proc'd it, over 30 stacks on that T-Hex, then being able to stabilize, get the cash out. The cash out itself, not even being so great, but then being able to proc that last stand, to find an Aphelios 3 and to dominate this entire lobby was so cool to see. But players kind of knew that that was a chance for them to wait down the line, Morgan, wasn't it? Cardinal Ecology picking up here on the portals. Yeah, it kind of gave him a free input that Cardinal Ecology, if you want to go with built overs, is really not going to be punishable at all because you know that the first augment is going to be silver. So when he had that built over at the start, he knew that taking this support item, cashing it out later, he would not be punished with going in with a lot of HP. He was able to cash out a 30 power gold uh, hex, uh, 30 power on a T hex, and he did it right before the walls because you know that it would be a little bit too risky if you waited because players are gonna roll down at 4 1. So it might be harder to cash out so cardinal gave it away that it's going to be silver gold prismatic it's going to be a perfect flow for a piltover board which allowed him to go safely cashing out finally it was a perfect border for a piltover player i mean speaking of the the portal as well it also allowed two of our players broken and wet jungler as well to go for infernal contract unfortunately held hands at seventh and sixth place uh we did actually see broken in the end that me and mix was actually talking about um you know off stream with you know, going for Infernal Contract, but actually sitting on 60 gold, meaning that it was, you know, hit the Ash 3 star, hit the Set 3 star. But it, it, you kind of run into a point where with Infernal Contract, you kind of hit a peak and then you just hit a kind of a brick wall in a way. It's like there's not really anywhere, anywhere else you can go because you hit that point where you're level 7, you can't use your gold to level up, you've already rolled down for some of your units, and then you're kind of stuck. But I know Mix said, you know, something else to talk about with the, uh, you know, with the Infernal Contract. 
You know, I was really upset to see that. It, I hate when players die with lots and lots of gold and, uh, you know, Germany re-rolling, what's new? But let's have a look at our standings as we move through them. You guys were pretty excited about that second and that third place as well, right? Morgan, talk to me a little bit about that Lira sport. Yeah, when you think about someone getting his Noxus board three-starred, you would think, oh, it's going to be a Samir re-roll. Oh, it's going to be a Cassiopeian Fury re-roll. But exactly, he got that blinding speed later on. Of course, Rage Blade might not be that BIS for Mordekaiser, but when you have two rapid fires, when you have seven Noxus on your board, a three-star Swain with perfect items, it gives enough time for that Mordekaiser, despite being one star, to stack up that attack speed. Soon as he goes bumping on his chest, amping up for the Realm of Death, he has enough of a front line and he already has enough base stats from the 7 Noxus that has conquered everyone in the lobby, thus enabling this Mordekaiser 1 to deal damage even if he still isn't at least silver to deal that much damage. So him reaching that strong of a front line, it got him into a second place that game. And by the way, in case Travis didn't hit that a few 3, I think he might have actually won that game. Yeah, there was a good chance for it as we are moving through our standings here, just glancing across them with Jungle solidifying himself in the 25th spot with that 7th place, unfortunately broken just a little bit higher than him. But Travis doing a Lelouch. First, we had a former EMEA Ooh. champion running it back yesterday and now his teammate and close prep friend is doing the same thing. I'm not sure how these guys are prepping, but I feel like I need to get more information on it because it sure as heck seems to be working, Stuart. I mean, maybe Lelouch just shared the plans to, to Travis and was just like, cool, this is what I was doing. Now you go and do the exact same thing. The incredible. And I think, you know, Poland in general as a country have been, perform been performing really, really well uh, as a whole and, you know, got made a lot of, um, you know, stakes in, in here with day number two, bringing a lot of their contenders uh, forward. But one player I wanted to quickly talk about was uh, Snoobal as well in that lobby, a player that's very close to my heart. And I think people at Twitch chat will realize that as well. But uh, a player representing Northern Europe has done so, so well uh, to get to day number three in GSC number one. He's really looking and he's really looking to try and improve that, you know, to get the GSC points to try and make it to that regional finals, which he even said himself on stream. He was like, my goal, regional finals, and I want to make worlds this year. So he's got a long way to go, but I'm sure he can do it. Bold, bold goals, but we love them like that. So keep them coming. We do have a quick break lined up for you with Portuguese Babe. And after that, we'll have some new in-game casters. Hello, I'm Diogo, aka Portuguese Babe. I come from Portugal, Lisbon. I'm 25 years old. There's a, a Portuguese player that I have been playing uh, against a, a few times, but he's, I would say he's quite shy, but he's super good. So, Diga Sparta, the other, the other Portuguese player that qualified through TRC, he is super good and he, he doesn't show it enough. So, I, I guess my dark horse to win uh, Golden Spatula number three would be the Diga Sparta. But I, I wouldn't forget about uh, the other... I have to shout out my Portuguese brothers, right? I wouldn't forget about the God. The God is the other Portuguese player I would, I would shout out. Uh, he didn't qualify through TRC this time, but I'm pretty sure he will qualify either from ladder or from the qualifier, the open qualifier. So, yeah, I, I, I of course shout out the Portuguese community, always. I will always shout out the, the Portuguese community. The God in, in specific, and the guy that allows me and the gods to to stream as as we do, which is uh, Sykes. So the Portuguese community overall and them in specific, I think they're the ones that um, allow me to be the player that I am and um, support me in growing as a player and uh, I hope as a streamer. So yeah, that those are my shout outs.
Welcome back to our in-game cast, and it is my pleasure. It's actually our first cast together, yes. Stuart, that we're going to be doing, so we're quite excited for that one. But of course, we're also excited for our players. And there's a lot of names in this lobby that I am so keen to talk about. We were speaking to him yesterday. Kenobi is in that lobby, but also Noel, Luque, and a lot of other names. Who are you most excited about in this lobby? Oh, I, it, it's a tough one because there are quite a few players in this one. But I think RNG UZ being in this, especially talking to him at the start of day as well. And also me representing, I guess, representing in a way, ROEMEA TRC. Uh, we've been able to cover it throughout the entire set this year. Uh, so it's been super um, exciting for me to cover that. But we're going to get into this mix into our portals. Here we go. Portals. Nobody pick up Shifting Sands. We don't like that one. <laughs> but we seem to agree that the Targon Prime is interesting. Noel not voting, saying, I am not taking any part in this. Nope, there he goes. It's a, it's an even vote. We know where we're headed, Stuart. They're all her holding hands in a circle. That's all they're doing. They're like, no shifting, I think shifting sands and, and Bandle Cafeteria. Probably have to be two of the least voted <laughs> portals, I think. No one wants the spatulas. No one wants to have them, you know, opportunities on the bench, but yeah. Targon, Targon's a bit of an interesting one because we have seen that there are a lot of reroll players and there's a lot of reroll compositions in general. So some players might be going down to that, you know, Targon Prime um, HP a lot sooner than maybe we think. Yeah, it definitely could be. We do have the little blurb on the right hand side. It's basically like a stimmy pack is what people have been calling it. If you drop low, you get a little bit of an extra. And we do have some insight, some leaks, Stuart, coming to us from Twitch chat. Yeah, that's right. Noel actually writing me Zaya slash Deafen. <laughs> so that's already a little bit of a direction that we are getting sneaked here. I wonder if he did the same thing in in-game chat. I mean, it, I think everyone's sla slash Mizaya Deffen, you know, Mizaya okay. slash Deffen. I think, especially looking at the stats from yesterday as well, from Barry stats himself, but seeing so many people go Zaya and, you know, even in the last game we saw Zaya, but there were two players that did beat the Zaya board in the, end, in the end. So even though it's known as the best board right now, there are definitely some compositions uh, that can defeat it and knock it down off its prone crown position. Absolutely right. We've been seeing it in some of the games already, but I do have something to say about the person that we're looking at, because Luque not only has two Swains on 1-4, but he's also the TFT player in EMEA with the highest LAN win rate. He won in Madrid for the double up tourney, and he won in Malaga when we played at Game Polis. So this guy is somebody that people should be afraid of because he knows how to play not only from home, but also from studios and stages. And I'm so glad to see him in the Golden Spatula Cup do well. I mean, land experience is super important because sometimes people will just say, oh, I can be play from the comfort of my own home. Everything's going to be super comfortable. But when you get that change in the transition, you get that change in scenery. Sometimes it can put players off, but off of Liquay as well. Taking trans uh, trans Transcendence, sorry, not Transcendence, Transfusion. Transfusion. I get my words in a twist there. <laughs> Transfusion is the first augment with only silver to start off with. Yeah, silver augments, you know, I hate them. Other people like them, but there is something interesting that's happening across the lobby because there's a lot of similar augments being picked up. We're seeing one of them on the other side from Noel, but he's not the only one that took blood money. We have Uzi, we have Arzo, and we have Noel on it. And Espat and Gone GLC both picked up Young Wild and Free. So the lobby playing into this skimmy pack quite well here. Yeah, Young Wild and Free is is one of my favorite augments, I think. Be, it is a bit of a high risk taking it as a first augment because you can take it as a first augment, you lose streak the entirety of your kind of first stage, and then you're already first pick anyway. So Young Wild and Free doesn't really do too much. But <laughs> if you keep that win streak up that you see at the moment, hopefully Espa uh, and, and Gone are going to be able to keep that win streak. You can get out, you can try and get them units early on. It just helps with the win streak. But Blood Money Mix, I think it's going to mean that some of these players are not only going to try and get to low HP for Targon, but also going to try and go low on HP to get more money in the bank. 
100%. So three players that are on that blood money. We have Luque, who's also getting stronger if he loses. And then we have two players that are just kind of caught up between these augment choices. And those are Padibol and Kenobi, two of the French players in this lobby here. Both of them are on that red buff, which really doesn't give you much direction but also doesn't really lock you in into like win streaking, lose streaking. It's not the strongest augment to have in the early stages. So unless they're playing really aggressively for losses, which we might be seeing from Pas de Ball here, I think they might get caught up in a little bit of a win-loss, win-loss situation. <laughs> That's never a good thing. That's never a good thing early on. You want to try and build up as much economy as possible. I think Red Buff considered one of the best silver augments, maybe just below inconsistency, which I'm really surprised that none of our players in this lobby has picked up inconsistency. Maybe it wasn't uh, a choice, but, you know, talking about wins, loss, wins, loss, one of the, the best silver augments to just get a lot of money in the bank early on. Um, but still, as you mentioned, you know, already on the loose streak, Padabol, but does have Chogoff 2 and Malta Heart 2 and might be enough, but... There's already an echo on the other side for RNG, RNG Uzi fam. That's good direction, isn't it? We do have two Kianas, we have the Milio. That's a good, good start in the lobby where many players are still scrambling, still thinking about what you want to do. Of course, you'd really like a double trouble to come around to empower these rogues, but having the Kiana and the echo early on should give you that direction, should give you a little bit of orientation. You can see Gone and Espad run in, take away the tier and the belt, notably, while the rest of the players now get to choose. And you can see that both of them as well were pretty much last pick, you know, gone just below that with the second last pick. But being able to go in, grab your items that you want straight away allows you to try and build, you know, what everyone calls like BIS items on some of these, you know, late game units. And it's cut, like I said, it's kind of the risk and the reward that comes with Young, Wild and Free. They did change it so you get a component anvil as well with Young, Wild and Free, which is uh, quite nice. Liquid mm -hmm. at the moment, though, is on a win streak with Transfusion. So not the ideal start, but still has that back up there just in case he does lose a few rounds. So I think that's actually not too bad. In the lobby where so many players are on that blood money trail, being able to win streak, the Transfusion is going to kick in sooner or later, like you said. So it's really, really good that he was able to do that. However, I am getting a little bit scared for our friend Kenobi in the 78s already in 2-5. He has three losses down, which means he's probably playing pretty aggressively for that loss streak in order to come together. And he's not one of the blood money players, right? All of the all of the three blood money players are right above him. Well, Arzu and Uzi, they all also want to lose streak. So maybe Kenobi trying to deny that, but he did get a win here in this round. So that lost streak is going to be broken and Luque and Espat will be the players who put themselves apart from the rest of the lobby going on fire here. And both of them players are kind of praying that they don't play up against each other because trying to get that win streak into Krugs is so important for early economy, for trying to go for uh, as much as possible. You can see that Kenobi here winning... So winning that last round is probably a little bit unfortunate for him because you can see that his board, like you mentioned already, he wants to try and go for that loose streak. But winning a round here is going to mean that you're not going to get as much gold. But sitting on 50 gold already, Mix, before the Krugs even come online is, is really, really great start. It is. And he and Arzu are the only two players who were able to get that together who are currently on 50 gold. I love this little fan technique that he's doing there in the camera, just playing around with it, distracting himself. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Give us more. That's another loss for him. And really, you would have liked to lose that previous round as well. But I like that he's playing conservative, holding back on the gold, not leveling while some other players have already gone to five. You can see he is playing much more restrictive, now picking up some more Noxus traits. Ooh. Does look like he is trying to go for Noxus. He does still pick up the Graze too as well. So he is still playing flexible. In terms of his items, he, his items doesn't really give him too much direction as well. They're actually pretty good uh, rogue items. But we also know the RNG Uzi fan is also going for rogue. So maybe building that Graze saying to RNG Uzi, you know, this is also a possibility for me as well. But for Cassiopeia's and as you mentioned, the Noxus start means that this reroll opportunity could still be there as well. Checking in with the gold of all of our players. You'd really like Espat to also be able to make the 50 
But at the bottom of the leaderboard, you are seeing it come together. The losses have claimed their prize. Everybody looking pretty rich and happy and healthy while on the top four. It's looking a little bit less like it, but that is what you're going to get if you are playing a very weak board. You don't need to invest. You can hold back. You can lay back on the leveling. We are seeing Kenobi roll a little bit here, trying to make something come together. Picks up another Graves. Are we going into the rogues, perhaps? Uh, I, was, I was keeping the Echoes as well. Did I did actually sell off one of the Echoes. Is it, you know, six mirrors, six Casio. So it does have a few decent units, but we actually saw briefly RNG Uzi fans gold as well. Didn't actually roll any gold at all this round. So not actually going for that Graves reroll that we sometimes see with the rogues. Instead, trying to maybe level and try and go for the Kiana or maybe even the Echo and the Katarina later on, trying to get that later game spiked. But can I be still keeping these Graves on the bench? So maybe trying to deny it away from RNG Uzi fan. Oh, Kenobi Ooh. being offered the double trouble. And that is a combination with the rogues that we've seen a whole lot of. But he needs to check what everybody else is on. We know that Uzi was also on the Echo. So maybe Kenobi clicking it away because he doesn't want to contest here. Everybody else picking up their augments, though, as gold comes around. Whoa. We are seeing some petrocyte chains. And the Demacia reroll, I think this might be one of the first Demacia rerolls that we've seen. I think yesterday on stream, we saw one player nearly making it to nine Demacia in the end. But you can see the augment on the left-hand side being able to uh, deal increased damage. I think Hail reroll is maybe not as strong as the other rerolls. The really when this comp composition comes online is when you hit that Quinn three star. Quinn, Quinn three star with the Slayers really, really hurts, especially having access to them backline carries. But you can still try and hit the KO three star, which to be fair, it's only two away. Yeah. He's really, really close. And speaking of kind of situations where you need to find niches for yourself. I really like this. Having the Puppy 3 already, having the Kale nearly online as well, is going to do wonders for you. Of course, we did spend a little bit of gold, but on the back of this Power Spike should be able to make back some and then go into level because the biggest pinch point with this Kale comp, of course, is always going to be that you want the Kale 3, you want the Puppy 3, and you want level 9 to make sure that that Kale is as strong as possibly be. And this is a great thing about, as, you, as we mentioned already, going for that blood money early on, losing the first few rounds, getting that little bit of extra gold, which allows you to go to 50 gold, roll down all of this. Yes, you didn't hit your KO 3 star yet, but you still have 30 gold. You still got, you know, a few uh, quins in there as well to be able to potentially look for that if you really want to. Uh, but I think Arzo, even though sitting near the bottom at the moment, is looking really, really strong. Absolutely. I wouldn't agree more, but of course there's other augments also coming through. We need to kind of pay a little bit of respect to them as bad. Being able to find a little bit of direction in the bastions here, you know that that's going to be a Nico Soraka reroll, one of the comps that we highlighted top of bay. So that is already two comps off the board that <laughs> players shouldn't contest now anymore. We know that the rogues are also being handheld and we know that Noel probably looking for the Zaya, so Lobby is spreading up and I like to see that. I'm very happy that we're not getting six people contesting on the Noxes or the Vanquishers. Yeah, we were, we were mentioning as well a little bit off stream about, you know, with the contest with like the set set before the boss in game number one, a few Infernal Contract players contesting game number two, but it doesn't seem like most players are actually contesting uh, this time around. I think um, the big thing here is being able to just Play your comp and also a big thing as well as you can see in the top right -hand corner the x style is wood as well so not only is nico already a really really strong composition but that nico is also going to be gaining hp throughout the entire game which is going to make nico pretty much unkillable if you can hit a three star and just allow her to stack up hp over time i would be looking forward to that but 
Something else that I'm always looking forward to is seeing Ionia Spets and hopping over Ooh. to Noel. He is going to be one of the players that has slammed it. I believe the previous overlay where we saw the components was not entirely correct. They were all broken apart, which is why it showed some Spets. But he does have that emblem, and I believe there's another player who also has an emblem. We'll check in what that is, whether or not it's also an Ionia spat. But we'll be seeing Noel go for the six Ionia, go and try to get that Vanquisher in with the Zaya. We're looking to be in a pretty good spot with the 50 gold. Yeah, it does have the RFC as well. We're on the Jin for now. Obviously, doesn't want to sell off the Jin two star just yet because, as I mentioned at the top of the day as well, Jin as a unit is just so strong in these early stages. Probably not strong enough to take down a Nico two star with Wood and also Titans. But normally, it's really good to try and take down a few units. You don't want to transition just yet because a Neo one star is not going to be as powerful with RFC as maybe a Jin. But as you mentioned, a lot of gold here for Noel. Also has a few you know bits and pieces on the bench as well that. He can sell away and he's going to be sitting at 50 gold level seven here. So he can try and roll down for the Zyres and for the Needlers later on. I am staring at the right hand side of the lobby. Luque still on fire after a great start in the early stages. Remember, he is on transfusion. He hasn't really made use of that <laughs> just yet with 95 HP. You're sitting proper and pretty up there. Whereas at the very bottom, we're already at half of that. Kenobi on 47. So quite the big disparity between the lobby HP totals. Yeah, we'll have to keep an eye out as well on our bottom two players to see if we do get the cash out as well of the uh, Targon to see what that is going to be. And I think a lot of other players are also scouting at the same time because that's another way that you can play this portal as well is you can play it around seeing what other people get from their uh, from their Targon to see if you're able to, you know, scout. And it is going to be RNG Uzi Fine that actually does drop below uh, that 40 HP mark. So hopefully we get to see what the cash out was in the end. Uh, for Targon Prime, but still has the road composition going for him. So, you know, being able to go for the, um, you know, the you go, going for the cash out has blood money as well. Yeah, and Luquis win streak also bro win streak also broken. Yeah, I know how to speak words. <laughs> we are on 39 gold for Luque is going to make 40 here, maybe even 50, depending on what's dropping but with the first players getting those stimmy packs Stuart, how is that going to affect the top players can we expect them to kind of turn it around on the back of that i, I think it really depends on what the the cash out actually you know is for for the uh, for the targon but as i mentioned i think a lot of the top players are going to be um you look um, looking to scout looking to try and see what it is and if it's something like a spatula then maybe we might be seeing people we keep components if it's gold then we might actually be seeing players not roll as heavily here in stage four one and maybe try and lose that hp to get that in big influx of gold to try and push levels there's a lot of different ways that you can play with Targon, which makes it really exciting. But also, it could just be something simple, like just a bunch of components. So it really does depend. We're going to try and see if we can catch one of these cash outs. First one, like you said, already parked for RNG Uzi, but Arzu might be the next one in line. Looking at this fight, however, it Ooh. won't go this way. Bottom players currently winning it out. Kenobi and Arzu hand in hand. Paddy Bowl still a little bit away from actually reaching the threshold of the Targon Prime, but still fighting it out against Espad. That's a long fight, and he will take the loss in this matchup. RNG Uzi oh. fan as well. Oh, we're going to end on a Prismatic as well, which is going to be crazy. Egg, egg, Luque? egg, egg, egg Luque egg, is egg. over 72 HP. Oh. He could have done it, but he breaks our heart regardless. Goes with a Jewel Lotus 3 instead. That's the safer pick. I can yep. understand that but it's definitely the less fun pick. <laughs> we want the fun. We want the content here at GSC, but unfortunately not going to be able to. Or stationary support as well, being able to get the Aegis and also the Chalice for the front line, being able to get that little bit of extra ability power. If people don't know, the Aegis item on that dummy is pretty much like a reverse uh, shroud where you're actually going to be buffing your units behind that. But oh, because I was talking about this comp. Twisted yeah! Fate three-star multi-castles online with Infernal Contract. 
That's really, really cool. So seeing that option of going into the multicast, truly, this lobby is giving us so much variety. I love it. But locking himself into level seven, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous because of what we've seen in the previous game. We know that there is a good chance that the other players will be stronger once they reach that level eight threshold. And Noel seems to already be there beating out Hadebol. Of course, there's still a lot of upgrades to be gotten on this board here, but you're also contesting a little bit with the Bastion players, with the yep. KL players. So there are going to be units that you're sharing and you won't be too happy about that. And actually a big thing with this composition is actually going to be that Galio three star on the front line, which normally you want to keep a spot open, try and play three Demacia and try and get that Radiant Redemption, which allows uh, Galio to tank up so much of the damage and it gives time for these multicasters to cast throughout the entire game. Uh, we did just get a, a, a slim... Uh, a, sneak there of the Targon, which was double Thieves Gloves. So not the, the best and not the biggest in terms of uh, payouts for Targons. Um, we'll have to see at the moment. There's a lot of people in this lobby mix that are pretty low on HP, but in total, there's no real win streak players and no one really running away with this. Okay, I am. I have a little bit of a suspicion. If we could maybe check in with Noel, because I think his prismatic might actually just be quite right for the stimmy pack that we're getting here. If I'm seeing things correctly, oh. he picked up the lucky gloves. And if you know that the Targon Prime is going to give you two these gloves, that's such a good augment to have. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what I was talking about, it just being able to know what the Targon is and then adapting your game plan to that. It's such a big thing with this portal and a lot, I think a lot of players should definitely um, look at is, you know, even though you might not be, uh, not, not, you might not be very close to it, but being able to get that spike, whether it's a spatula, like you said, in this case, double thieves gloves with lucky gloves is going to get so many great items to so many units. Uh, it's an insane pickup here for Noel and already sitting pretty comfortable as well 53 hp but yeah there you are mix <laughs> it's exactly what i thought he's giving us everything and he didn't even proc the pack just yet he has two thieves gloves already he is gonna get more he's on the lucky gloves this is going to be a board that you need to fear once noel drops below the 40 but already now as well we saw him taking down some of the other competitors notably potable with the infernal pact and another player that seems to be streaking just fine is kenobi with the noxus soul being picked up yeah, Kenobi kind of getting that little bit of a comeback in, getting the extra few items from being able to get that Targon uh, little cash out there. You can see the two Vanquisher players battling, battling it out at the moment. The big downside here for Noel is that he did go for level 8, but he hasn't found a single Zai yet. Oh no, he's actually 1 no! HP off as well. He's not even going to get the double Thieves gloves yet. But yeah, the big thing is he went to level 8. But he hasn't. He didn't roll down to level seven, which means that other players can roll down, try and hit as many sides as possible. Oh, 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 okay. Oh, you just naturally. Okay, I'm just gonna. Uh, yeah. Direct line to Mordok giving us exactly what was needed here. Now going back to Arzu, we were talking about Quinn. this board a little bit yesterday. Yeah, it needs one more Quinn. Is not gonna come around. Doesn't have any gold to make it happen. Did find the KL3 though. The big pain point now is going to be that you need to somehow level up and it's not coming together. You are on 7 HP for Arzu here and it might be the very last thing he sees. An Aatrox, a Mordekaiser and a Samira 3 in the backline from Kenobi on that Noxus board that we were referencing just now. Can the Kale be strong enough to take them down? Has done it with the Mordekaiser but the Aatrox and the Samira oh, no. are on to her. We'll take her down and that is it for Arzu. A comp that's had a good average throughout yesterday just barely above that fourth place it's not going to be good enough for this lobby really unfortunate for Arzu not being able to find a Quinn three star did actually go for Radiant Relics in the end and picked up uh, the Radiant Giant Slayer I believe it was or uh, another Radiant or it might have been Gunblade actually because Radiant I, I get confused with Radiant items with Demacia because <laughs> obviously they're tailored yeah. but yeah the Radiant Gunblade decided to actually take one of the Rage Blades off of the Kale which means that uh, she's not, not actually going to be attacking as fast and putting that extra Rage Blade on the Quinn but yeah a little unfortunate as you said Demacia overall doing 
doing pretty well uh, throughout day one, but unfortunately this game is going to go out in eighth place. All right, we'll see what else happens here. Noel still hasn't procced that stimmy pack. That would give him another good, good roll on the gloves, another unit to be itemized. Or actually two, I believe. And Uzi, Padibol, and Gon GLC are now at the bottom three. Eighth one already out. Deer looking to be next in line, and you can see some of them rolling down quite aggressively. Padibol and Luque both going to zero. Oh, we do have the blue buff on line now oh, for Padabol. No, no we one away from each. I mean, the big thing for Padabol is he finally found that blue buff on that Twisted Fate, which is one of the core items that you'd be able to cast as much as possible. And hopefully is going to be enough here to keep himself alive. But, like, you know, as we were both just like grinning our teeth there, one away from Galio, one away from Swain. He is going to win this round, though, maybe even the Azir. Oh, oh it, the close. Azir in the end is isn't enough and the multicasters still alive and just maybe one more round for Padabol to try and find these three stars. All right, shout out to Padabol because at least he's sorting the units in the right there we go. and that is going to give him at least the Galio three, maybe the Swain three also coming around, but we saw on the board that he just defeated that there was also a Swain two sitting pretty and I'm sure that's not the only player that picked Ooh. that up. So we'll need to have a little bit more luck to make it happen. However, Padabol on 23 HP has a little bit to fall back on. Now, Noel Stewart, he did fall below the 40 HP threshold just now. And if I'm not mistaken, that's his second Nila 2. It might be his second Nila too. He was able to find one early on. We just, you know, slightly caught it with the uh, natural shop there, being able to find the Nila and the Zaya. This board here, though, by um, by Espat is absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely <laughs> crazy. Not only do you have three star Nico, you also have X star with wood as well. You have your dual gauntlet uh, three as well, and it means that look, dual Lotus, sorry, three, and it's just doing so much damage. But Cassio, oh, the Aatrox comes back alive. It is not to say Aatrox, but nope, not going to be enough. And Espat is looking in prime position right now. Look at the HP difference between him and the rest of the lobby. Absolutely, but check this out. We're hopping over to Noel. I just mentioned it. One fully itemized Nila on the board and a second Nila too Ooh. on the bench, but the rest of the lobby has smelled that something is wrong. They're hopping onto the board and oh. you might see a little bit of contesting coming out of them here. Another Nila has found means we're two copies away to make that dream of the windshield wiper come alive, but not yet. He still needs to hang on just a little bit longer. And if you're checking second to seventh place right now, they're all within 11 HP of each other. That is so close. And we might be looking at some of the determining fights right now. On the other side is Padibol with the multicaster stitching out so much burst damage in just a little bit amount of time, but it's not enough. The Nila and the Zaya won. Notably, make it happen, come together here, and I'll expect to see Noel buy that Nila last second as well. I mean, we, were talk we were talking about at the start of the day with Nila being able to go for the Ionia spat. Also, in this instance, has the RSC as well, two of her best items. Just getting so much attack speed from both the Ionia's tray and also from the RSC. Just keeping back, staying safe, and it's enough for now. I'm not too sure if Noel is going to be able to get this uh, Nila three star. I'm just having a quick check. I actually think that he might be one of the only Vanquish Ionia players in the lobby. I think there's only one other player um, which is gone. Who is the, who is the other Ionia player? And look, yeah. pings, you hear the pings? I reckon they're pinging that Nila mix. <laughs> they're, they're, they're pinging the <laughs> yeah, Nila. they spotted it. With, with keen eyes, they saw exactly what's going on here for Gon. And Azir 2 tempts him twice. Shen 2 coming around, nonetheless, is going to offer a little bit of an upgrade here. But truly, you would like the Nila too that somebody else is holding on to. So Gon and Noel just staring at each other's boards saying, if you go out first, bet who's getting your units as soon as you fall will be crazing over your little legend 
And Gon is fighting for his life here, going up against a ghost copy, it seems like. But will that be enough for him to hold on on the back line? There is a Neela too with the Ionia as fat. She's quite strong and powered by the Heimerdinger as well. Zaya remaining alive despite that Ari old, but it's not enough. Gon able to hold on. Padabol now knocked down and Uzi is also fighting for his life. Will get knocked out here in seventh. We didn't actually see Uzi's board after we saw the early start of the uh, of the rogues, but I didn't actually go for it in the end. We went, went actually for the strategist, went for Azir. Unfortunately, going out in seventh place. Um, but as you mentioned, go, gone there, being able to actually face the ghost there of As Aspat. So being able to win there is the ghost version. But maybe keeping himself alive. But he's really struggling to try and find that Neela too, because Espat has four Neelas on his bench and three Neelas on the board. So it's so difficult. But wow, this this comp is really online now for Padabol. Three star Galio, three star Swain, and three star Twisted Fate. And somebody will get knocked out here. Eight HP. And on the other side, we're having three. Both of these players trying their best to make it into the top eight somehow. In comes the AOE from the Ari, but is it enough? No, it's not. We will see a win from Potable coming through. And on the other side, Aspad going up against Noel, that Nico three. Yeah. It's a brutal match for Danila, but not enough to knock her out. And I'm not sure if I saw that correctly, <laughs> but Noel seems to be having just one copy short. I think he was one away from Neela 3 star. I think you saw it right as well. I was also looking at the top as well. Being able to be one away from Neela 3 star. And also the big thing is that Gon has also been knocked out as well. And oh, he's, he's already hit it. He didn't even need it. It just natural <laughs> it. Unbelievable coming through here. Of course, in the PvE round, we're not going to see the sheer power of that Nila 3, but we will see it in the next couple of fights. And the big thing was, was that he was able to get so many Neelas early on. There was only one other player in this lobby contesting him, which was Gon. And as soon as Gon went down, that was the opportunity for Noel. He was like, okay, this is my opportunity. I'm going to roll down, try and hit it. But wait a second, we're one away from Mordecai's a three-star as well. What's going on? Lobby, they're just all going for it. Kenobi, however, doesn't have much gold to work with here. And with his 19 HP, he can afford one more loss. Who is he going up against? It is going to be Espat on eight wins. This board, powered by the Morning Light, powered by the Jeweled Lotus, has so much damage to offer. I'm not sure the Noxus board can shred through it, but they will try nonetheless. Check out the healing on that Nico. She just remains standing forever, and the Cassiopeia will not do anything against that either. Kenobi able to hang on, though, makes it into the top four as Potable is knocked out in fifth. Big question, can he find that Mordekaiser 3 to maybe save himself this lobby has suddenly just gone absolutely crazy we already have one four cost three star we could be seeing potential of a second three cost uh four oh, cost three star so he's bored. trying to sell the units he's trying to get it but no he's not going to be able to get it but he is going to at least secure himself top four he's even just selling more units i think he's just so trying everything. to sell his whole board yeah he's trying to sell his whole board at this point but isn't going to be able to find it and is going to be up against the needle three star unfortunately ah. That's so unfortunate. Absolutely correctly played from Kenobi, trying everything to make that power spike happen, knowing that whoever was going to come around next would be a big challenge, of course. Now he will fall and falter due to the power of the Nila 3. But on the other side, we are seeing yet another elimination, and it might have gotten closer with Luke taking a third place. And it is between Espad and Noel. And Noel is relying his entire power on that Nila 3 to try and beat down this board somehow. Honestly, I've, I'm going to make a really bold statement and I'm going to say that maybe, just maybe, this Nico 3-star might be enough to take down this Nila 3-star uh, board because throughout the whole game, Espat has been able to use that wood, uh, wood sh uh, spot, being able to stack the HP and this Nico is so difficult to take down. But is it enough? Is it going to be enough against this Nila 3-star? 
That Nico that you're looking at is not just one unit. She's an entire building of HP powered up by the wood, powered up by the Soraka, powered up by the morning light. But she will fall into the Nila. Nila three just serving her worst. And we might be looking at a long row of fights coming through from Noel with five HP usurping Esper's win streak and run. Okay, maybe it's a little bit of copium that Nico was trying to win that, but you can see the potential of Nico actually taking out every single unit off Noel's board, but just that Nila three star is just way too strong. We still, he said to start a day with the Onia spat, with the RSC, with the healing from the Bloodthirster as well. It's so, so difficult. And Noel was the player as well earlier, taking the lucky gloves, scouting and realizing that the cash out in this game for that Targon was going to be two Thieves gloves. You can see here, look at the Ori items. Look at the frontline items as well. Double Warmogs, Bramble, and Dragon's Claw on the set. It's so well played by Noel. And like I said, it might be a long road, or maybe, just maybe, Espac can just win one fight. We are going to see whether or not that is the case. Mila, right bottom corner, look at her just swiping through the board. She will not make prisoners. She will take down what is in her way again and again and again. She's jumping away, trying to take her down, goes onto the Soraka and will find that backline regardless. The big thing as well in these fights is the R replacement. The R replacement here from the well. Oh, we didn't realize the whole time Espat was not even below 40 HP. So he's now going to get double these gloves yeah. for himself. But the placement of the well here with the Ari is actually taking the man away from Nico. Taking the man away from Nico means that she's not going to cast as much. She's not going to be able to get that huge, massive AoE damage. It's enough to go through the front line. It's enough to kill everyone. But the last one standing in this whole fight is always that Nico. But keep an eye on Ari and just look at the mana bar of Nico in this next fight. Just getting absolutely wiped away. We're going to see whether or not those Thieves' Gloves can offer any reprimand in case of this power fall that we have been looking at. Positioning of Vanilla goes straight into the Nico, trying to save himself some time. Aspet, she jumps away though, and once again finds that backline. There is no escaping this. Vanilla 3 is too good, too powerful, too strong. However, Espet knows that he has so much HP that he's been saving gold. He wants to go nine. He has been powering up. And after this PvE round, I think he will be able to get there. Do you think that can be any chance for him to stop the train that's currently running down his board? I honestly don't think so, unfortunately. I think level 9, you, you, there's not really any other units you can put in. Maybe another Invoker, try and get some more Invokers. So maybe Nico can try and cast some more. The Soraka can try and cast more as well. But I, he, uh, Espy is doing completely fine throughout the entire board. It's just that one last unit, that one last uh, Nila 3-star that's going to be uh, it's gonna be struggling. Doesn't want it. Oh, no. Gets another Invoker oh. in instead. So does have... The uh, the invokers online now for and invokers, so it does mean that Nico's going to get some more. Does give another item to Aphelios. I don't think this is going to be enough, unfortunately. Okay, so I think this is full hard copium, but I'm going to give it to you regardless. We are in a Targon lobby. This is a rise, and if only Nila is standing, he might just poured her up and zoom her away. That is a lot of conditionals coming through here in order to make it happen. I believe Aspet has one more live here that he might use in order to fall back on. But you can see her zooming Wait out. Nico cleaning the board oh. in the meantime. But it's not enough. The theory was good, but we need to kill every other unit first. Uh, the Nila got yeeted up in the air. Wasn't it even enough? I thought that maybe, just maybe, but even when you just try and get Nila off of the board, it's still not enough because this Nico is just losing HP after HP over and over again. Even with the wood stacking, even with the healing on the back line as well from the Soraka, it's not enough. And it's been a long road mix, but I think that this is going to be the final fight. And Noel is going to take the crown and going to take the win in this third lobby. 
And he also went level 9 just now. He went level 9, put in yet another unit, empowered by those lucky Thieves Gloves. He had it coming. He found them so early. Then being able to play on the back of the Prismatic and the Stimmy Pack. In comes the old. It is Neela against the world. But she is under attack. Ooh. Is it going to be enough? Is the rice still alive? He is not. And that will be the case. Esped fallen down and case closed for Noel. Neela was one versus five, I think, in the end. The Nico three-star was still alive. The Soraka three-star was still alive. But Neela, with the extra healing, the extra attack speed in the end, ramping up, was enough. It was close. It was very, very close. I thought just for a second in that last fight that Nico was going to do enough. But overall, great victory for Noel. You know, we mentioned it during the cast. The lucky gloves in the end, I think, being a huge, huge factor. And just sneaking in that Neela three-star was really, really huge it absolutely was i loved watching this run i think if you're s pat you might be a little bit frustrated now but the second place is still incredibly good we do have a break ready with an interview with shredden and after that we're going to hear from our analyst desk on what they thought of this very very versatile lobby Hello everyone, um, my name is Szymon and I'm also known as Shredden in TFT community. I'm from Poland and I'm 30 years old. Uh, so my advice to the rookies, I would uh, try to compete and perform in GSC or competitive scene uh, would be to be consistent with the games, obviously play as much as you can, uh, review your own games if you could, but also try to watch as many competitive players as you can uh, to have uh, different insights other than yours and also try not to rage it's really important yeah so my goal that i'm working towards is obviously making it to worlds uh it's still uh requiring a little bit of luck <laughs> obviously but yeah there's uh many different elements that i'm working on uh just breaking up the path to success so hopefully i will make it uh, shout out to my lovely family, my uh, lovely girlfriend uh, Asia and uh, the whole Polish community uh, who I'm very grateful for uh, that we can play each other on the tournaments. Uh, obviously shout out to Grzesiek who keeps his care of us. Uh, shout out to my friends uh, Wojtek, Weiser, Lelusz, Gezman, Travis and sorry for uh, all the other ones that I forgot to mention. <laughs>
Now, I don't know whether I should start this desk with a happy face or a sad face. It, the game was very exciting. A lot of crazy stuff happened this game, but man, I came down eighth. So I'm, I'm a little bit in a conflict of emotions right here. I'm happy and sad at the same time. But Peter, speaking about crazy things, this lobby, we had Targon Prime. We had three people going into blood money. Everyone was ready to sack. Yeah, I think we knew it was we were set up for something special there the second we saw the Targon Prime. I think having the triple blood money was absolutely crazy. But as I said, three people played it. Two of them came in the bottom two. One of them came in the top one. This is off the charts for Noel. Yeah, also, also right, we also had someone on Transfusion right in Luke, right? So just all of these HP-based augments really coming in having a great effect in this game. Yeah, it was quite interesting to see that this lobby variety was insanely high, by the way, and the only one, following up Peter Point, the only one that was able to top four with the blood money was Noel. His Nyla three-star was really only one of a kind. We were very close to seeing Kenobi hit that three-star mord, and you heard our caster say, oh, he's done his best. He tried to get that Mordekaiser, he sold the Swain, he sold the Darius, he has done his best in order to get that more 3, so I think with Targon Prime and the amount of augments that gave you an economic boost this game, we were very close to seeing a more 3 as well, Wiener. Yeah, we were. And also, I think another key point is worth talking about here as well is the fact that one of the reasons why Espat's board was almost able to take down that Nila 3 was that Wood Extol, right? Like, it's just that continuous HP scaling coming through from the Nika, really showcasing the power of this Suraga composition that we haven't seen a whole lot of so far this weekend on broadcast, at least. Yeah, I was, I was still so impressed by just how ridiculous Nico ended up being. I think in any other game, that would have been enough to push Espa across the line, but you see, every one of our players were coming out fighting here because this was the, the mid-table lobby. Our players definitely looking to try and secure their futures and moving towards the right direction to make day three at all. Okay, so now that game three is ended, now that we've seen Targon Prime, now that we've also gotten to see uh, all the info about this lobby, let us take another look at the standings for us to decide if the players that we've vouched for, have they been caster cursed? Have they been doing nice? Have we seen maybe Noel put another Lelouch? How is Lelouch doing so far? Apparently Mena hasn't been doing so good, so I think I cursed Arzu. I'm sorry, I had to be a little bit biased, but he's only been able to get 10 points for the past three lobbies so far, Wiener. Yeah, and then kind of moving on here, we see Stingy Abuser kind of making his way back into the game right now. These are the players that are going to be in and around trying to battle it out for that top 32. So it really is that next slide right now. This is where you want to be. And look how quick tables can turn for Kevin Parker, right? Two strong games off the bat. One eighth place, all of a sudden he's right back into the mix. And yeah, we've got Lakoko, of course, who is hyper dominant in GSC 2. Still having to push his way up. The Ketzer will take the crown at the top place. Nobody is undefeated in this tournament, but look at the top of the table right now. Such incredible performances tied closely together. Yeah, yeah, I was Mita. vouching for Travis, by the way, Wida. I thought that he was going to get another third one, and we thought that we were going to be having another Lelouch today. But he ended up going third. He's still top three every single game, but not putting a Lelouch. Yeah, and the big thing as well is, is Jim Ray, right? Because he has made uh, both of the day three so far already has had very great performance in the GSCs, right? So he's just continuously showcasing consistent performances across GSCs, across multiple days every single time. It's just a great development to see. Impressive performance from the players in this last lobby. Peter, I'm going to get back to you with that question. We've seen three crazy lobbies. We've seen people going with the boss. We've seen four cost, three stars. We've seen a lot of competition going for people. Is there a specific portal you would love to see this game or any composition that you think we might have missed in the big camera today that you would love to see in game four? Well, I think we're going to, especially as we start to move to more towards the lobbies where we're getting close to the cutoff, I think we'll see our players more and more willing to take portals like Targon Prime here, where the variety of outcomes is absolutely massive. I think if we're going towards the top, we'll start to see things cool down a little bit and let our players have things decided more by their skill. But honestly, I'm out here for absolute chaos and carnage across every single game. Okay, Wida, I think if you look at the green screen, you can see our players, sorry for the interrupting, but they already are very hyped to go into this game. If you look at the green screen, if you look... No, 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 not I'm that looking green at screen. my green screen, Morgan. I don't know what you're trying to figure out. Uh, I'm looking at my green screen, okay, I mate? Mean them, them, <laughs> at the, behind the scenes. Let me be very classic, by the way. The green yes. room. Thank the you. The casters is maybe what you're trying to get at. Yeah, they're very excited. So, what are you excited about seeing, and what portal have you missed, Wida? 
I mean, I would love to see a bit of Jace's workshop now. Everyone on Porter, we get to see a lot of incredibly fun augments. So that that's for me right now. You know, it, it's a change of my fundamentals, but I do believe in a bit of Jace's workshop. Okay, I'm all vouching for prismatics. I love when all of that goes in, but I want to see the sump. If you ask me why, because with that upcoming lobby, we're not going to spoil who's in it. But again, we see decent players that are all with their playstyles very accumulated against playing very, very heavily in early game. So, ladies and gents, we're not going to take any more time. Let us toss to our casters because not just the players are ready. We also have our lovely duo, Makes and Stroll, ready to take us to game four. Thank you guys so much. You know, you were saying that I was dancing in the green room. I think that is a lie. That is a scam. I was just making sure I was unmuted. And that is about it. That's everything I was doing here. And I'm really ready for our lobby. I'm so excited for it. And I hope you are too, Stuart. And I believe you didn't check whether or not you are unmuted. <laughs> Uh, Stuart trolling us here a little bit with a mute, but uh, I'm sure we can figure it out. Maybe we throw to the oh, lobby there. Oh, I'm okay, okay. I, I trolled with a mute. It's all good. I was saying that... <laughs> I was saying that um, I could, I'd be down for a dance contest, a bit of boogieing, a bit of dancing and everything as well. That'd be great. A bit of vibing. What we are so ready to vibe. The only thing I'm not ready for is the sump, so I kind of have to put a stop to that uh, <laughs> on Morgan's point here. Morgan, I love you, but not like that. We're not going to go into the sump for you, but we are going to check out our lobby here. And it is Lelouch in this lobby. It's also Padable, Stinky, Zoro, Shinshire, Huben, I hope I said that right, Spotty and Jaduzer coming our way in this lobby here. That's lobby six. All of these players still need a little bit better points to make it into the cutoff. So we might see a little bit more tryharding plays. Yeah, we're just below that cutoff point, as you mentioned. I think for players like Luch, who, you know, we were mentioned yesterday, or you all mentioned yesterday, had a crazy performance in day number one. But it seems to just be a turn of events now where you have a great start and there's a turn of events into, uh, unfortunately, a, a really bad start into day number two. But all of these players, every single one of them needs to have a good one. There is the sump there, but no one wants no. it. No one no, wants no, it. No, 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 no. I can see Morgan just wiggling up and down left and right as uh, our production is flagging us to Petricide Shackles. Polyball seems to go for oh. it and he is not alone. Joined by Shinshire here. Will it be a sump game on Rising Legends? More dog to the rescue. It'll be Finn's Market. And Finn's Market allowing the little bit of a help there from the Bilgewater trader, getting the extra items and potentially some extra shops for all of these players. Is no sump this time, unfortunately. Not going to be able to get it, but uh, maybe next time. Maybe Morgan can. Maybe, maybe Morgan. Maybe Morgan can help. Maybe Morgan can like get into the system, be like, okay, this round, all three poor options are all going to be the sump, and then no one has any choices. There you go, Morgan. I gave you a tip. You're welcome. You know, we are doing these kind of showcases with uh, players at the beginning of a set. I think it would be really fun if we did one where they didn't have a choice. Last time we let Twitch chat vote. Next time we should just give them the sump every single game three <laughs> times. I'm down, but only if I don't have to cast it. So we are going to be going into Finn's Market. Talk to me a little bit about how that's going to impact the game. Yeah, of course. So in, instead of being able to, you know, fight the creatures and everything, you'd be able to get, you know, the Bilgewater uh, trader coming out, being able to get either like a completed item, an artifact, a support item, or a radiant item. You don't know until you actually get to that point of the game, but it's not the crazy like like sump or still water or anything like that. It's not going to be a crazy difference. It's just going to give everyone an extra item. Oh, I'll be really oh. interested. I'll be really interested to see if it is a support item. Wait, Are you us? seeing what I'm seeing? Potted Ball, you absolute legend. Picking Pengu as the legend here. I love that. I'm so excited. Oh, it, it's going to be interesting to see what the start up is going to be as well for the augments. Are we going to get anything like maybe a prismatic opener? No, it's just going to be gold for now. But I think if he doesn't get anything too crazy, and he's just going to go for Metabolic here and yeah, potentially yes. just go for a reroll composition. Already has Renekton 2-star as well. 
I personally, I've been saying that Pengu, I think for tournament play at least, is a really, really good choice because it kind of always gives you a little bit of a safer option. So I'm really happy to see Potable show it to us here in Rising Legends. We are getting word that he also played it on his stream for a little bit. So he is very, very aware on how to run this one. Whereas we're already getting some strong direction on the side of Stinky here with the Strategist Heart. Yeah, not only that as well, I, we did see that three players are going for Earth and all three of these players oh, have god. all taken Tome of Trade. Yes, oh god indeed. This this lobby is about to get absolutely wild. So you can see on one side there, you've got Challenger, a spat being able to get picked up there. Not the best at the moment. I think Challenger is an interesting talking point because it's one of the, the weakest forecast position, uh, compositions at the moment, especially with this tournament play. But maybe with that extra emblem and extra spatula, Maybe you can try and get to that point where you're able to get a lot of challenges online. All right, I'll, I'll leak you what's been oh. going on behind the scenes. Zoro picked up the challenger emblem. We do have uh, Jaduzer on uh, the Masia emblem. And then Lelouch has managed to claw a Noxus emblem out of these ancient tomes. And I believe out of those three, the Noxus one would be the one I'd be most happy with. And we saw him actually pick that up quite a couple of times yesterday. So it could be another rerun of Lelouch finding his way into the Noxus board quite easily. And we saw, I, I can't remember what game it was yesterday, but I believe he hit nine Noxus yesterday yeah. on the stream as well next day. So maybe a run through, as you said, of that would be absolutely insane. The Demacia I'm very curious about as well, because again, we did see that on the stream yesterday. We did see double Demacia spat, but unfortunately not hitting that Exodia, that prismatic trait going for that nine Demacia. But maybe this game will see it because nine Demacia at the moment, we heard from Mort Dog yesterday, one of the best performing prismatic traits, one of the best performing, you know, nine, nine fit traits in general at the moment in, in TFT. So I think that's going to be definitely one thing to keep an eye out on this game. And it seems like Cassiopeia just really wants to get into this game. We just saw two Cassio 2 on the side of, I believe it was Stinky and Spotty also had the option to pick up another one, sold his copies though. He's not going to go into that, play a little bit of Bilgewater here for now. A little bit of build water, still really good early game trait. You still get quite a lot of base damage off. And if you do get a few of the units upgraded, it still could be really good. Just unfortunately not good enough to try and go for these late game concerts. Padabol is actually selling his entire board. He is going four into this Penku line at the moment, Meeks. He's just like, I am not lose. I'm not winning any game. I'm going full lose streak. I don't care about my units and I'm going to get as much gold as possible. And that's a very, very smart way to play this, right? If you know that other players are already in a position where they have direction, where they have a little bit of board strength, allowing yourself to drop lower, rely on your augment, get first pick here in this carousel, which often or not is a very, very good thing. You can see Potable zoom in, snatch that BS sword and walk back out. Well, zoom back out, uh, knowing that that one was guaranteed for him. Zooming, bit of flashbacks of Yumi there for a second as well, just zooming around all over the place. Watch Yumi's not in this uh, in this set, but uh, it's still a bit of flashbacks. No, I said unfortunately. All right. I didn't I mind was Yumi. Blame I mean, you, but... I, I said unfortunately. It's fine. I mean, maybe maybe fortunately for some people. I know there was a lot of hate towards Yumi, but it's still unfortunately. We still love the cat. It's all good. But seeing the board here going for the Void Starter has Contagion as well. Uh, one of the strongest combat augments right now uh, in TFT. Just playing a bit of a flexible board to start off with. Doesn't have too much direction, but that early blue bus stamp does mean that maybe going for something like Silco or maybe Sorcerers. Maybe even the, the Herald. Oh, I love a little bit of Cynodin Zeral reroll. <laughs> I know Mort was not a fan, but I am. And having this void opener early on, I'd be really, really good direction for it. However, we know that other players are already on a little bit of a void angle as well. So we're going to keep in mind that that could be an option for them. For now, Chinshire will tank a little bit more. And the same will be true for look at that. Top four is still intact. Bottom four all have lost the game. We are keeping with the traditions as we are moving across these boards. Loose streaks are coming in for Padibol and for Jaduzer both. 
And this is what's been happening. We might see it again, Stuart. Yeah, we might see the Demacia re-roll. Unfortunately, last time around, didn't hit the Quinn's so three-star. Maybe, yeah, maybe trying to hit the Quinn's three-star this time, but he really, really wants to lose this round. And it's going to be really difficult if he does come up against maybe Padabol, but he's not. He's going to come up against another uh, player that's, you know, trying to go and keep up the HP. So... Going to go on a five loss streak, which is really good. You want to try and get that loss streak early on and maybe just maybe going to try and reroll down this KO and also Poppy three star. Yeah, if there is the option of going into that line and everything is pointing at it, we will see that reroll commence after Crux. So we're going to check back in with Jujuzer after that. On the other side, we are seeing Lelouch go up against Zoro. Lelouch is going to find the loss here. And Padibol also has his loss streak still intact, still going strong. Hannibal does need to be a little bit careful. Yeah, does have to level up to level five because that, that's one of the risks with just open forting completely and just selling all of your units is that when you get to Krogs, you do have to be a little bit careful because you can potentially lose Krogs. I've done that a few times. I uh, kind of uh, <laughs> dug myself a hole there, but I've done that a few <laughs> times when you open fort and you're just like, All the best wait. players have, Stuart. It's like, I've wait, been I've watching Rising Legends for two years now. And the amount of pros that have lost to Crux, you wouldn't believe it. So you're in good, good company. However, Jaduzer, he will reach that point in just a couple seconds. Beating the last Krug will go to the 8 of 10 XP on the scale. That's your last chance to naturally find the 55% chance for the one cost. So that is where we're going to be rolling down. Does find another spatula as well. But first, we're going to go through that roll down here. We're looking for poppies. We're looking for Galio. Both of them are coming around. But of course, the Kale is going to be the big one here that we want. At least the Kale 2 has appeared. Quinn also showing up. Question is, how hard do we go down for? And Jaducer says, Kale 2 is enough for me. Yeah, he isn't going to be rolling down at all to try and potentially reach these, these three stars for the Poppy. Actually, just keeping the Poppy on the bench for now as well. Just getting that Radiant Redemption online. I think a lot of these players are looking for re-rolls, though. We saw Casio re-roll as well here on the top side, potentially. Um, you got yeah, Malzahar three-star online already. So again, a lot of players going for these re-roll compositions. And the good thing for Shinshire is that he didn't spend too much gold to actually reach that three cost, right? We saw the Malzahar 2 come up quite early, naturally, and now was able to go into it with 40 gold still intact. That is really, really good. But we're going to go into Silver Augment next, a little bit of slow impact. However, the Bruiser Heart could be very interesting here, and it will be picked up by Shinshire. Insta-click death and Shinshai doesn't even need to look at the other ones. It's just one of them cases just like, oh, I'm playing Bruiser, Bruiser Heart. Yep, I will happily take that. Paddleball here is level six. Doesn't have a crazy amount of gold either. Even though he went on a six loss streak, he's going to stay at 50 gold. But he's going to lose HP very, very quickly. Now, he does have that metabolic, which means that he's going to be able to get that little bit of extra HP. Items on the bench not looking too bad either. This could just be a standard going into Vanquisher comp. I think that's exactly what he's looking for. However, if we're glancing across the board, the units haven't really come his way. And I'm not quite sure why that is the case, because if we're looking across all of the lobby sports, there's a lot of different comps being played. We have a lot of Noxus in play. We do have Spotty, who's a little bit on the Mila trenches right now. But everyone else kind of chose a different option. So for Potable to not even found one Ash, or anything like an uh, Irelia 2, that is really, really unfortunate for him. And while that metabolic is saving you some HP, eventually you'll need to find that angle into making your board strong. And so you're just going to be losing HP and HP over and over again. You do have to be so, so careful. But you can see that he's going to be healing up to HP every single round. It does natural sum of the units. Uh, the Ionia is going to come online. It's just going to put the items on Fiora right now, considered really the best four cost, but just for now, just put it on there. This looks like a potential of going to level 7 at 3-5, which is a lot of people's options when you're trying to lose streak early game. Just level, instead of going for 4-1 level 7, you level at 3-5 to level 7, and then you're level 7 before anyone else. That means you can try and hit the likes, as you said, of the Nila and the Zaya for this Vanquisher comp. 
Yeah, on the other side, we have Zoro, and Zoro has been striking from the very early stages, currently on six wins, which is a massive amount to be had. Can he pull, can he get pulled down by Stinky? And it looks like, yes, that will be the case. The Samira in the background will fall to the bites of the Cassiopeia, and that is a win streak broken by Stinky. Stinky does also have the Pandora's bench as well. So it's it, trying to uh, put the one cost on there at the moment, trying to hit that Cassiopeia three star because he pretty much natural uh, six Cassiopeias at the start of the game. So he's like, cool, why not? I'll take Pandora's bench. It can also work very well if you're trying to hit the four cost later on down the line. Because when you roll down, if you don't hit the four cost, you just put them on the Pandora's bench instead and just pray and pray that you hit the four cost that you want. Absolutely. We're looking at the items on the right hand side. You'll get a reminder on what kind of ancient archives have been picked up by the players. And now Finn's Market comes into play and it is going to be Radiant for everybody. Radiant items. Radiant Redemption here. Absolution, a, a great choice. Radiant Thief Gods Thief was the Ooh. choice here for Padabol, and I think for Padabol, he just quickly chose his Radiant item because he knows that he needs to level up, and he needs to roll down to try and find these units. He actually hasn't found any Kneelers or any Zyres either. Looks like a Challenger line might have to be the there backup. There's is. one. Yeah. There's one Zaya. Unfortunately, doesn't find the Kneeler, but one Zaya might be okay for now since we are still in Stage 3. We are in Stage 3. However, he's on 44 HP, so uh, <laughs> we'll heal some back up, but he needs to win in order to do that without bleeding too much. On the other side, there's a Mordekaiser waiting as well. Fully itemized Zaya, supported by the Radiant Thieves Gloves Jin, will do enough here. Snipe out that Morde and serve him a win after so many losses. That must be good news to Potable. Hopefully he can keep it going here. Needs to try and get a win streak going. Needs to try and heal up as much HP as possible. I wouldn't be surprised if he maybe tries to roll down even more here because he really didn't find the units that he wanted. He found only one Zaya, and that's pretty much it. Set two star, Irelia two star. And that's about it. You can see he's rolling down, trying to find some more units. Just going to play the four Juggernaut for now. Really needs that. Yeah, finally an he... Ash. Ash. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, he hasn't have found an Ash this whole time, but finally it's in. That is incredible. 3-6, your first Ash, when you're hard <laughs> forcing into the Vanquisher, Ionia, open forting all game. The, the shops really weren't on Potable's side here, but hopefully that will change now. We are seeing more and more players pick up units, though, and I think on the other side, Sporty Sport is something that you might be excited about. We're getting another TF. Yeah, potentially another TF doesn't have full multicast online just yet. I think just still has the build water online to try uh, try his best to just try and win rounds over and over again. But Padabol with that going level seven with the roll down is going to win that round. But sitting at 50 gold is still really, really nice uh, for the Twisted Fate player. And yeah, as you mentioned, something that I'm very excited about because the Twisted Fate, like you just see him throw cars just so naturally, just so calmly. And then suddenly, oh, the whole board's gone. And then it's just like, where, where did all the damage come from from TF? <laughs> I can't say that I've seen those TFs in my own games, but I'm sure <laughs> that you're speaking the truth. Whenever I see TF, it's like, oh, we're throwing cards and suddenly my TF is gone. So we must be playing different units here. However, if we're looking at the gold, this lobby is rich. Check this out. Nearly everybody around that 50 gold mark, which is going to serve them really well going into those last augments, being happy and healthy. However, players like to do so still oh. need a little bit more. And at least now we are getting some upgrades. Ilawi and Poppy 3 coming through. The Kale will also come together here. The shop's already going his way. One more Kale and he will have Kale 3. That is Duplicator, yeah? You have one? I yeah. would see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it was. I was like staring at the shops, but yeah, he had a duplicator. <laughs> Yeah, he only needed one more, just use the duplicate. The interesting part about that is he actually went for a Lowey three star as well. So even going for a unit that's not even a part of Demacia, just going for a Lowey, putting that Demacia emblem in and just using that route instead, probably not going to be able to hit that three, uh, that nine Demacia this game. But with that um, um, uh, Poppy three star, the KO three star, and also the Lowey three star online, maybe can start to win some rounds.
Okay, augments are coming through. We're very excited on what the last round of augments are going to be for the lobby. Notably, Lelouch broke down quite a bit as golden augments will come through. LDP, usually one that players are quite keen to. However, we're playing bruisers in this one, mm -hmm. so maybe not the best board for it. Yeah, non-distance power's not the best with bruisers. You Unless you've got two really strong backline carries. If you had Malzahar 3 and also Cassio 3, if you got that lucky to get two backline carries in, then maybe you can go for it. Um, healing orbs oh, is no. not that bad either for the extra healing, but does already have Radiant Redemption, but it might just be a case of just going for long-distance pals here. All right, all right. Uh, while we're picking, it is going to be the long distance pause. We need to hop over to Lelouch because I'm seeing something on my display. I spy with my little eye. He has done it again. There's the second Noxus emblem on the side of Lelouch, and we might be seeing him run it back with the nine Noxus board if he can get it together. Seven are already in play. He has so much health to work with here, 80 to go, and this is strong already. Look at these Mordekaiser items as well. It's like, you want some extra range? No, I'll give you even more range with the double RSC and also the Radiant Rage Blades. So this Mordekaiser is going to hurt a lot. Doesn't have the Mordekaiser two-star just yet, but with seven Noxus online, is going to be really, really big. And that's the great thing about Noxus now is that since this mid set, Adding in a four cost to this Noxus composition has really allowed it to come online. You know, being able to get the Mordecai's online, being able to get that four cost. You don't need to re-roll for the Darius and the Katarina anymore. You could just level, play the Mordecai. It's going to be a great carry. And then, as you mentioned, try and look for the seven, even nine Noxus, Noxus in the late game. Exactly, and we've seen him do it before, so I'm quite quite scared and how that is going to come together. On the side of Spotty, there was a little bit of rolling. Is one copy away from making that TF3 dream come alive? But his Auckland's also sleep a little bit hectic, no? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit all over the place, I guess you could say, you know, with the, the rod to start things off, which is going to give all the units the extra ability power, transfusion, but then going for the multicaster, augment as well is going to give a lot more power to all these multicasters. The big thing, as you mentioned, though, is you need to hit that Twisted Fate three star. That's really where this, when this comp comes online and even the Galio three star instead. But there is a rise in the, on the carousel. I wonder if anyone wants to pick up this rise. Yeah, Heimerdinger, generally one of the very, very popular five costs. And you can see Jaduzer and Hubbin both running for it. They both wanted to get that Heimerdinger on board. Professor will only come with one of the two, though. So not going to go home with everybody, but we have upgrades all across the board. And I'm starting to worry for Potable. Now I know. He is comfortable with this line. He's comfortable playing risky. And I am not doubting someone as great as Potable, but the last time we checked in with his board, it didn't seem like it was the strongest. No, I don't think it was the craziest. Obviously, had to go pretty much to level uh, level 7 of 3-5. We are seeing some hits across the board, though. We did see uh, Mordekaiser 2-star being hit. Twisted Fate 3-star finally being hit as well for Spotty. Also leveled up to level 7 as well, which is huge. But as you mentioned, we're going to be looking at the board here. We still only have Nila 1-star and Zaya 1-star with more, only just zero gold. Got no gold left to roll. No. Yeah, exactly. So the situation for Potable is getting closer and closer. He will heal back up, but with player damage ramp ramping up in those stages later down the line, that is not a lot to work with. He probably can take two more losses, and that's about it, depending on how harsh they are. And other players have hit their spike. Jaduzer notably being able to get an entire golden front line and the KL3 online. Now the only thing he's looking for is that level up. And that's where he's going to cruise as easy as possible, trying to make gold here and then roll anything above that into levels. However, he does have a spatula still available as well. So what do you think is the plan for that? 
I, I think it's a bit difficult to use this spatula in this uh, in this composition because with the you know the Demacia and also the Slayer they are emblems you can't make them with the uh, spatula so it's a it's kind of just like a a, de a dead spatula really at the moment unfortunately but this front line is just not taking any damage at all you can see the Galio with the Radiant um, Redemption thanks to the Demacia but also the Radiant Dragon's Claw as well look at that taking no damage at all from this Mordekaiser are just healing up over time and that's allowing the Kale and the Quinn to ramp up on the back line and I think the Jadusa is in a great spot right now the only win streak player with our top player at the, mo at the moment Shinshire absolutely and I didn't think that we're gonna see a successful combination of the Kale I know it did decently yesterday but it's so volatile in when and how it comes together and Jaducer still hasn't hit that spike yet. Reaching that level nine will make this board so, so much stronger. So if he gets there before getting knocked out, that will be maybe even a top two, top one combination that we're looking at coming from these players here. Now, Zoro picked up that challenger crest right at the start, or emblem rather. So he's got a gangplank here in the shop, but doesn't work with this combination that we're running. And he still needs upgrades all across the board as well. We're running a Kaisa 1 as main carry. And the uh, Fiora 1. Yeah, Kaisa and Fiora 1 is level 8 though, so he's going to roll down. Oh, sure. there you go. Nope, just hit. Asking you shall receive. Maybe a Fiora as well. Why not? Like, let's just let's see it. One more roll down. Yeah, Nasus 2 no? would be oh, okay. available. I'm saying it. Maybe, just maybe, that Fiora will appear as well. So that's how France plays TFT, huh? I, the one big thing as well as for why Challengers is being played here, which a lot of players definitely talk about, is the combat augments. Gifts of the Fallen at the moment means that you're going to get so much power over to these Challenger units. The Kaiser, as you can see there, doing so much damage. And eventually the Fiora as well. Once you get a few Fiora items, once you be, you're able to get the um, Demacia, um, um, the Demacia item sorry, on the Fiora, means that all the other units are going to die and the only two units that are going to be left is that Kaisa and is going to be the um, the Fiora. But now we're going to get Orn items across the boards. Yeah, will be the Infinity Force on the Nila for Padabool. His upgrades also came together. He does have the Zaya too, he does have the Nila too, but he lost the last three rounds. So question is, is that good enough? He is on his last leg, but Cuban also following him here 20 HP two more hits and it will be over for him as well all of these players need high placements to make it into day three they're currently rather low in the overall standings and they need points more than anything check out the Zaya coming in dishing out lots and lots of damage to the entire front line doesn't delete the Katarina right away but the Nila will clean the rest up onto the Mordekaiser he goes and despite his old and despite his empowerment, she will whip him into shape and deliver a win to Potable. And Potable is going to be able to heal up the HP as well. So he's going to be sitting on about 13 HP here. And Cassio is doing so much. Oh, I got the Cassio wasn't even enough in the end. The damage from the Malzahar actually was enough. You can see here, Potable going to heal up a little bit of HP. Um, as you mentioned, it, the crazy thing is, is that Potable is the only Zaya player in this in this lobby the only vanquisher player which is very rare at the moment especially through this weekend we're at least seeing like two or even three players go for zaya but being uncontested zaya and having to roll that much gold especially at three five and not hitting the units is just really unfortunate for padabo and if it wasn't for him choosing pengu and him going for metabolic he would have been knocked out yeah, I mean, he played that Metabolic to the absolute maximum, right? Yeah. I've never seen someone pilot a Metabolic the way that Padable does, all the way down to the lowest possible chance. But we will see players fighting for survival still. Padable and Cuban both on their last life, and they need to find win after win in order to continue here. Cuban able to do just that. Will Padable follow? Zaya still alive, Nila still alive, and going up against Lulu. Lelouch's board. Oh, nope, Lelouch was just watching. It's Jaducer <laughs> on the other side. And no one's been knocked out yet at all. We're going into 5-5 five, five, and no one has been knocked out. Lowest member at the moment, Hubin, not looking too pretty, unfortunately. 
The big thing was that we um, saw with um, with Spotty's board this time around is going for the multicasters with Twisted Fate. Unfortunately, he's not able to hit that uh, three-star Galio at the front line because it's contested. There is that still that Demacia player in the lobby, which means it's going to be very difficult to try and hit it. But we're getting to a stage now where everyone is just getting so, so low on HP. The only one player at the moment, Meeks, at the moment, at the right at the top, Shinshire, 75 HP. And 10 wins, might I Crazy. say. Shinshire is smiling down onto the lobby saying, yeah, you you, oh you, you want to come up and play? I have one big Cho'Gat that can show you the way. And you will see how that comes together. A little bit of recrafting here on that Multihar 3 to try and get some more extra damage out of the board. We are running four Void, so no Herald just yet, but would be something that'd be nice as well, no? I mean, it would have been nice to get the Rift Herald as well, but I have to say, them Cho'Goth items are the craziest and nastiest Cho'Goth items I think I've seen. Not only do you have Spirit Visage for the healing, you also have Radiant Redemption as well, which both the items, by the way, did come from the portal this time around because we are getting uh, Finn's Market, so we are going to get a little bit of help from the sh uh, shopkeeper. So, I mean, it's just an absolutely crazy board. And honestly, oh, I was just about to say, I do not see Shinshire losing a single round. What does he do? He loses a round, so yeah. That's the caster I... <laughs> effect. Yeah, welcome. The main desk effect. You just say the word and we press the buttons. It's all scripted. Of course, I'm joking for legal reasons, but Tom Jaduzer on nine, Huben on 10, Lelouch on 13. We have Potable on 17 and Stinky on 18. All of these players, if the loss is hard enough, could get knocked out in the next round. We are on 5-6 with eight players still alive. Will they make it to the PvE round? Has to be the biggest question here. And it looks like the matchup will finally fall in a place where that seems unlikely. Lelouch not finding that Mordekaiser 2 that he so desperately would have wanted. But Jaduzer also not finding the level up that he needed to empower the Kale as much. And the Galio, despite the healing that he has, will fall will thunder and down he goes it is only the kale and she cannot do enough to do her getting knocked out potable surviving it seems like i'm not sure if there's a little bit of a cutscene in play here but i think he's able to hold on and shinshire will lose against cuban so seven players go into five seven Seven, seven players survive into stage six. And unfortunately for Juicer and unfortunately for Demacia players, two games in a row now where you just haven't been able to hit that peak of the Demacia board, as you mentioned during uh, during that last segment. You know, being able to try and get to level nine, getting that KO online is so important, but also hitting again that three star Quinn is so important for the damage output for the Demacia board. But unfortunately, only had six quins, didn't find any of the units that he wanted. And uh, two games in a row now, surprisingly, after a really strong day number one that Demacia goes uh, into the bot four. Yeah, I thought it could do better than that. I was thinking maybe we're looking at a fourth or a fifth after how well he stabilized, how well he hit the units that he needed. But in the end, oh, I've said it, the power spike comes when you level up. And Chaduzer not being able to do just that is going to be the crux that breaks the camel's back here. Cuban, however, has been finding three wins after another. This board is showing you why. Mordekaiser 2, Lelouch is looking at that and maybe crying just a little bit because he would like to have it. But with all the players so low as they are, he might be facing multiple knockouts here in this round. Check out the Flora. She does her best. But will she fall against the Mordekaiser? He absolutely will. No enough healing. Zoro taking a loss. Padible going up against Lelouch. This one might actually be so close that it works for them. No, Padible down to zero HP. Despite the metabolic, despite playing so risky, just not going his way here. It's really unfortunate as well, as you mentioned, the metabolic in the end, not being able to heal up enough HP for Padabon. It doesn't go out just on zero HP, so maybe one more round surviving. One more extra bit of healing would have allowed Padabon to survive. But a lot of, I mean, a lot of players are so, again, we got that huge massive gap between the top at the moment with Shinshire and the rest of the lobby. 
And you can see here, Spotty trying to go for even more units here with the multicaster. But it's coming up against Lelouch. This could be another knockout round. Yeah, Spotty and Lelouch both on their last life, potentially. Spotty could tank one more loss. Lelouch with 13 HP. I am not so sure that he has found that Mordekaiser. We just saw it is up against a Twisted Fate and will knock him out. But it is not going to be enough. Lelouch taking the loss here. Cuban, however, cruises by going up against Stinky while Lelouch goes in sixth. We are going to be seeing, oh, Lelouch move up to fifth and Zoro going down to six. Stinky losing, maybe going fourth the next, but with a lobby as close as this, that's kind of what you were expecting, right? Eventually somebody yep. had to get knocked out. And it's crazy. I mean, Stinky going for Strategist Heart as the first Augment definitely wouldn't have been on most people's bingo card. But look at the bench as well, Meeks. He is two more Aziz away. Does have the Pandora's Bench as well. And this is what I was talking about at the start. You can go the Pandora's Bench early on, hit the Cassiopeia 3-star because you're able to natural so many Cassiopeias. And now you just put four costs on the bench and just pray that you can reroll. We are coming up against this mighty Mighty, mighty Chogar. Yeah, that is one big chunky unit and he will chew his way through the front line if you so much as let him. Problem for Stinky is the Ari that's delivering so much damage to his backline on the other side and that's so hard to reach with the front line in the way the Chogot will not fall over but another essence theft comes out of the Ari and that will be it for Stinky. Huvin also knocked down but despite that will move into third place because of the minus totals and Spotty and Shinshire move on to the top two. And the multicaster board finally does it. I was waiting for this for so long for a multicaster board to try and get a top four. Gets it this time with Spotty. And honestly, the, the multicaster board is going to have a, a pretty decent time against this Cho'Gath. But oh, oh, you have an RE2 star now online. But the but big thing Spotty? is... like. No. Okay. For a second, I thought that was the Azir 3 that was coming in. There was like an Azir 2 uh, being highlighted, but wrong board. <laughs> Don't mind me. I was like, huh? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in very interesting boards by, with both of these. But I think the big thing this game, with that Radiant item and with the Orn item coming in, is just making this Cho'Gath an even bigger tank than what he usually is. But this could potentially be the last fight. 19 HP on the side of Spotty. If he loses and the loss is just close enough, he might be able to hang on. But first, he needs to lose in order to get into that scenario. Cho'Gath on the side of Shinshire, so, so strong. And that will be a massive loss delivered to Spotty here and now. And he hangs on despite that. 1 HP, the hidden last stamp of activated may be enough to turn anything around but i don't think it will be he's rolling a little bit trying to get any upgrades together but it's not happening yeah you can see with spotty actually changed his itemization with that radiant item taking the blue buff away from the twisted fate which is a very interesting choice because twisted fate is normally your main damage output you want to try and get the blue buff online but you got the blue buff on the tadia with trickster's glass so you are getting multiple knockups but this Cho'Gath is just unkillable with that spirit visage I mean, he's also maybe a little bit too big to be hurt by a small bump in the road. She will throw her rocks to Gartless, and I don't think it will be enough. In comes the wave from Ari, and down goes everything else with Shinshire solidifying his first place here in a very, very impressive run, getting everything put together just right. That bruiser heart in the mid game, saving him so, so much, and the Malta are coming together so early you just have to give it to him i think the, uh, but the portal played a huge part in this game as i mentioned you know during it you know getting that radiant item you have radiant redemption which is one of cho's craziest items because you get so much healing for the cho'gath and you also have spirit visage which in by the way was a very heavy ap lobby we have to remember there was only one zaya player in this lobby and even when you're going for challenges like kaiser for example she's still be dealing ap damage mordecai is building ap damage you got azir strategist so it was just the perfect items here for this Cho'Gath, and you can see in the end, as you mentioned, just completely unkillable. Nothing can stop that Cho'Gath. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's one chunky Cho'Gath. We gotta give it to him. We know that that is one of the comps that's just so good right now, and we are expecting it to come through. I'm actually surprised that we didn't have it come up more often in previous games, but of course there needs to be a little bit in order for it to go right, and we saw that for Shinshar. Now, we are gonna go into a quick break, and after that, we'll hear it from our analyst desk. We have an interview with Arzu ready for you guys, so don't go anywhere. Hello, I'm Mohammed, uh, known as Arzo in TFT. Uh, I'm from Tunisia and uh, I'm here uh, to participate in GSC3. Probably the Dach one is the, the one growing the most. They they won last uh, Super Bowl and they have Sasa who's been playing amazingly. Uh, he won two GSC. Uh, probably Dach is the one who's growing the most. I think Sasa is the best player right now in, in EMEA. He's doing really well. And uh, I watch a lot his stream. He's doing well. Uh, I think uh, he might go towards this set, hopefully. So my goal for uh, this uh, Golden Spatula Cup is to complete in top uh, 20. And my big goal is to qualify towards someday. A uh, big shout out to Tunisia Discord server. Uh, shout out to my parents, uh, especially my mom, who's been supported all the way. Uh, and shout out to my uh, my friends, who also been really helpful. And even they don't know anything about EFT, they keep uh, supporting. Thank you a lot. And we're back and I'm not back and I'm still sad because we were this close this close to seeing the sun being picked at the end and then we didn't get one guide we didn't get all that lucky shot that I was aiming and hoping for but it was Finn's market and that gave us a lot of variety in the itemization in this game Peter I think you would like to talk about that specifically the Finn's market for this game was Shen Shai's board it really gave him that sweet sweet anime visage of the Choga. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, kind of a topic that was being brought up earlier on. We were talking about the, our players here in Lobby 6, which again, is further down the table than we were even in our last lobby, are more willing to take larger risks. In this case for Shinsha, had an incredibly dominating game for a really, really long time. Pretty much, you know, early, early mid-game, all the way through to the end, never really felt like he was in too much trouble. Yeah, and another thing that's also kind of worth noting here, right, is that we, we kind of saw the consequence of this being up, that fact that we are past the halfway point of the day here, because Pato Bull chose to move over to Pingu to get some of those first augments 
the um, we're looking at you know, tiny Titan, tiny Titan, these augments in Metablock Accelerator that will allow you to extend and take higher risk open for it than have those big combats that we know and love Pot of Ball for. And this is kind of just going to be one of the things we've got to keep in mind here that for the players now that finished bot fall in this game, they are pretty much on having to go 1 1 in the last two games of the day to actually go towards day three. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the, the sort of the hidden part of the equation here, which I think part of all didn't take account of, is that there are some elements of the Riot MMO already in play in TFT. Because there's so many Vanquishers being picked up in other lobbies, it meant that in this lobby, the Vanquisher supply was actually cut down, meaning there were just one, any, even though that no one was actually contesting him. Yeah, and something that I want to highlight as well is that Zoro finally gave us a challenger board. This has been quite a very long time where we didn't get to see any uh, challengers being picked up because it's really hard to pull them off, specifically after the recent Fiora nerfs and everything going to reroll compositions. Like, one of the reasons why you see Fiora being picked up right now is to complete that Demacia and to give in maybe 5-7 vertical Demacia to stack up the items on the Galio 3 star, which we saw was extremely tanky in that final game because of the Radiant Dragon's Claw. Now, we spoke about game four, and now we're down two more games to decide who are our top three, 32 players to move into day three. So standings are ahead of us. Rita, did anyone catch your eye? I mean, you're looking at Snooty, you're looking at Salve, you're looking at Potable and Lalutra. These are all players that we know and respect for their overall contributions to competitive TFC. They're looking like they're struggling quite a bit. Some of them do have secondary outs for finals. Potable, not one of them, needs to go like 1-1 as we're talking about. Cut up 27-28. Kenobi, Dark Hydra also struggling a little bit right now. Kevin Parker on these outer skirts here still needs two good games. And also a top of show interviewee. RNG Uzi fan with a, his first first place of the day here really putting himself back into contention. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly where we want to be for all of our lobbies. You can see the difference in points is not enormous between so many of these players here. It, while there will be tiebreakers according to how many overall tournament points you have gained during the tournament itself, it may not come into play. But as we look towards the very top, Kubixen will take center stage, having not dropped out of the top three all day. And finally, Travis has managed to get his first loss. Apparently, the last lobby that he was placed in was extremely close. We're not going to see another Lelouch. And also, if you looked in very carefully, speaking about Lelouch, he's not one of our top 16 players. So did he push all of his effort for day one and then wasted some of that energy? So he's not ready for day two. However, keep in mind that you have to be one of the top 32 players in order to qualify for day three. Speaking of day three, we have finished four games. We have two more, so we're not going to waste any excitement. So go grab your popcorn, grab your snacks, because we're off two games, and we're going to go right into them after that very, very short break, as like we were also this close to the sump. So let us go into a very small break and then go into game five and game six for us to decide who goes to day three. Uh, hello guys, I'm Memo, I'm 24 years old, I'm from Germany, and yeah, I'm a TFT player. Uh, right now, I think set 9 or Rune Terror Reforge is like one of my favorites so far. Uh, it's like where I've been seeing the most success and I've been taking the game more serious. I think the balancing was a bit off here and there, but I think like all the new features, like the legends are very cool. And yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot right now. I like the TRCs a lot. I think it's very healthy to have like uh, every region have like their own league where they can like practice and stuff and have like a uh, weekly uh, weekly games where they have to play in a league. I think uh, I was like twice first now in the regular split in the German league. And <clears throat> I think it was uh, very good for like the entire scene to have like a stable league that they can play like all the time. Uh, so first of all, I would love to shout out everyone in the German community. Like you guys are the best, like legit. You are always spamming the chat. Like I, when I see you guys' name in the chat, I always like get so happy. Uh, even in last GC when I was not streaming and I was seeing like you guys cheering for me. It was like uh, such a good feeling. Um, you guys make me motivated to, to keep on playing and keep on trying. Um, so I really appreciate every one of you. Um, but a special shout out to like all my study group, especially like the OGs like Zaza and Elia. Like with these guys, I've like without these guys, I would never make it here. 
And like this said, we started prepping with like some Turkish players as well, like Ging and Chenar. Uh, I respected these guys a lot. Like I was always looking up to them, like back in the day, like in set five and stuff, I would look at Ging's stream and it's like crazy now to talk to him and like prep with him. So thank you to those guys as well. And uh, yeah, lastly to Dysik as well. Um, I think without Dysik, I wouldn't make it so far last GC. He showed me how to play Wolf. And uh, because of him, I think I had like a lot of success last set. And we're finally back. And ladies and gents, it's going to be Morgan, Stuart, and Rita on the mic for the, these last two games. So allow me to welcome these two lovely gentlemen into the final two games of the day. Now, you know something about our system is that we always try to make it harder for the players at the top. Why? We're just being annoying? No, it's just the way the tournament is. So that means that we're now in game five and game six, and we're having the top eight players compete in this lobby. We have Cubix on, EUG, Nevada, Wet Jungler, Ketzer, Ging, Daisy, and Travis. Stuart, has any one of these players caught your attention? Are you vouching for any of these for the reverse curse that you did with Ging in game one? <laughs> I, I'm, should I stick with Ging? I'm kind of worried to stick with Ging, but I think he's been performing exceptionally well. Obviously going to be part of this top eight lobby as well, but definitely have to keep eyes on Daysick, who has definitely been up on the rise as well since his recent break and coming back into competitive. We I think that you know, Daysick as well is a very interesting one, right? Because he's had a very good season overall, and I think that's something we've got to keep in mind. His latter performances have not been as consistent as we know from Daysick, but his tournament performances in the GSC circuit have been there, and that's the big thing. But we need to highlight when it comes to Daysick, because as you're pointing out, set eight months attack was not really Daysick's strong suit. Obviously, he also had the whole um, Dragonlance Championship kind of a letdown for him and letdown for a lot of people who are finally so excited to see him at that stage and then he kind of bombed out now but it seems like he's gotten everything back in check he's ready to perform and he's coming out guns flying again okay we spoke players we spoke compositions we spoke everything except one thing that is about to get ahead of us right now portals last game I wanted the sump I didn't get picked but I still want to see it happen. Stuart, what is your favorite portal? What game five do you want to commentate with a portal in it? Can I say still water? Is that allowed here? No. Actually, no, no, no. It is. If you it do is, that, it's allowed. Okay. I mean, I'm. It is. I mean, I. We're sending I you back to the analyst desk if you do I, that. <laughs> no, no, no. I because love, you, I love <laughs> nostalgia. I love nostalgia. I love going back to set one, set two with still water. I'm all down. But uh, instead of still water, I think Ragtown, one of the newest ones as well, uh, also brings an interesting concept to the uh, to, lo to the lobby. No, it doesn't. How many you guys like been talking bad things about rerolls <laughs> when you want to see a rat town, Stuart? I don't know how that really pans out. But the thing about the thing about like. Oh still God. one now is that we had like an entire patch of people playing Orn, and now people like people aren't allowed to talk badly about Stillwater because it's Yo, basically just water production. Down on our can we can we stop casters? Can you bring back Peter and Makes? Why am I with someone that was Stillwater and another one that was Red Town? What is up with with, with these? I, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying I want Stillwater. I'm just saying that actually. With the items coming in, you don't get the Augman, sure, but you do get some sort of level spike that gives you some agency now. There was no agency before with it, right? And that's the big thing, that the lack of agency that you had with Silver when it was like pure nothing was obviously very, very bad. But the cha recent change here means that it actually is pretty okay. Oh, and, uh, well, Rat Town is oh there, no. Tagon Prime is there as well, but I no. think there's no one that's going to be one guying. Over there, one guy, Org, one guy, one guy. <laughs> yeah, unless Org is just gonna one guy his way into Rat Town, and I guess you know what, he would be the rat then in most people's <laughs> eyes. But uh, it's it's a rough one for sure. But 
We'll see. Time will tell. Okay, never mind. Or oh, just doing no, a little bit of trolling yeah. for the content. Oh my god. Okay, we don't have a rat in town, Stuart. Unfortunately not, no, but they're all going to be holding hands for Ecliptic Vaults. I think one of the most popular ones, just being able to get that crazy amount of gold every single time you pick an augment is going to allow players to get either push levels or try and go for reroll comps. So just a standard one, nothing too exciting this time, uh, but still really nice. Yeah, one thing I love about Ecliptic Vaults is, okay, hear me out. Why do I hate Still Water and Red Town so much? Because I hate things that kind of amplify your luck or chance or increase the RNG factor, but... Ecliptic Vaults, it kinda does give an advantage to people who wanna slam items early, so you can make some of these uh, economic advantages, so you can maybe push level 5 on stage 2-2 two, two or 2-3, two, so I'm down with Ecliptic Vaults. Those who slam items early get rewarded with gold, with economy, with interest, early levels. Weeda, do you share the same thoughts with me, or did you really want AOG to one guy that rat down? Uh, I mean, I, I'm kind of down with whatever here. I think Ecliptic Walls is one of the ones you're, ta you're talking about here, Morgan. It really showcases different player philosophies and different understanding. It's off the spot. We see Travis picking up a Misfortune 2 on 1-3. Um, huh? Huh? Yes. That can happen from an AWP, I guess, of a 2 option. And actually, like, if you don't want to play MF, I feel like that's actually a bit of a low roll, Stuart. Yeah, it's it's not considered the best unit. I mean, if you were sinking at the start of the mid set, then hey, you'd be highly rolling out of your mind. But unfortunately, now it's not considered the best. But hey, going for something you know too crazy, go go getting something like a MF two star this early on probably means that he also has a gold huh? starter, which probably means that you'll be able to get you know that MF two. I swear and to God, gold. if he gets rising infamy here, that this is like. No, this is not a high roll at this point. This is just him hacking the system or something. It's a, it's a playable spot, to be honest, right? Because the thing about Boot World Alliance <laughs> now compared to the start of the set, Morgan, is the fact that you kind of need to have that strong tempo opener. Something like Rising Infinity would give Travis that opening spot if it is going to showcase oh, itself here. Daisy also was a pretty interesting option here as well. Winds of Wogs. Winds of Wogs. We've seen it yesterday. Came up second if I'm not missing anything, but... Winds of Wogs, do not go scoped and go Neela or Mordekaiser, we've seen that quite a few times. It's Winds of Wogs. I don't think d is is going to be a Wogs player. Oh, Winds of he is, baby! He is going to be a Winds of Wogs player. Okay, d I'm vouching for you. I'm keeping up the bias. That's my boy. And it kind of makes sense, right? We're going to look at the setup here as well. He was <laughs> holding on to a lot of these Invoker units, and we saw it yesterday in the multicast alliance, but Galio can just go into these vertical Invoker lines, and the set, if he finds like an Invoker emblem somewhere down the road, it becomes very easy to look at and fitting in six Invoker onto these boards. Yeah, it's going to be insane. Doesn't really have the items just yet, but if you're able to get it, but you can see here, look at this, Travis. Went for Pulble Forge as well, got the Infinity Force. So even though you only have two options now to pick from these Pulble Forges, is going to be getting one of the one of the best ones, I think, at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, Weta, but already has a really, really strong opener. Yeah, I'm not fully sure, right, because a lot of the players that I speak often to that were, like, very firm believers in Ornus kindness, to, to taking a step away from that. One of them being stakes or going back into the, uh, into just playing Poro for the most part, but you can... In a spot like this, there's a lot of power in having something like an Infinity Force, right? Because it's so flexible, can go on to Neela, can go on to Saib, can go on to Mordekai, depending on what you, whatever you want to pick up. Yeah, but speaking of MF and all of these Billswater units, you knew who would re really be happy if he got that MF2? Yep, right ahead of us on the screen is going to be Gang because he has managed to go with Rising Infamy. So this is something that really sets you into a direction that you want to play with Bilgewater. It is an augment that allows you to get so much gold in the early game if you're able to get your Bilgewater cannons to cast. The treasure also ranks up with the game. The more and more you shoot these cannon barrages, the more your Infamy rises and the more gold you can make. Stuart, do you think he's going to be able to make it at all with a vertical Bilgewater in this lobby? I think it's going to be very difficult. I mean, build water, build water is a trait that doesn't really get contested at all. I mean, if the best scenario you can get with build water is, as you say, going for that rising infamy, try and get them early stacks as quick as possible. And you actually want the fights to last for as long as possible, trying to get them cannons online, trying to make sure that you get your units casting over and over again. You can see it doesn't have the misfortune because we got misfortune too on the other side, but thank you producers their rising infamy being able to you get a treasure chest and this obviously levels up every single time oh, wait six samiras what already 
Okay, one of one of the scary things about this board, by the way, Wida, is that in order for you to be able to put in some of that Bilgewater action or strength, you need Neela, which is a very contested unit. Same thing goes for GP, which also fits in some gunner comps, which also fits in, in so many compositions. So you need to know that he's sitting with six Samiras. I don't think he has the option to pivot as long as you have this augment or you're going to be basically playing with one dead augment. Also has a very ready Noxus active board that can be dropped and six Samira pairs. So does he pivot? Does he stick to it? I think it seems quite appealing with these Samiras. Oh, I wish we could hear you, Wida, okay. but you pulled another mute trick for us, so... Mike there is yours, go. sir. There Please we go, right. So, the thing is, like, with this setup as well, you got to keep in mind that for a gang here, you can play it as an Econ Augment and then time just live, go out of it at the end of the day here, but you also can make a Bilgewater Emblem with that spat. So he actually has to be able to go into that and start building towards the, the setup here as well. So... It's an injury spot for sure. He's playing the high tempo line as I'm talking about here. Samira 2 is one of the strongest early game units in the setup, even despite the nerves to it. I think the build water, build water stat is going to be really important because as you were saying, Morgan, you have six Samiras, but hey, if you can find a Samira 3 star and also put the build water spat on that Samira, then you're definitely in a great spot. So I think going for that spatula, very nice there for Ging to have four spatulas at the carousel. So being able to pick up one of them does need to find the right items. So we'll definitely have to keep an eye uh, on Ging's items throughout the rest of this game to see if he can find, I believe it's the cloak, if I'm not mistaken, you need the cloak to get the bilge water uh, yep, online, yep. which is going to be super important. It's the cloak. He doesn't have it just yet. He only has a needlessly large rod. Again, he was extremely lucky to get three spats on his carousel because he didn't even have the pick order. If it was one, if it was two, both of them were already taken by other players. So has it not been three spats, he would have 100% had to sacrifice the Samira. And that's the thing that's also worth noting here is that there are pat you go through patches of TFT where spats are like the least playable item in the entire game. You dislike seeing them on the carousel, but that's not really the case right now, right? Because you have the Iona, you have the Noxus. That was a very, very makeable spats here, and obviously Bilgewater as well, but it requires a little bit more of a specific spot. And speaking of specific spots, I think Travis is here looking very good, finds that Ash too as well. Yeah, he does have uh, the Ezreal legend as well, so going for buried treasures is normally really good if you want to try and win streak early on. Unfortunately, did lose that last round. It's kind of been on a loss, win, win, loss, but being able to build them early items like the guard breaker, like going for gunblade and potentially moving into other items. But, oh, we're jungler here. Double trouble. One Nico already. I think we know exactly what's happening with this board. And would Ixtal, baby, would Ixtal, that means that this Nico is going to be huge at the uh, late game stages. Again, you know that it increases HP every round, and if you don't know, now you do. You also know that it keeps them getting stats if he's able to put in three Ixtals, four Ixtals. But again, it is very good for his condition and his board reader. Yeah, but the issue is just going to keep in mind here, him and Daisic are holding hands at the bottom of the leaderboard right now, but there's also a very high likelihood they will be holding hands for the same units. Because he'll be going into an Invoker line, we also already saw Daisic is playing that Winds of War centered line with the Invokers already on the board. Sure, Daisic might have a different out for it, but it definitely seems like this could be something to keep in mind. I, I think the, the question is, we obviously, with the with the contention in terms of the Invoker boards, do you think that with Wet Jungler getting potentially just going straight for that Nico 3-star, maybe ignoring the Soraka is definitely a possibility? Or do you still think that, you know, the Soraka 3-star is one of the, the pinnacle points and one of the big things that you need to try and get this Nico and try and get this unit online? So that, there are like different ways of playing the compositions, right? Because a lot of people would like to roll in level 7. We haven't seen that a lot, honestly, this weekend. A lot of people have been staying on level 6, mainly because of the times we've seen the compositions, it has been like revolving around trade sector and other arcs where you kind of just benefit from staying at a lower level. But honestly, like I prefer going to level 7 because that way you have an easier shot at hitting your Tarix, hitting your Nikos, etc. And then, like Soraka 3 tends to arrive. So I'm interested to see whether or not there's going to be a disparity between whether or not Wet Jungler or Daisic are going to be staying. But it seems like Daisic is going in towards a more Ionia. No, no, I was just playing Demacia for that round here, ensuring he didn't lose to the Crux. I guess it's, it's like really much like you know this from coming from Wild Rift and also League of Legends, right? Stuart, like you don't talk about hovers. I feel like this is very much like a don't talk about hover situation. <laughs> Yeah, it gets a little bit confusing specifically when you focus on uh, the original regions of the units that it gets 
quite scary, but Daisyk has been having such a perfect run so far. He is almost level 6 with 60 gold. I do not think I saw anyone else playing Demacian so far, and even if, no one is going to be contesting the Galio. Keep in mind, for Winds of War, he only needs to hit that unit 3 star. Yes, you might need some damage to come in from the Kale. You might need some damage to come in from the Quinn if you're able to 3 star either one of them as a backline damage, because Galio himself, yes, he does deal damage, but still, the items you put on him, you try to keep him as tanky and have as much HP for the Winds of War to deal that much damage. But, imagine he gets better side checkles here, Stuart. It would be absolutely crazy, but you can see that Daisyk actually sold all of uh, the... Silvers. Oh, it's not silver. That's kind of boring, mm. but it's okay. <laughs> but you can see that actually Daisyk selling off the Invokers, maybe scouting and realizing that Wet Jungler was also going to contest. Ooh. So instead going for uh, the Demacias instead, and also building a Deathblade, might maybe think that this Galio is not potentially going to be three-star. Instead, it's going to be a Quinn carry on the back line. Again, that's kind of going to be the same setup as we're talking about with the Sorak and Nico lines here, where, where like you can easily roll for that setup on level 7 as well, if that's what you want to do here. Wet Jungler actually in a very good spot here, finds a Tarek 2 to keep his Nikos alive, and has them paired up as well as four copies of Soraka. Okay, he also has a slammable Jewel Gauntlet right now. If, you, if I know one thing about this composition, it's that this Nico has to get a PT, she has to get tanky, but Swart, does he slam the Joel Gundam now? Does he wait? What does he do with these Nikos and these items? I think he's really waiting for that Crown Guard. He's keeping that rod for, for the chain, trying to get Crown Guard. We've seen how strong Crown Guard is. Obviously, one of the new items in the mid set. Just being able to get that shield early on, and even when that shield breaks, getting that extra bit of damage, I think, in my opinion, is going to be a little bit more important than Jeweled Gauntlet. But it's one of them cases where, do you want to keep a win streak going? Do you slam the item now and not risk? saving up for that item or do you try and get the bis items yeah and i think as well it's also worth noting right basic I will, uh, sorry no um which i sorry obviously already had killed a chain by slamming that time's resolve right so really needs to just like keep that rod open because then he needs to prioritize a chain vest he can't like go prioritizing another rod and so can kind of make deal with whatever the jg not super important also if you stand the jg and all of a sudden a jewel lotus pops up well you've kind of somewhat ended up wasting quite a bit of resources in your items yeah, I also really like the red buff, by the way, given on Daisyk. He has little to no anti-heal on this board, and in order to get the maximum value from your Galio, you need to keep him stacking as much HP and tankiness as you can, so potentially making a Sunfire on him might not have been the best idea. So red buff works really well, It also an augment that averages a 4.2 right now in stage 2, so I think it's one of the best silver augments. It kind of allows you to apply anti-heal on an entire board, which also works with the Galio, so you can keep him tanking as much as you can. But Stuart, the only one win streaking at this lobby right now with eight wins, Travis, still at 100 HP. Yeah, and being able to go for Orn as well has the portable forge at the start and also went for the medium forge afterwards. So going for these crazy amount of items, going and being able to get the, you know, the MF2 star, I guess, naturally before before the game even really starts <laughs> is definitely a helping hand. But you can see the items that he has already as well. You know, you got a good set of frontline items and a good set of backline items as well. But one thing I did want to note, which I just saw with Ging, is he actually went for the silver augment of getting lesser champion duplicators. Now, this is the player that did go for uh, infamy as well and did go for the build water so maybe just maybe this game we so we could be seeing a beach build water world reroll angle we definitely could here but we are going to be changing our perspectives to Bixen here a player that is still very young you know i feel like he's been around forever but looking at this he opens up that early tome from that earth found a vanquisher emblem and now picked up one of those earliest bachelors and finds himself that Ionia emblem, Stuart, right? He's going to be able to do so many flexible things depending on which tunes you're going to be hitting on his roll down. Ionia yeah, the... and Vanquisher as well is crazy. Yeah, the Guardbreaker stats as well with the Vanquisher emblem. Just as Vita said, it makes such a perfect combo. That guy says going to be almost 100% critting. I'm too lazy to do the math, but hey, look at all these bolts. They shine. They're doing crits. Guardbreaker is doing an amazing job. Also, one of the best items you can put on Kaisa, because her ability allows for her to hit the entire board. So she's getting that Guardbreaker in enhanced one way or another now. She's very low on HP. That Jin barely keeps her alive with a Gunblade shot. Finally, she stays alive on one HP, getting Cubix on at two unit win. But hey, it matters. That Gunblade healing from Jin barely clutched the round for Cubix on. 
I think Malzahar actually missed in the end as well. I think Kaiser and Jin just walked forward and Malzahar just win, but a really good win there for Kupixicon, who did go for Earth. There are a few Earth, um, oh, sorry, only one Earth player in this lobby, but the interesting thing at the moment, our top three players are not going for Poro. We have Ezreal, Orn, and Earth as our top three players, and that's, I think, a big talking point because at the moment, we've been seeing a lot of players going for Poro and going for that flexible line. Someone like Wet Jungler, for example, that we can see at the bottom. Maybe just maybe these players are starting to adapt and trying to go for different legends, trying to change their game plan. Yeah, and I think that's also something you got to keep in mind that, I mean, it is world's time very soon for League of Legends. So I don't know if the Orin has kind of been jamming some legends never die because despite <laughs> all these massive nerfs coming through to, to Orin, he's just, he still shows his face sometimes, right? You, uh, it, It's rough out here, but, you know, he got to make it back and it, I guess he can rise like a phoenix also. You can also call him a god as well, we tell you that. <laughs> you can also call you know, him a god. He really ignites the game season, uh, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, it's like the worlds, they collide between the Ezreal and the Orn players trying to play for the high tempo. Holy. I need some of that we are. Give me whoa, some whoa, of that. Whoa, 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 we, we, whoa. We're all just warriors in this world as well. Like, we're fighting our way <laughs> through these things. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, let us pause a little bit from all these bad puns and jokes. I think that you guys are the only two people laughing on him right here. But the one who's gonna be laughing as well, if you look at his board, he has a silver ticket. He just got, I mean, a bronze ticket. He got two Tadex ready. He got a Niku two star. There's also five star rockets away from that three star board. I think with Jungler's position is really good. And you guys were speaking about a reroll composition coming in from Gang with that Rising Infamy. Specifically, that he just took the uh, army building. So. We just confirmed it, Wira. We're seeing a Belge Water reroll. How do we expect this to do in this lobby? It's going to really depend on how he's going to hit and how his power level is going to be compared to the rest of the lobby because you have players like Nevada here rolling down quite heavily with two, I two Ionia emblems as well as a Vanquish Your Heart, right? So on paper, there's a lot of power in this setup right now, but its items are a little bit lacking because both of those emblems come at the expense of that power and how that is going to hold up against something like the Bilgewater board, time will tell. It's six Vanks, six Ionia going in right now for Nevada. Able to hit it, only Nila one, only Zaya one, but it doesn't matter. The whooping amount of crit damage that they get and 100% crit chance as well is going to obliterate day six board. As we get into our third stage of Augments, Twat, I hope it is not another silver. I hope. Maybe a Prismatic will have to wait and find out. But I think one thing is that we do have two players that are going for spatulas uh, in this lobby with double Ionia and then the Ionia, Ionia and Vanquisher. Most people would prefer to go for the double Ionia spat because as you mentioned, Morgan, at level seven, you can get that for, uh, for Ionia, uh, sorry, you can get the um, Ionia online, you can get the Vanquishers online, and it's such a big spike, especially the six Ionia uh, board as well. And I think that's really a big win condition here. Again, we see people skipping Mana Burn here, and I, I still don't understand why, because Mana Burn is like one of the best arguments in the game, in my opinion, because it just really just provides you so much extra time for compositions, but I guess he just wanted to have the healing orbs, which makes a lot of sense in terms of the fact that he is relying on Zinedine Zarel to kind of stay alive and provide all of this disruption on the opposing backlines. I swear I knew that, you know, I've casted enough with Wida that I knew he was going to say that about Mana Burn. I sort of got as soon as I looked in our chat, I saw Morgan, that okay. sign. Morgan, I was the type of person to slam Shroud 2-1 since set free, okay? Oh, wow. I, 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 I love the item, okay? Oh my he's he's God. one of those, Morgan. He's one of those. <laughs> you know, it, one of these people that used to make me scout since stage 2-1 is probably Wida. Do, do you play on, on West? Do you play on the West? I do indeed. Oh my god, I do not want to have you against me in my games. <laughs> you, people like you make positioning way harder, Wida. With all these Zephyrs and all these Shrouds, I do not love playing in a game where you are my enemy. I mean, luckily, now you have the it's the support items. You don't have to deal with it as much anymore. I mean, we, we rarely see any support items being picked up. It's normally only from the portals and sometimes from the augments. But we've only seen a few players go for the augments with supports. But... Tarek 3-star, it's, it's a bit difficult because you don't want to sell anything on your bench to actually make this um, Tarek 3-star. Something that's very important here to point out, however, is the fact that he does have that Tarkin heart. First of all, it puts him to Soraka free because he's one off of that, but also 
it allows for him to go for the Tarkon 4 angle, it's gonna provide 60% healing and shielding increase once he's able to go towards that level 8 and find the Aphelios. It's such a huge power spike, and that's something we gotta keep in mind. And also a big thing as well is that he still hasn't been able to farm the Crown God uh, as, as well. It still has that rod on the bench, had to build a Titans and a Hand of Justice instead. So again, you're kind of in that position where it's like, do I still wait for the item? And I still think you can wait for the item because my jungler is on a win streak right now, five win streak, being able to pick up that Tarek as well. So Tarek three stars online. Okay, um, there are an Aatrox here, and there's also an Ari and Kabix, and he has that young, wild, and free. Gets out of head of it all, picks up the Ari. That's going to be a nice addition to his board. I love this augment. It ignores anything. It doesn't matter whether you're third pick, fourth pick, or whatever. I mean, he was first pick anyways, but does it matter? He's young, wild, and free, baby. And also, I think that we might be seeing him finally able to get that crown guard slammed. There was an armor piece here, but... Also, something that is very worth mentioning, after him picking up that Talking Heart, he won that final battle, so he didn't even have to lock in that shop. Gets another Tarek, and he's still one Soraka away. I think he's in a position where he might send it. He also went in for the Redemption before the Crown Guard, Ooh. by the way, Stuart. What do you think he's of also that? also one Soraka and one Nico away. That's pretty yeah. important. So like, yep. As we can talk about that, Misfortune is picked up by Gang here. Uh, ah, and the Nico has also been found, so... He got the Nikon. Just a Soraka waiting to arrive, but no gold here, so no point in wasting any econ on rolling down that stud. I guess that's something that you can get behind. Oh, for sure. This is going to be an absolutely insane spot now, but look at Ging on the other side. I don't think this is on my bingo card today. Bilgewater reroll with Misfortune three star in the back line. Unfortunately, doesn't have the blue buff that really helps Misfortune get online, allowed to cast more often, but I don't think it's going to be enough against this, this Nico just yet. Party Weeder! <laughs> Someone picked Someone? Mana Burn. He, he, he did. He also completely whiffed it, but that's besides the point here, because the point I kind of want to raise is that this card actually has a pretty good matchup into this because of the fact that Misfortune reduces shielding, plus there's so much frontline burst tied into that composition that it has a good matchup. But you know what? Wet Jungler is fully online, and I love the fact that he also just by pure instant walks up to pick up the orb from Double Trouble because like it's just like so mechanically ingrained into people. This board is, this is the Exodia board right now. I think if you were to talk to anyone at all, it's like, what's one of the best compositions that you can round out at the moment in this current patch? And this is it. This is, you know, items are maybe not the best, but that Nico three star, Tarek three star, and Soraka three star are gonna really pack a punch. Exactly, the items right now is the big Achilles heel for Wet Jungler's position. It's obviously very, very good. Let's not beat around the bush, mm -hmm. right? This is fantastic. He's hitting way beyond Kurt, but he also has used an Awkward to do that in that bronze ticket. However, he's lacking that third Soraka item. There is no magic shred either, right? So when she starts coming in and around some of these bigger tanks, he will potentially struggle against the claws. And as you point out time and time again, Stuart, still no crown guard either. Yeah, he doesn't even he have the choice whether to slam anything right now or not because whatever comes up he will have to make the choice whether it is he'll only have to play around with what he can okay because starting from now this is the final position where they can actually get components until maybe in the late stages in the cutter cells sometimes some uh, champions might have a component but even at that point you would still want to pick up the full item because it has more value unless there's a chain vest for him to slam with that um the rod that he has right now it's going to be perfect for him but again the only enemy that he has is that rod now for ging he still has 40 gold he has a duplicator i think he might be getting another one soon or he actually used one because it comes after seven combats and he's gonna be sending it right now we yeah, no blue buff here either, right? You were talking about that, but does have to pick up the Spear of Shodan. Show the option for the Adaptive Helm instead, right? So he did have multiple mana generating options, not the blue buff, but still will be able to continue to generate something here. And it's worth noting as well, if he is going to be able to find a GP, he could potentially lean towards a 7 bilge line somewhere down the road. Ooh. Oof, that's pretty strong, Stuart. Yeah, this is looking tasty, looking really, <laughs> really nice. Also has the Ionic Spark as well, one of the compositions that we were talking about at the start of the day, that Herald just buys so much time on that front line. And since you're going for so many different Void's three stars, it becomes so tanky at the same time, sometimes even tankier than some of these three star units. But unfortunately, the build water actually coming online just a little bit here for Ging and maybe have to wait for a few more three stars here for Org, but he's only on six HP. He has so many pairs he has to spend that lovely, lovely gold. 
You can see that he, I think he's um, two Shogath is away. He is maybe like two miles away or one miles away. I don't think he's even close to it. But if we take a look at Oak's board, him and Geng right now are on very borrowed time. He keeps getting five cost units. None of them are the GP that you asked for, Weira. Not, right, not yet, but someone that is kind of running it back to a familiar situation here is going to be Travis playing Gunners, but this time around, there isn't that big build of a cash out, right? He is going to be going down that Jay's free route instead here. So that's something we got to keep in mind, that this could be a potential struggle situation, but he has built up a very nice HP buffer that should land him that nicely into the top four. Yeah, look at that Maokai, Bramble Vest, d Warmogs. Warmogs. he has almost three BIS items on her. Ignore the Jewel Gauntlet on the Jinx, the only thing that matters is that it allows her to crit. And in a lobby where a lot of, a lot of Bramble Vest exists, there was a lot of R, but it doesn't matter. He, this Jace has a, has a DB, it has a 30 force. It's going to be killing and wrecking havoc through everyone in front of him, and Daisyk doesn't really have a chance. I, I know that there's a lot of trees on this map, Morgan, but I'm trying to find a Maokai, and I, I must admit, I can't find it. <laughs> I think you're late like a set and a half, Wida. That unit has you, you, been removed. Yeah, that's, you, you said, said you, you called Setuani Maokai. So I so, so try to be like, yo. I would have said Maokai? Here. You did yes. indeed. He did, yes. I have to be on Wida's side for this one, unfortunately, Morgan. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. So I'm sorry. Oh my god. Okay, that's 1 0. I'm going to keep my eye on you and I'm keep an eye on whatever I'm going to be saying from now on, okay? Because I got a little bit hyped. But there are they're no Maokai. They're both frontline. Front they're both pretty big. I guess they're kind of similar yes, in a way. One yes, just a, thank you, Stuart. One is just a tree and one is just a boar. You know, definitely very similar. Yeah. And, and one of them big. also has a decent board. And that is going to be the board of your very, very lovely double trouble board. That has been able to hit everything quite uh, way more earlier than even on time. And that is Wet Jungler. He does have that Soraka with the Shred Final Static Shift. Might not be the best item to slam on her, but he had to play with what he got. That Shred is going to be extremely perfect to get rid of that Galio immediately. The Quinn 3 Star is also able to delete his backline, removing all of his invoker invokers and killing the second Soraka. So the healing is not going to be enough. He's way too tanky as Dayzik doesn't fall down because Wet Jungler loses that one. Big here for Daisic hitting that Quinn three star. It was a few rounds ago. Also, there's a Slayer emblem as well. Daisic is going to be sprinting straight towards that. Also on a Kiana as well. So maybe looking for some more Slayers. And this is the big thing we've been talking about pretty much throughout the whole day is Demacia has been online for a little bit. That is, there is some players that are going for Demacia. But the big thing is, is that not no and no one has been able to find that Quinn three star yet. But you can see Daisic's board there, even against the Exodia board of that Nico that backline access that Quinn can offer is so, so huge. Yeah, as you group out here, Ork and Kubixen also have gone out here now. And the thing we got to keep in mind is that some of these players were on like 24 points going into this game, 23 even. And for them, going 8-8 eight, eight would mean that they would miss out on day three. Just something to keep in mind here that they are not guaranteed day three just yet. They gotta get above that 27, 28 breakoff point right now. King obviously is guaranteed already because he's gonna get three points, but that wasn't the case for everyone if they went into that bottom two. Just something to keep in mind here, just a little Ooh. bit of stress. That's a beautiful shroud though. It does hit both of his backline carries. That Jace is gonna take a long time to cast. Same thing goes for the Jinx. And it, immediately that MF is gonna be casting. Oh, thanks to the Shoshin. It might not have been the best item, but that delayed cast on both the Jace and the Jinx. It has gave his backline the time to apply these build water stacks. Is it enough though? They're kinda stuck together. So that ability from the MF is going to be dealing a lot of damage, but the Aatrox comes down from the dead. He has a BT. The Slayer's buff doesn't really give him the ability, but it doesn't matter as King stays alive for one more turn or no. Wait, who won that fight? I think Ging is out. I think Ging is, is out. out. Yeah, Ging, it? Ging is out. Yeah, <laughs> He lost it. The no. build water player is out. Credit, I salute to Ging. Credit to Ging uh. for going for the build water reroll. I think one of the first times we've ever seen build water reroll, uh, especially on the stream. But unfortunately, not just not trying to hit the mark. It was so close there. All we needed was a few more auto attacks from Azir, and it would have been enough to take down the Aatrox. 07 in the chats for King, right? But again, as I was talking about, he was on 25 points going into this game. He's going to be guaranteed the minimum 29. So no matter what, King is in day three already. And that's why we're following this game to get a full overview of who we are going to be watching before we're going to dive in and get some of those players on the brink instead here. And speaking of being on the brink, Nevada currently on the brink of death here. This Neil putting in a ton of work to keep him in the game, though. Yeah, now it's between him and Daisyk to whoever kills more units is going to be surviving to maybe try to scam a top four. Looking at both of them, I think both of them 
are not going to be top 4-ing because Nevada is now out and Dazic has been able to get that win against the Ghost. So now we're down to our top 4 players. Dazic scammed some points, so I think he's already guaranteed day 3. He's definitely going to be sitting in a good spot. Also, he's hit the Javan as well. And this board has been performing, you know, really, it performed really well in day number one. Hasn't really hit the mark here in day number two. But day six showing that if you can hit that three, uh, Quint three star, if you can get access to that back li them backline carries, it's going to be insanely strong. And that's like, there are a couple of spikes there on the board. Obviously, he didn't find that crown guy but he did pick up the, both the target and force well as that titan resolve so the additional resistance scaling coming through there is going to line up nicely with the additional healing and shielding that the nico will be generating here a player we haven't really checked in a lot with all throughout this game here is ketzer right he's on one of these vanquish lines we've seen so much of as well and again ketzer a player that got ever so close to making it to the championship in monsters attack faltered heavily in the last chance qualifier went last there but top six if I recall correctly, in EMEA last set, needs a strong performance this weekend to make it through. And right now, he is putting in a massive shift to guarantee a good tiebreaker for tomorrow. Dizik still has one more chance right now, and it's going to be against Travis's board. He doesn't have a mana burn to set his units off, but he has a Quinn 3. And guess what? I think Travis has four units in one line, so that Quinn is gonna be attacking all of them at once, but that Gunblade is keeping all of them alive. I'm not sure if that's a Shimmer or what's keeping it right now, but the Quinn has been able to put in a lot of damage on that Jace. One more cast is gonna be applying it. The Aatrox comes, but it's a little bit too late, and Dazic, no one is keeping an eye for that Quinn 3 at all. You have to move your units. The one, the one big thing as well that we actually haven't mentioned is the last augment of day six choice, the return on investment. Because he's going for a reroll com, because he was rolling down for the Galio and the Quinn, being able to get that tactician's crown from the return on investment allowed him to go for six layer. You got the extra uh, emblem off the carousel. You have the tactician's crown as well, which is going to be absolutely insane. Does level up as well now to level A, but this Quinn three star is in absolutely huge right now. Yeah, and he's just going to be pushing to level 8 here, trying to push his luck. He knows there's nothing he can roll for, really, that will help him more than leveling up. And now, this is the strongest board in the lobby he's facing, I think it's safe to say. But it is Dayton that is on this win streak here. Can he take down this Soraka? Time will tell. It isn't just the strongest board, but also a jungler has been aware enough to move the Soraka away to dodge the Quinn 3 damage, by the way. He moved her a little bit at the front, and look at him. He's kept her alive for as long as he can. The static shift is coming in. The Archangel keeps stacking, and no matter what he does, that Nico is staying alive, staying alive, baby, for all that Fortogon. The healing doesn't stop. The shielding doesn't stop. But Dazic, still with the Winds of War, is able to delete her from that last healing, all thanks to the red buff, not keeping her alive. It was smart, but Dazic's board is just way stronger, apparently. As you mentioned, Morgan, that positioning in there with the Soraka was really, really smart because you want to put the Soraka one more in front so it doesn't get focused down by the Quinn. But it's, somehow it's not enough. The uh, Galio three star with Wings of War on the front line, that Radiant Redemption is so huge as well. Just that extra healing from the only Galio, but also for that Mordekaiser as well, dealing that little bit of extra damage. But look at this, we're one Nila away from Nila three star. I mean, it's just, it's just flashing back, you know, it's just playing all over my eyes. You know, I don't know if Cats and Noel, they had a, a little phone call in between the previous two <laughs> games here, but uh, it is what it is here. And now I guess to see Dasic's board yet again take on a Slayer situation. There is no Bramble Vest on the side of Dasic, right? So the Slayers are a lot more effective in this matter than you might expect here. And it is going to be relatively dicey, but I think that the Quinn might have this under lock. Yeah, also Kenzer barely gets to stay alive here with just 5 HP because it was a one unit loss. So a small friend of mine, Soji, says that this was just a fake loss. And also, Carousel isn't coming right now, Stuart. Yes, he just typed it and I love how we're sharing the same idea, but is it another Nila 3? Nope, no, no Nila on the Carousel, three. unfortunately. Probably just going to try and get as much gold as possible. I think he already has his units and he already has his uh, items online. He's just going to deny away the Heimerdinger. does pick up a Giant Slayer for himself, but he does need to roll down now. Day 6 still on a win streak, 6 win streak with, it, with this Damasio board. <laughs> Yeah, one win streak for each of his HP right now. It is dicey. All could change. Just a single unit right now will be all the difference between comes. who is going to take any of these top four spots here. Wet Jungler, the only one with some sort of leeway right now as we talk about Ketso rolling it down. That's the wrong forecast vanquisher right there, but there is no Nila inside as of right now. Saya shows her face again and again, but it is Nila we want to see. And she's just not there, guys. Yeah, he tried his best. He sold that Darius, he sold that Aurelia. 
But Nila's just not coming. Quite unlucky for him. He knows that this was his only bailout card, but now it's gonna be Kedzer playing against with Jungler's board, which is again one of the strongest in the lobby right now. There are gonna be no ghost fights. Both of them are now facing each other. Dasik also still alive on one life. Winds of War from Galio is going to be keeping him alive for as long as he can, but apparently the positioning did not give him the maximum gargoyle value, so he might be falling down a little bit too quickly. And Daisyk takes up another win, and same thing goes for Katzel, who's going to be losing this round, and we're now down to our top two players. It's Daisyk and Jungler. And we were talking about this as two players that would end up contesting each other. Daisy going for a completely different route that neither of us really were discussing to, right? We weren't really expecting him to go into the Slayer reroll as of this line here. But as you're talking about the Slayer, Emily picked up on an earlier carousel alongside that return on investment here has really just put this board over the edge and as we have seen time and time again where Jungler has been losing this matchup consistently, I do not know if everything is if anything is gonna change at all here. Uh, might be the last fight for Daisy and Wet Jungler. He has uh, almost reached the final cap for this board. The itemization on Dust Rocker is going to be keeping her alive for as long as he can with the Archangel. You have to make sure that the positioning again this time was not let down. The Soraka is set up one hex forward so it doesn't get targeted by that Quinn. However, for how long can that Niku hold on? That Mordekaiser is still attacking. The Quinn cast still has not touched the Soraka even once. Winds of War is now applying its maximum value to that Soraka. Tanking in with that damage. This time the Niku might be able to burst it down. The Soraka stays alive. The Quinn one-shots her and now his only damage source is going to be through that. Nico and it goes to overtime as he loses with jungler is now one round away it's between him and Daisic to who is able to one shot the other carry faster and this is pretty extraordinary to see because this whole weekend has all really been about this Nico. We've been talking about it so many times, you know, being able to go for the Nico, especially with double trouble as well. As I mentioned before, probably considered one of the strongest compositions. But Daisic, with this different line now, we're going for return on investment and also the items as well on the Quinn, the Radiant items, has been so powerful. And even with the positioning that Wet Jungle is trying to do, trying to position Asaraka one in front to try and dodge the Quinn's ability, it's not enough. And also, as you're talking about earlier, Morgan, right, that red buff has been ever so critical in this matchup specifically, because this matchup is all about the healing, right? You have Redemption, Soraka heals, you even have the Hand of Justice on the Nico, right? So there isn't going to be that explosive burst healing when every single unit that is on the board applies anti-heal on top of that Sunfire Cape in case none of the units aren't being targeted. And even now, Wet Jungler picking up a Morello here, I don't think that's going to have a massive impact, but it might be that anti-heal consistently he has needed to shot down this guy. Galio's Absolution. Big thing to note as well is the Heimerdinger got upgraded as well. So that might be the difference. Yeah, he finally got that Shrink module and finally that anti-healing might be the only missing factor that he was able to keep that Galio alive for. However, the Morello stays in for a lot of the fight. The positioning from the Soraka again has been perfect. Now the Nico's tanking up all of them. The anti-healing on the Galio is getting him reduced really quickly. Way more than last fight. This one is looking way closer for Wade Jungler, by the way. The Galio falls in a little bit too early. The Soraka's down, staying alive. And there goes the Nico with the Hand of Justice. He only needed one key factor, the anti-healing. He got that Meccano in the turret. And he got that Morello. And finally, Daisic will be shut down with that three-star Quinn as Wade Jungler claims his spot in that final lobby. And now... We are down to one more game before we're able to decide who qualifies to day three. That Heimerdinger turret in the end, being able to get the Shrinko in the end, and also the Meccano mod for the anti heal for the Shrinko as well, actually being able to shrink the Galio, especially on the front line, was the big difference because we saw that Dasic was winning round after round after round. But Wet Jungler, when he finds a Heimerdinger, he actually sold a pair of Heimerdingers to pick up that Shrinko module, and it was enough. That was enough for Wet Jungler to win in the end. Yeah, absolutely great showcasing again two players that historically speaking have been very prevalent on the EOS ladder as well. So always nice to see that coming through again. We saw the, uh, the, the power of their early loss as well, just getting that econ to get their comps online. I was very happy when I saw that Winds of Walks being picked up at the early game. I was very happy when I saw that Gully hit three star. And I'm also very happy to see that he made it to the second spot. But now going to be going to a very small break before that final lobby. So again, grab all your snacks, all you need. Or actually, don't. Because we have an interview with Memo while we wait through for these three minutes. And then go to the analyst desk. Uh, hello guys, I'm Memo, I'm 24 years old, I'm from Germany, 
And yeah, my TFT player. Uh, right now, I think Z9 or Rune Terror Reforged is like one of my favorites so far. Uh, it's like where I've been seeing the most success and I've been taking the game more serious. I think the balancing was a bit off here and there, but I think like all the new features, like the legends are very cool. And yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot right now. I like the TRCs a lot. I think it's very healthy to have like uh, every region have like their own league where they can like practice and stuff and have like uh, weekly uh, weekly games where they have to play in a league. I think uh, I was like twice first now in the regular split in the German league. And <clears throat> I think it was uh, very good for like the entire scene to have like a stable league that they can play like all the time. Uh, so first of all, I would love to shout out everyone in the German community. Like you guys are the best, like legit. You are always spamming the chat. Like I, when I see you guys' name in the chat, I always like get so happy. Uh, even in last GC when I was not streaming and I was seeing like you guys cheering for me. It was like uh, such a good feeling. Um, you guys make me motivated to, to keep on playing and keep on trying. Um, so I really appreciate every one of you. Um, but a special shout out to like all my study group, especially like the OGs like Zaza and Elia. Like with these guys, I've like without these guys, I would never make it here. And like this set, we started prepping with like some Turkish players as well, like Ging and Chenar. Uh, I respected these guys a lot. Like I was always looking up to them, like back in the day, like in set five and stuff, I would look at Ging's stream and it's like crazy now to talk to him and like prep with him. So thank you to those guys as well. And uh, yeah, lastly to Dysik as well. Um, I think without Dysik, I wouldn't make it so far last GC. He showed me how to play Wolf. And uh, because of him, I think I had like a lot of success last set. Welcome back to the analyst desk and my colleague here counterfeit was saying that this was going to be a chaotic desk so I'm trying my very hardest to keep him on his toes but we have our winning comp ready and it is a comp I couldn't be happier about after so much Ionia, Vanquisher, Mordekaiser, Red Jungler finally pilots this comp to a top one. The double trouble coming in, the bronze ticket coming in, the Targon heart coming in, Wood Ishtal, everything was perfect for him. Then at the very end, like Stuart was pointing it out, getting that Heimerdinger to allow him to beat day six board. I loved seeing that. I was so giddy about it. There is more in this game, but Peter, how do you feel about what we just saw? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. As you said, there were so many ingredients that were pushing that ball beyond the usual limits, but it was really fascinating to see how unusual of a final opponent Dasic was presenting there, with, you know, the Slayers managing to push all the way up to six. You know, there was such power there that I really hope we get to see Dasic and others really going down this Slayer route, Slayer route a little bit more option, or a little bit more often, rather, because it showed that it had an almost equal cap out. I think if Wet Jungle hadn't had quite as many pieces in place, it could well have gone to Dasic. All right, in fairness, it's not just any old Slayer comp. This is a Winds of Woke board that Dasic picked up super early. This Galio was healing like there was no tomorrow, and the Quinn and the Fiora just did the rest of it. However, there was more in this lobby. Early on, we were kind of talking about the Travis comp and thinking that he was going to go into Ionia, having a good early start with that Irelia, Ash, and Jin, as well as the Zet. 
wasn't the case. He went into his Orn items. He went for the challenger route. A little bit of flexing out there with the gunners. Super, super cool to see. And something else that I really love, despite it not doing too well, King giving us that Bilgewater reroll, Peter. Yeah, I mean, we saw, of course, you know, Travis grabbing hold of the MF two star at stage one, which is absolutely crazy, but it's all about getting into position now for our final lobby. Again, we've got 64 players live right now. By the time we head into tomorrow, half of these players will have said farewell. We are seeing Kevin here. I was staring at him, Lelouch and Kenobi, all three of them on this page during our game as the results were coming. And I'm like, oh, this guy got a second place. and This guy got a second place. Those are the players that I particularly want to see go through to day three. And they still <laughs> need a little bit more. All of them need a top three finish at least. A top two finish would be better. But we have good news. For the German fans as well, Memo looking to solidify himself into the top cutoff. Sokati is still in. We spoke to her day one. I'm super excited to see her go as far as she has been. And of course, with that, Germany naturally makes it to the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brett Jungler did put on a hell of a performance last time around, but you can see, because of course we were at Lobby 1, a lot of those same players directly affecting whether finish out Day 2 overall. You know, I think from what we've got on our table there, there's a lot of familiar names in the play, so I'm really glad that we are seeing a few new people managing to still perform well in a very rarefied environment. These are incredibly hard players to take any points off of at all. I couldn't agree more. Another player I do want to shout out, I was pretty excited about seeing him in the tournament on day one. He ended rather low yesterday, but he seems to have snuck into the top cut of Broken 99, is also in that very, very top bracket together with a lot of other really cool and exciting players like Luque, like Arzu. So keep them coming. I couldn't be happier about the player field that we have for this day two of Golden Special Cup number three. And our casters are ready to take you into the last game that will be deciding it all here. Wita, Morgan and Stuart. Thank you so much, Mix. We are more than ready. We are more than hyped for the final lobby of our second day. Not the final day. We still have tomorrow. But in order for us to go into tomorrow, we need to know who qualifies. We're now set to a lobby where it's extremely close. Not everyone from this lobby is going to be qualifying. Stuart, Wita, who do you guys have your eyes on beginning with you, Wita? I mean, I'm looking at, I mean, Kevin Parker, right? Like, I think that's a big one that is, that is in here for sure. There, there are a lot of like really interesting <laughs> names here. Once we get them on the screen, Stuart, I'll let you talk about a couple of them as well. Yeah, for sure. I think players like uh, Spotty, who we've been seeing uh, a few times this uh, this time, has uh, you know made two day ones so far in both GSC one and GSC two. So you know this is first time making day two. So maybe potentially all, making it all the way to day number three. But as you said, you know Snooty Boo as well, one of the veterans. But I think we've got a good mix in this lobby. Some new players, uh, some veterans, sorry, but also some new players as well. Uh, with the you know with the Turkish player coming in, uh, Karuk. Coming oh, in as well. I Karu, love I this portal of diversity. It doesn't seem like any of them seem to agree. We got two on Immortal Bastion, three at Fins, and three at Serpentine. So the odds are almost 33%, but it, they're gonna get two guide, and it's going to be Karub who takes it. What do we think of this portal, Wira? Time to go looking for a Pildova because you know what? Like, this is gonna be 15 extra life. We saw what happened early on with Travis when he had that last stand to fall back on. Well, now they'll have 15 yep. extra HP here. And for someone like Exo, who we spoke to yesterday, he was our highest performing player after yesterday, meaning that should he go in and win the lobby at a cut of his 28, his tiebreakers will almost be unfallible for pretty much everyone else. And even in a second place situation, and it goes to 20 seven points and that's a cutoff it is going to be a very hard score for the other people to beat for sure i think this this being a lobby where we portal is now going to give us more hp means that i, I may, well unfortunately for some maybe fortunately for others but maybe reroll might be more of an op option as people have a lot of more hp to play with and we'll have to see how any all the boards happen uh, i think one is just oh wow just natural um, two kianas uh, i guess that's, that's cool. graves. you got a graves oh. you got a graves 
Nah, I think he's down for something else here. He has the two cups of choke elf already. Right? I, can, I, can, I can't behind it, but it's wood, right? He has the choke elf already. Yeah. This could just be a choke death moment, and I will say something. Snooty pulled this exact same thing on me in a ladder game earlier on this season. So uh, <laughs> uh, it's definitely familiar territory for a lot of people. But also keep in mind here, interesting little legends choices here. Snooty going for Tom Kench wants that economy, Stuart. We oh. that? What we there? He just missed Kiana too. I know it's with Ix Ishtal, but that was a Kiana too. And yes, Swart, I see that you're very hyped about this Tom Kench, so let us see the first set of augments as you talk us through them. And why don't we see Tom Kench that much? I mean, I don't really care about the Vis Kiana too. I think me and Buita want to unbench hey, the Kench me. with Snooty Boo. Um, How do you know? That's an Ionia crest. <laughs> I mean, you want rich get richer, but is this an int? Yeah, it's just an int to pick up. Okay, I guess we're not unmentioned a Kench to this time, unfortunately. The unfortunate thing about this, right, Stuart, is the fact that he actually doesn't have another Ionia unit to go with his set right now. So that is going to impact... It, definitely. Ouch. Like, Snooty, Snooty always great for his reactions, right? But he doesn't have that full-on tempo to push because he doesn't get the Ionia online just yet. Yo, 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 there's a Swain. If you're going to be committing the Sorks, I guess, but it needs to make that 10 gold. Which is very understandable. Yes, we're not unbenching the Kench, which I think. However, this is the beauty of TFT, by the way. Any other players in, in this specific situation, you know, it's a Mortal Bastion. Why not take Rich Get Richer? Make an enormous amount of money, lose a lot of rounds, and you have 115 HP to compensate for that. You also get Carousel Priority, but an Ionia Crest is Ionia Crest, I guess. Yeah, I think you exactly said it right at the end. I, the Ionia Crest is an Ionia Crest, and we've already seen that Crest and Emblems are so important at the moment in this current patch, and Ionia Emblem uh, is one of the best at the moment. You can put it on uh, units like Neela, but also it's been really popular on units like Ash as well. Um, so both these units, definitely Snooze is going to be looking for that line. Yeah, and he is, as you're talking about, he's no, it's like these stocks here just to kind of just save some HP, right? But also worth noting that Kevin Parker is on Sentinel Spirit, so he will be going down that route as well. We have two players on dedication as well. It's a player on a Noxus Crest already, so some very heavy commitments from 2-1 already here. Which something we got to keep in mind. Again, we have compositions that stabilize on 7, but they might actually be able to skip level 7, go 8 with that extra 15 HP. Yeah, we also have a dedication coming in from Briss, and he does, apparently, is going towards one of two things. Either this is a Noxus path, and we also have someone else that has a Noxus crest, and is going against him, is going to be sporty. So, to sum this up, ladies and gents, if you just entered the stream, we have someone with a Ionia crest and someone with a Sentinel spirit. So, we do know that there is going to be at least two people playing Ionia. Going into be Chris, he has dedication, and he had a Noxian board. He might be going challengers with that, but also, we have sporty playing on another Noxus Stuart. What's happening in this lobby? I think we've got a triple way contest here for Noxus. Two people with a dedication route and also one player already having the Noxus Bachelor from also getting a Noxus Crest as an augment. So this could be this could be many things. This could mean that all of these players will maybe just skip Casio three star completely because sometimes you can go for this Casio reroll or the Samira reroll with the Noxus. But a lot of players, when they realize they're contested, they just try and push levels and they try and hit their Mordekaiser because that is a different route that you can go uh, with Noxus. But it, it being triple way contested uh, between Spotty and also the two dedication players is going to mean an absolute fiesta of a last game. Silence is always good. We love a bit of silence. Um, just like kind of, because that was such a big statement, too, right? We kind of got to let it stand on its own there just for a second, right? Because Mordecai is a well. He requires a bit of respect. He is a very, very fearful boy. Oh, yeah. He's, he's, he's so, so strong just as a forecast. I mean, I mentioned it already in in the previous game. I think him, be, him being added into the Noxus is going to be so important. So now it's all down to itemization. We have to keep an eye on all of these lobbies as well, uh, being able to see. Oh, there's another there's a spatula. There's a spat. There's a spat. But none of the players slamming and going for the spats are going to be up except Bricks, which currently has dedication. So that means that, ladies and gents, Bricks is going to be having two emblems at the ready. He also has a bow waiting for him outside, maybe. So does he keep going with the... Oh, wait. He doesn't have the bow. He has a tier. Does he switch to Sorks? He already has two emblems. You can hit that six or eight Sorks really early if he decides to go with it. 
it's worth noting, right, that he has, he doesn't have the dedication online just yet because you need to have four units of the same trade in for a fight for that to trigger, right? So he still has a lot of flexibility, as you are alluding to, Morgan, with the fact that he can make a switch up depending on which component he is going to get dropped until he makes a decision. And with so many people already looking down the Noxus route, that could be something to keep in mind. Yeah, but also dedication does work off any slammed emblems. So if he makes a Sorx Pet and he puts in four Sorx somehow, it's still discount for the dedication. They don't have to be four natural Sorx. So he could get that the very next round and start winning. Also, Stuart, I think that Immortal Bastion would be the wet dream of anyone attempting to play Piltover. Surprisingly though, I haven't seen a single Piltover port so far. Everyone is going for emblems and there's no one playing Piltover in the perfect region for Piltovers. No, I think the thing is with Piltover now is that you only really play it at 2-1 if you're lucky enough to get it right at the start. And even then, sometimes Piltover can be a little bit risky. Unfortunately, we don't have Zeri anymore. That was taken away um, away from us in the mid-set. We do have Aphelios instead, which not really a lot of people consider as the main carry now for Piltover. We're seeing a lot of Jace reroll and also Jinx reroll. And we've already seen today that it can work out very well, but I think it's a little bit difficult to execute. So... I'm not really surprised here because of so much that so much is online in this game, Morgan, as you mentioned already, with all of these players just being on the brink of making it to day number three. It's so important to make sure you just play your game, you play a stable board, and you play what you know best. We've also got Kevin and Sporty wins streaking, both of them. And lucky enough, Kevin Barker has now been matched against Nudibu, who has not been having such a good win streak at all. In fact, he's doing extremely well. But by the way, Spody also right now has a win streak and i think we might be going into stage three with with both players win streaking also kevin is able to keep up that 20 gold with a five win streak at level five and i think spotty also won his round so yes it's immortal bastion and we're getting two players win streaking at 115 hp there yeah, and it also got kind of saw uh, B Chris here kind of sell off his ball to guarantee the loss streak, right? That's something as well you got to keep in mind here that we will need, we will see players sometimes when they have to guarantee and ensure the loss streak if there are other players in the lobby that are also on the same line. Kind of oh. look towards that as well. But he is potentially looking towards getting that Dimash emblem online, That's playing it. that vertical Dimash line that we have seen come into play ever so often. You know, Mort would, would be really happy if he was here with us today because yesterday he kept waiting and asking for that nine Demacia to go in play finally. Um, and I think we have an angle his with go, his, Chris. His, his, his gold amount is very nice, I would say. It's extremely nice. 70 gold. Not, a, not, 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 a, not anymore. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think you missed it, it Morgan. A, it was a funny number, Morgan. You missed it. Oh my god. I, I wanted Sweet to keep the stream PG-12. Okay? I wanted to keep it PG-12. But fine, no one, no one saw it. If you, it's fine. If you missed it, Morgan, no one else saw it. So it's okay. That's okay. No, no one saw it. No one saw it. Stuart, anyway, down to yeah. eight, to eighty gold now. It is not the funny number anymore. Sorry for ruining your joke, Weeda. I'm trying to be a nice guy. My mom is in the chat. But Stuart, why don't you go? I'm Morgan's mom. I'll be going. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I wanted to talk quickly because we did see B Chris actually take the spatula. But the one big thing now with Demacia is you can't actually make a Demacia spatula. So even though he might be going towards this Demacia line with 80 gold, which is a lot of gold. Yes, you can get the um, emblem from going for dedication. But then what's this other spatula actually going to be used for? That's the thing is what you got to keep in mind, right? Is that... Um, you need to look at here. Actually, I don't even think it's going to be at the Marshall line. It's not guaranteed, right? Like, he's just fully opening no. up here. He has so much gold to work with. He's waiting to see what this next augment is going to be. And it might just be that massive level 7 oh. full send on free fire. With all this gold, he's accumulated by essentially having blood money due to the fact you can be so liberal with his economy right now. Not necessarily have to care about his HP either. But picks up the Pandora's bench here. So some sort of reroll line might have to come into effect. He's actually not even going to level to seven as well, as you said, We or maybe might have been a choice here. But like you said, with so much gold, is maybe thinking about it. No, it's just going to stay at the moment. So maybe just trying to get his board a little bit more online, then trying to go for level seven at three, five, which we see a lot of players do when they lose streak. But with so much gold, it could have been definitely a possibility. And it also would have given him a direction as well. If you also um, went for it, you come up um, You'll take it. Yes. Excuse me? That is one very good Reek and Bob, by the way. 
Not only does he get the Scion, but he also get one of the strongest five cost units in the game, and that is going to be the Aatrox. He also has a Nila waiting outside. Does have a dedication still that didn't give an emblem. If that goes as a Noxus emblem, he can have five Noxus already because he has a Scion. Might be going for seven Noxus even. Hell, why not? But that two-star Velcos is not really effective in this board, is he? It's still one. It's one star still, right? But it's just a massive bonus because Aatrox can really help stabilize a lot of boards here. Also worth noting, Hubin did not go to level six here either, right? So he didn't get the four knockers in. He is keeping hold of that um, Katarina on the bench here. So I think that's will be the line. He will be going down here very shortly, but he's keeping a hold of his economy, keeping that in check. And then he's going to have that natural five saw, five Noxus line coming in here after the, on the other side of the carousel. He has his Mordecai's items pretty much already ready to go. So with a Noxus Aatrox coming out here in just a second, he's going to be in a very powerful spot to work with. Yeah, this is probably one of the best recombobulators I think you can ever get. You know, being able to natural two four costs early on and then recombobulate that into probably considered two of the best five costs in the game right now. And it allows you to go for a nice, easy dedication line as well. We have to remember, this is a um, contested line. You can see there's plenty of Noxus spats across the board. But being able to get these two late game units already online, yes, it's not going to win you rounds just yet. Maybe if you find a Mordekaiser early on, it could be enough. And it's worth noting that Noxus is one of the traits that gives you a lot of combat power across every single unit because when you look at his augments right now, he is going to be down to combat augments essentially. Not on someone like Spoti, and we have seen other people go for the Pandora's Bench, but there will be people in here that do have some combat augments that he will have to contend with. So that's something that we gotta stay ahead of. Look at that fat Boro moving in. He has Young Wild and Free. It's a perfect silver augment for Kevin Parker, by the way, because he's still the only player sitting at 115 HP. So getting that Young Wild and Free, still having Carousel priority, is very good for Kevin. He also manages to get another glove. So everything is going very well for him. You can see that Makes is really, really happy in the background that one of the German players is doing absolutely good in his lobby, Stuart. Yeah, Kevin Parker having an absolute field day at the moment. Also get, picking up that Sentinel Spirits to start things off, which get, not only gives your probably one of the uh, most consistent uh, you know combat arguments for Ionia, giving your units you know so much extra power, but also getting the extra Ionia units is something that I think a lot of people underrate because if most of the time before you get into that first combat, you're normally keeping the Jins, you're keeping the Sets, you're keeping the Irelias. So as soon as you hit that did that Sentinel Spirit. You can then get them upgraded really early on. Now, speaking of upgrades here, the Renekton Free is going to come through. Not early on, I still struggling to find that choke at free, but he is slowly but surely getting there. But another consequence of the extra HP that you're able to sack, it also means that the divide that you're going to have to make up is going to be a lot bigger for those top four spots. You're looking at the drop off from Exo compared to even Hubin right now in fifth place. That's already going to be that 21 HP. And then you compare to someone like Karu, for example, still sitting at 107 HP. It is going to be something that you got to keep in mind. Yeah, he's also very close to that Milio. He's one Milio away, and we've seen two Pandoras in this lobby as well. So that is a very good sign for Exo, by the way, because all of the one cost and two cost units are going to be taken out of the pool that you have two uh, reroll players playing in this lobby. So he's not really that far away from the Shogath, as you tell. There goes in the Milio again. He had to do it because it's a Wood Ishtal. And what does a Bruiser player want more than HP? Nothing else. But he's yeah, still, this he's is a really... It's, yeah, it's it's, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, this is this is a very different bruiser board I think we we've ever seen. We saw, you know, going for oh, this um, is a, Neo three and Kiana is just in there a, as well. This is a hello darkness, my old friend moment for me personally. I will I will have to say that much. Like I have been in this spot in plenty of times, but yeah, you have like the Cassia, you have like the Renekton online, but Shogaf is just so far away, right? So I guess it gets some of that back from the fact that he is going to be on that Ixtol here, giving us so much extra power with that wood, but. It is definitely something that we gotta. You gotta feel from just a little bit. At least Choke Gaff 2 is still relatively stable. We can see Snooty is still rocking that to the Oriana with the balanced budget. And the big thing as well is that his items are actually pretty decent as well. I think, you know, like you mentioned, I think you said it rightly, you know, I think one of the main uh, reasons why this composition is so strong at the moment is that Cho'Gath three star. But if you got the items there, you know, you had the Dragon's Claw, you had the Redemption, you had decent items for Cassio on the back line. It's really good. And he also had one chain. So he just needs one more chain vest here from Walls to be able to hit it. But 
Snooty here, the player that went for the Ionia Crest early on. Takes, did take balance budgets as well, so he's going to be getting a little bit of extra gold and is trying to roll down to hit some of these units. Yeah, this is kind of what you can see sometimes when people, they have a, a pretty hard decision to do. They will just roll down a couple of gold, a couple of econ break points here oh. over, over the neutrals. Wait, there's no tailoring, Matt. He just rips a Vank emblem with no tailoring. This is so huge for the spot as well because he can just get the full Vank online by upgrading what is already on his board. Finds the Nila as well now, meaning that this potential 6 Iona 6 Vanquish line will be very possible the second he reaches level 8. But like, again, he is ever so close to just having an insane board online. He finds the Saya pair, Stuart. He is going to be in a very, very good spot. This is the thing, as you mentioned, I think being able to hit this board is crazy, but he's hitting zero upgrades. He's rolled all of his gold, and he's not hit any upgrades at all. He did hit one Nila. He does hit the Zaya pair, but you need to hit them two-star. He has six Onia. He doesn't have six Vanquisher just yet. He does need one more level. But as you said, when I saw the Tome, I was like, cool, you can maybe hit another Onia or even a Vanquisher. He doesn't care about the tailored. He just pops it straight away, and he wins out by getting the Vanquisher emblem. And Snooty, if he can not take as much damage here, and if he can roll and hit, Wait, these, that, uh, hit this unit's two star, it'd be great. He has Darius in chop as well, which might be crucial for this six Vanquisher board if he wants to keep it alive to maybe get for like say, two star. But I think he's relying that he might be getting it very soon. Also, B Chris right now sitting on 27 HP at stage 4 1. This was a full lost streak gameplay, if I'm not mistaken. And now we're down to our third selection of Augment Sweeter. So we are going to be looking over at. Beaker's position, I believe, here. Finds Ooh. the Ixchel Heart, which is actually something that could be pretty fun to look into. Gifts is also pretty good. But it's Cyclops it's really position, good sorry. Score. We couldn't we couldn't see the name of anything right there on the board, right? So Wood Ixtel, Nico, that's a love story made in heaven. And now Pandora's well, maybe not bringing that much for Sporty, by the way. He's also sitting on with the QSS. Maybe going in for seven Noxus. He does have the emblem. Finally gets it with the Darius being two star. He pops yeah. this bad off. And now, if you look at Exos board, he's been able to stack each tall wood for all that time. And finally, Wida, there is no darkest, there is no old friends. He will be hitting that Shogath. Yeah, but he has to carry the Milio, right? He doesn't care, have to have builds to carry the Cashio pair. He's too far away. Wow. He has to sell. His economy is very much in the gutter, and there's just so many people right now that are going to be ahead of the curve. He might be stable for just a few rounds here, but up until that point, he could just absolutely fall off of a cliff. And again, he has to make up a 40 HP differential, most likely to make it into the top four even. I actually really like this adaptation though from EXO, probably realizing that there are so many Noxus players in this in this lobby. So you're probably like three or four way contested for this Cassiopeia. So realizing that it's Ixtar Wood, which... Oh, the no way. Yeah, no way. Yeah, no way. It just gets it. It was close. It was <laughs> close. But no, as I was saying, I think realizing and adapting and knowing that you're going to be able to get the um, the woods egg style and knowing that you're probably not going to hit the um, the Casio three star because it's so contested by so many units or so many players. Sorry, that the adaptation is good. I mean, it might not look great, but the adaptation it could work out in this game. It's a bit of what going to say. Uh, go ahead, Rita. I was just going to say you need to watch out for B-Crest, by the way, because he already has two stars, two, two four cost three stars. So if that Mordekaiser or that Nila come as an Anassas, as a Javan, as an Azir, we could have a very early one of them three stars. Yeah, but the issue is you also got to keep in mind here that is pretty much his only out at this moment in time. His items right now for the Azir are not that, in, not in a pretty good spot. His items for the Silico are a lot better. So. Once everyone else kind of starts coming in and reaching this level of stability for their compositions, this Shurima board will start to fall off because right now it is one of the most it's one of the most difficult comps to play from behind. It's a comp that really benefits from being played from ahead. So that's something that we gotta keep in mind. And the, interesting gonna... the interesting factor as well is that he's actually gone for just a vertical Shurima option uh, with that dedication. I mean, B Chris was a player that early on we saw had dedication, had the Demacia, had so many other things um, early on, and it was kind of crazy, to be honest with you. Yeah, now we're on to this carousel again. If you would look closely, B Chris already has two Shurima's bats again, by the way, Wida. So... He doesn't have any little large rod to spam that one in again. He does have two Shurimas, but now he's only relying on one thing to survive with that Pandora's Bench. 
if it gets him a bailout card with one of these units three starred. Not a single it Azir, is? not a single Jarvan. Aww. Not. Okay, that's no. another Zelko. But at least the Aatrox will keep him alive with the Shamus Bat. Yeah, this is the Aatrox, right? It's such, an, it's such a huge addition because when you pair that up with the Nasus, that extra Omnivamp is just going to help that Nasus stay along for such a long time. And the issue here as well is the fact that B Chris is playing for first. Slamming down this TG here is not a play for first spot. This is a, I'm trying to play for a top four style slab, so he can't really afford to do that. He will have to do it anyways. Just hope that this Pandora's bench will just completely open the floodgates and find him a free star somewhat soon. Also, that Thieves Gloves giving him the Joel Gunther with the Night Harvester gives that Azir a whooping amount of almost a hundred percent crit chance because the Thieves Gloves itself gives a forty percent. And there you go with the Jewel Gunther and the Night Harvester. He rolled very, very good items for this fight on the Azir, allowing him to get another nice round against Karubji board. Now. He does have a Sunfire on the Nasus, the anti-healing is going, the Silco keeping them alive with the blue buff is extremely good. But in another situation, this Thieves Gloves really was BIS for him, Stuart. Yeah, it really was. It really saved him a round or maybe even more than a round. We'll have to see with the Thieves Gloves later on. But Snooty Boo also still down there. Snooty Boo hasn't been able to hit any of his units probably. That's why he keeps losing rounds even after hitting all of these units. Nothing again here for B Chris. And I think I feel like we're going to be on this board a lot for the rest of this game because we're really just waiting to see what these four cost two stars are going to turn into. Because if you hear two Azirs, two Silcos, two Jarvans, or any of them, it's going to be really strong. But look at this board right now. It's really unfortunate, I think, for Snooty Boo. He has it the six only a four Vanquisher board, but he needs that needle two star. Yeah, also, the Thieves Gloves currently doesn't get 40% anymore, but I told you, do not blame me when it comes to mathematics, Wida. It only gives 20% chance, but it was still a lot of amount in that last fight. And now we're off against Nuribu and Exo, which still has that Milio. He has a blue buff on Emuida. Does he have enough damage to win against Nuri's board or not? He definitely should have, and that he has that T he has that Bramble Vest. Sorry, I've been TG brained by you right now, Morgan. Right? But he has the Bramble Vest <laughs> on this Cho'Gath, which means he's going to be negating a ton of the damage that's going to be, be produced by these Vanquishers here. And Snooty, he is slowly but surely falling off towards the eighth place. But B Chris Ooh. might be going there before him, as Hugh been spot, as we saw earlier on, with that recombobulated no. Noxus board, really just has produced a ton. But also remember here, Everything can still happen for B Chris. These two star forecasts that are being re rolled on the bench can turn into any of the three stars on his board any second. I feel like B Chris has one more round. That's it. He has one more round to try and find and pray that these are going to upgrade into something good. If he gets one, one of these rolls, maybe he's looking to sell here to try and get the Nasus. But since he's so low on HP, one more round, he does find, does find the other Nasus. I have to see. Yeah, Pandora is, is the copy him. Pandora is the true copy him here. It gives him an Essence, but uh. no, it gives another Azir. And now he's also still down a two-star Azir or a two-star Nessus from that Pandora's. He skipped so many Zilkos there, but does he really have the option, Wida? He does, and we see someone else is trying to roll down here, trying to st find a stabilization point here. Will be Kevin Parker, who is trying to put his pedal onto the rest of the lobby. Finds that two-star Sire, but he is struggling a little bit for items, so upgrades to this Heimerdinger could be where he goes to try to offset some of that power deficit. And now he goes from Zyko into a board that might be a little bit hard to beat. I think there's seven Noxus with these spats being put in against Huben. The dedication gave him one. He has two Nashwars on that Mordekaiser, so that's a lot of attack speed given to him after he cast that ability. Again, he might have not been able to rack up so many wins in the early game, but now his Noxus is going in. Now he has enemies conquered, and that Mordekaiser is wrecking Havok, specifically that he now has the Aatrox with the Omni Vamp and Darkin buff on him. He reaches the Soraka, doesn't have enough time to kill that Mordekaiser off, and every cast makes him stronger. That Godbreaker, all special thanks to the Bastions, has been triggered the entire round because they give a lot of shields, so that Godbreaker really did him so well. And that Recombobulator in the end might have actually saved the game here because now he's on a win streak. He's able to find that Mordekaiser two-star. He does need one more Tarek and one more Nico. He does have... Oh, there it is. And that's a big thing here to keep in mind. B-Crish did find his way into a another Asir 2, but it wasn't that Asir 3, right? So if he can win just one more fight here, that might be all he needs to get something that can kind of save his game, save your, his save his tournament chances here. But now we are going to see these two boards go head-to-head, -head, Morgan. 
Yeah, and soon as he hits that Nico 3, he's gonna be going again B crest board right now, which maybe might have stood a chance before that last fight. But now, soon as he hits that Nico 3, it could be very quite unlucky. Also, these thieves lost items, you know what? You don't have to think about the crit chance anymore because Runans and Blue Buff are definitely no good items on Darius here. The Sunfire, luckily, from that Nastus is lowering majorly that amount of healing that this Nico gets. But it doesn't matter. A Gunblade Soraka with an Archangel really wants these fights to keep going longer. And if you're speaking about people going longer, I don't think B Chris is going to be going in this lobby anymore because Zico might knock him out. But actually, he has that hidden last stand and he's alive on 1 HP. He still doesn't back. find it. He's 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 survived so many rounds, and you gotta feel so bad here for B Chris. You just needed one of them to turn into a Zir, and it might have saved his his game and also his tournament, like Wita was saying. Unfortunately for B Chris, it does look like he's gonna get knocked out in this round. He could come up against Snooty Boo oh here, who again is struggling. This is your items. Just frontline him at this point. You know what? Or just sell that two-star one and give the Thieves Ghost to, to oh, that KCPM. Oh, fight. Probably more effective. Now he's going against one of the strongest boards in the game and in the lobby against Nunibu, who has six Ionia, six Vanquishers enabled thanks to this board. That Jin is going to be one-shotting his frontline. That is here. Has a Warmox, has a Declaw. He doesn't deal any damage except maybe to the placement of Brick Beakris because that Azir items is not getting him dealing any damage. The bonk falls off. Snooty Boo luckily won another round and now we're down to our top seven players. But Beakris did not get served really well by the Abandors at all. Yeah, really unfortunate here for B Chris. He just shrugs right at the end. You can see his player cam. He's like, eh, I tried. Pandora's tried. Bench was a decent <laughs> option. Just unfortunate. He survived for so many rounds, but just wasn't praised there in the end. And oh, there's a Vanquisher spat here, maybe for Snooty Boo. Yeah, or for Kevin Parker, he also wants that, right? But Kevin Parker was gonna go for an item for his Sire, as we know, currently lacking some power in that department. You can also see his HP total has somewhat taken a bit of a hit here as well. So that, so that's it. going to be a very nice pickup for him and Hupin on a win streak, as we've seen on the back of that earlier. We can probably we've been speaking so much about not really any best in slot items for his units right now. He's going to pick up a last whisper just for a bit of attack speed and armor shred. And look at that Shogath stacking up Ishtalwood since the first round of the game at 2 1. I don't know how much HP that Shogath has, but it would be very exciting if production could tell us. And I think Snooty Boo is getting a little bit too ahead of himself here. Am I reading this correctly? Yeah, it's seven Vanquishers. That is one extra Darius on board, but he's looking for any unit to replace him with, and he does get that Bastion in. Also, a sword buff to that Addy, which has a Vanquisher buff. Now, six Ionia, six Vanquisher Addy. Without any other items, he's not going to be casting anytime soon. And he does go against the board, which I think that he might not have an easy time going against again. Lucky enough, though, that Cho'Gath has a Bramble Vest, so these Vanquishers are getting heavily countered by that fat, strong, very huge Cho'Gath. He might have been able to kill the Milio, but can he kill that Cho'Gath? The Manor keep go keeps going in, whipping endlessly coming in from that Nila. He does reach the back line. Apparently the Zaya is able to deal some damage with the Chancellor, but guess what? I was wrong! Snooty Boo wins that round because Egzo didn't have that Melio still alive until the end of the fight. It's also worth noting, right, this is one of the things that makes this matchup pretty playable for the Vanquisher players. The fact that Saya has so great backline access, as well as that ramping from the Nila, right? It makes it so difficult for the Choke to kind of stick to her, especially with that RFC. But speaking of difficult things to kill here, Tarek Free has come online for Psychos and Vocaboard. This is the Exodia board that we saw before, but it wasn't enough actually. It was just enough to take down in the end, and the Heimerdinger was really the difference. And there is a Heimerdinger on the board, but unfortunately for Zyko, he doesn't have any money to roll down for any of the extra mods. So Heimerdinger just in for now is going to be coming up against Mighty Cho'Gath. Yeah, we just saw Snooty went against that board because luckily he had Ankara Messi on the back line, but Exo, does this Thorok Sorok have any backline access to Emilio? I don't think so. He also has... Another Messi, but this one is only barely two starred. Surviving with that Nico, which is able to tank a lot of that damage coming in, but in contrary, that Milio has some backline access with ability, hopping on, trying to deal his best with that damage. Still, however, the Nico is staying alive. And I think that the Invoker board has a little bit more sustainability because that Nico's HP is definitely not going down anytime sooner. And with all of these units staying alive, overtime comes in. Milio is not able to deal any damage, and Messi is gonna be countered as Exo. Takes one L from Zico going in.
and it's just not enough, unfortunately. It, you feel like every single time these two uh, these two players fight against each other, it's always going to go for uh, overtime because Nico and Chogarth are just completely unkillable until overtime kicks in. But you can see that just the extra healing, the extra damage and survivability in the end from this Nico and Soraka are enough. But we are moving on to stage six now and just looking at the players. There are three players that are on a win streak and Snooty Boo, a player that we thought maybe wasn't able to get into a, a peace of mind really with his board, He's able to get a win streak now on a four win streak. And a few other players as well on a really, really nice win streak. Spody's board is really, really interesting, right? He's not one of the win streaking players. He did just lose his most recent fight, but he is, however, one of our Pandora's bench players. Down to 10 HP here, trying to find that Kaiser free, that Fiora free to come online, to come alive. And if you're free, does it need arrive? And this is one of the few units in the game that will have no issue chewing through that Nico, chewing through that Fiora. This composition, like the challenges, were just a straight up counter to the Cho'Gath when they were still reigning supreme across the entire ladder. This is the seven Noxus for Challenger variation built on the back of the of the synergy between, well, Samira and the rest of whatever is going on. This lobby is absolutely capped out. Yeah, the positioning as well from the Nila is perfect here. Staying away from the Soraka might not be really the best thing you would look for if you were Snooty, but as long as Zegra can keep her alive, as long as the focus stays on that, Nico, she's not getting to the dead anytime soon. Yes, Zaya does have a lot of damage and backline access, but again, Snooty is not able to reach her on time. And even if he did, that Gunblade keeps her alive for as much as you can. Exo now, unluckily enough, goes against the board that just hit Fiora 3 from Spody, and now he is down one life in this lobby to maybe try to get a top 4 from him. Yeah, um, as Wita was saying, I think the Fiora 3 star now is going to be a really big win condition because, you know, that Nico and the Cho'Gath, it doesn't mean anything at all to this uh, Fiora. And honestly, I, I feel like we've hit like four or five, four cost three stars on the stream. So, and we're just on day number two as well. So who knows what's going to happen tomorrow on, on day number three, but it's absolutely wild to see how many four cost three stars we have been getting this weekend. Yeah, now the Night Harvester the, and the Item Slam is perfect. He plays on that Zelko with six Bruisers and he knows he needs that healing as much as he can. Alongside with the Blue Buff giving him as much time for him to stack up. Looking at Spody's board right now with that Fiora, which has been his lucky bailout card, I don't think that it, there is any board that is going to be able to remove him. And also, this time there is no Targon Rise. You cannot eat her into the sky. Maybe Cassante might be your only hope, but I don't think that there's anyone that has a Cassante in it right now. Zico gets another win against Huben, and we're still alive with five players in this lobby as Exo took another win. It's 6 2, and we still got five people alive in this lobby, Vida. Yeah, and Exo was lucky enough to face that ghost, right? So that's something that's going to be very nice for him to work with, but you got to keep in mind here, Spody gets that Conqueror bonus online as well. And with the fact that playing for first and second here is ever so important for these players to make it into day three and keep their Rising Legends finals hopes in place, it must be a massive hit to the morale of someone like Kevin Parker, who just can look at Spody's HP down below him and know he will just overtake him at some point. There are going to be very, very few Play this in right now. You see Psycho at the top of the lobby. He's still chilling away because he hasn't hit Spody just yet. Yeah, no going on against that Fiora board again. Might have been probably, I mean, as if you were in Exo, but he swapped in as Zelko. Luckily, he goes against the Mord board for coming in from Hubin. Again, that Aatrox deals a lot of damage because of the Noxus buffs being placed on him. That Cho'Gath is staying alive for as much as he can. That Mord with a double Nash's Tooth is not going to be dealing any damage to that Cho'Gath. Zilko is keeping up with all of that heal and the Sword buff is enabling him to clear some of the backline units. Jovan also putting a lot of CC, disabling the Mordekaiser from using his abilities simultaneously. Oh wait, the Guard Breaker comes in, the Overtime comes in! He's been able to destroy that Cho'Gath! And now Exo dies of Gwen! Because that Overtime was not in your favor as a Bruiser comp! And Kevin Parker is also down to one life after this fight. Somehow, the Bruiser player has somehow been taken down. It's absolutely insane. Oh, Kevin Parker! He tried to walk all the way around here with Young Wild and Free, and he wasn't even able to get the Aatrox in the end. Unfortunately, he has to deal with just the redemption in the end. But two of our top four players right now are playing these insane Noxus boards. And one of them does have that Fiora 3-star, which is a definitely a completely different variant. I don't think any of us were expecting, but as you were saying, Weeta, Fiora is a unit that, yes, is not very good in the challenger board and not very good as a 2-star, but if you can hit a 3-star, then she can definitely pack a punch. 
She definitely will. And I also like, just remember, if you're anyone here that isn't Huben or Spody, just like see these two players hit like, you know, the, the recombinant of a lifetime into the Pandora's bench reward of a lifetime as well, right? You gotta feel a little bit sad here. It does look like this will be the end of the road for Kevin Parker of this season of Rising Legends. Yeah, he does have the double card breaker coming in from that Zaya. So she receives a lot of value because his composition is full of shields and all that does help the Zaya. But apparently, none of it is gonna be enough because despite all that damage, despite Nila trying her best to reach the back line, this Soraka with the gun blade is just way too strong for Kevin Parker to tank. And now he takes an L and we're down to our top three players. Spody, Huben and Seiko. One of them is gonna make sure that he qualifies to the next day. And I think it might be Spody, but Huben and Seiko. Will we need tiebreakers after this game? Maybe, maybe. I mean, it always comes down to a day from going to day number one to day number two, and also day number two, day number three. Tiebreakers sometimes are going to be the thing, and that even puts more importance of going in first place because that is the first tiebreaker going into it. So not only you're getting first place to try and get the points, but you're also getting first place to try and win out on the tiebreakers. Ah, oh, quite unlucky round now for Seiko. He has the life to stay alive, at least tank one loss from this undefeatable Fiora board. I don't think that no matter how strong you are, if you don't have something that can one-shot it away, just as we stated, this is not a Targon, you don't have a Rise. If it maybe was a Cassante, that would have been really good, but that Fiora stays alive for too long. However, is not able to deal enough damage on that Nico enough. Is it maybe a fraud unit? Is it maybe fake? That Soraka's trying her best, and each time that Kaisa casts, she does have a lot of damage. The Fiora is now against a 1v2 board. The Kaisa stays alive again. Fiora 3 star is just way too strong with these swords, even the overtime one saves Zico and Huben also lost that final fight against the Ghost Wiener. And even with the continuous chain of Heimerdinger grenades landing on that Fiora time and time again, the damage is just not quite there, even though it did look incredibly close at times. She sustained all throughout the damage. All of that extra damage coming through from the Noxious Trace being online here was the big decision maker. But Huben has also lost here. Second place seems out of reach for him. gonna come down to is it's gonna come down to the fiora three star being the main uh you know talking point i think in this game and it's it's such a huge thing you know with being able to go for the uh the recombo the um sorry not the recombobulator that's not the uh uh, oh no, sorry, it was the Recombobulator, but uh, no, sorry, it's not the Recom... Oh my god, I'm getting my mind confused. It's not the Recombobulator player that's gone <laughs> for the uh, I, uh, for the Fiora 3 star. I got completely f confused, but the Pandora's Bench worked out for some people, but didn't work out for some in the end. There was a lot of Recombobs that I, I got Recombobbed myself, Wida. I think I just got evolved into Morgan 2 star. And in this fight... I think Spotty also got an upgrade himself as he puts in that Nefiri, so he now has four challengers that's a 30% buff for that Fiora's attack speed and also with the Darken getting buffed, she has more and more Omnivamp and more and more casts from this lovely Nefiri. Again, the QSS being slammed on the Kaiser, make sure that she also has a lot of attack speed and I don't think no matter how Huben blazes his board, the Fiora is just unkillable, immediately deleting his Mordekaiser out of existence and the more the fight goes on, the more that this Kaiser is going to serve as a secondary unit, dealing a lot of damage. With that BT, with that Titan's Resolve, there is not enough damage for Huben's output and it's going to be dies of Aatrox coming from Spody and I think he already secured the first place. Yeah, and with how tiebreakers are gonna work here, there is a, there's a potential chance that Psycho, with his 20 points going into this game with a second place, might even make his way into day three if he has enough points combined from yesterday going into the day as well. So that's something that we gotta keep in mind here. And it's gonna be that Pandora's Bench, Fiora 3 coming through with the double Noxus emblem, as well as this Nico. We saw this fight be ever so close right before the four challenges arrived. I don't know if anything has changed. And in order to celebrate this one, I think that the mods just added Dice of X to the chat. So does Spotty get to celebrate with the chat with this one, or will he not? It is the final fight in the second day of the Golden Spatula Cup Day 2. And now, Spotty with that 3 star Fiora is seemingly unkillable. He has 7 Noxus, the double dock and the 4 challenges, and he has all he needs in order to do the Zeko's board. That damage coming in from the Kai'Sa is amping up. The Soraka is not able to keep her frontline alive. That Fiora 
Staying alive, Tarek is taking too much damage. Getting pretty close now, right now for that Fiora. Maybe, Maybe the stun might be enough. And the Heimer Digger does land the stun. It's over time. The damage coming in from the Invokers could be enough. She's untargetable by that ability. Able to delete the Soraka on time. And it is dies of X for Spody. You can see him happy and triumphing with that victory. Dance he just made. And it is dies of X for Spody as he takes his last win in day two of the Golden Smash of the Cup. Absolutely incredible. You can see the elation on his face. He just runs Ooh. out and he, he kind of guarantees himself day three. We have to wait until the confirmation comes through. But he was one of the players sitting on 19 points. So I think it's going to be very, very close there. But really insane victory in the end. Absolute carnage right that game. There's just so many things happening left, right, and center. So many high-risk plays coming through. And keep in mind, this could have also been what had happened for B Chris as he was trying to juggle for that Asir free, right? So even though it didn't it did arrive a little bit later, we did get that payoff in the end from the Pandora's bench just on the side of Spody instead. Honestly, Sword and Rita, I'm very happy that I was with both of you two guys today, and this game was magical. It was chaotic. It was lovely. We stayed until stage 7. We got to see that Aatrox saving the game for Spotty. 7 whip streak. And even despite the overtime, that Fiora was just a beast. We got that Dice of X. We got that lovely guitar slam at the end. So now, we also get to have a break. We get to have an interview with Nico. And then back to our analyst desk. And I don't envy them at all. There is so much to analyze in this game. So let us take a small break and go to them right after. Hey, I'm Nico Sanchez, Nico ES23 in game. Uh, I am 31 years old and I'm from Grenade, Spain. Well, uh, I played many Rising Lion tournaments. The most were open qualifiers. <laughs> I mean, I've never made it through them. Yeah, I think it's very positive to involve all tiercees. You know, players like like me. I I, <laughs> I get a spot through tiercees. So yeah, I, I think it could help players around Europe in this case to get more involved in in TFT. To think they they could get get a spot to to Europe and to think they. Could compete. <laughs> I think the strongest TRC would probably be France. They've been awesome uh, over these years. And Germany is very strong too. So I have to say something to <laughs> my com the Spanish community um, and the South Amigos. They gave me a lot in, in last weeks. Uh, I'm here because of them. They made me a better player, and I know one of, of two of them uh, will be with me in GSC, so let's see them there.
Welcome back to our analysts. And after a game that felt like it was heart and gut wrenching, we are back here with some analysis. And of course, we have the final standings of who makes it into day three later down the line, as well as an interview. So don't go anywhere. But first, Peter, let's talk about this very last game. Not the first time we've seen two Noxus emblems make it into a top one. No, I mean, it's been absolutely everywhere. It's been a day of emblems from pretty much start to finish, but I mean, Spotty just managing to find a way to take complete flight in this game. I mean, that ball was terrifying beyond belief. We were theory crafting how, when what possible galaxy it would be possible for Spotty to lose that, that game, but ultimately nobody came up with the answer. But they tried. So B Chris, shout out to B Chris with that crazy Pandora bench. I was mm. like wiggling under my desk in hopes <laughs> and prayers for him to find that Azir, to find anything, slams that TG in order to have anything for the Azir to, to even remotely do damage. Could have maybe had a Silco 3, I'm not sure. There were a lot of Silcos that come around. Also, what you're just seeing, this room recombobulator, Peter, was so mm. good. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. You know, we, we talked about this during the course of the day. We were at the point, we were at the breaking point for these players. Well, they would consider strategies they would normally never even touch with a 10-foot barge pole. Honestly, getting set up for the situation, finding the recombobulator. I mean, you know, I give a lot of credit there to the Dane for being willing to give that chance. and ultimately put together a board that still managed to finish out pretty damn highly. It absolutely did. On the other hand, we did have a couple of players that didn't finish as highly as they needed. To remind everybody, this lobby was the kind of lobby at the cusp where only the very top players would make it into the cutoff. So players like Kevin Parker, like Snooty Boo, unfortunately not able to make it on the back of that. Hurts a little bit because of how significant they were for our Rising Legends circuit and how long they've been participating. But I'm sure we'll see them again in one way or another. However, I'm I'm just Fiora 3 once again, Peter. How many four cost three stars are we going to get? It just doesn't apparently, seem to stop. Apparently all of them. It just seems to be a fact of life that our players need to deal with right now. But I do want to kind of bring in one of the other factors for this game, which we thought would you know, ultimately lead to Zyko winning the game. You know, having Wood Ishtal in place, we actually got to see, you know, whether or not Nico or Cho'Gath was going to be the bigger force to reckon with. I think if we hadn't had a Fiora 3 game, for Zyko just having the Bastion in Soraka, you know, uh, with that Nico 3 pushed all the way to the moon, would have easily been enough to get the win. It would have, but it wasn't. So a little bit of a rise and fall of players here in that very last game. But with that, I believe we are working on our standings to get them to you as soon as possible to know who will make it into that final day. Of course, the Golden Spatula Cups are also going to come into play as well as ladder spots. So there is still a lot to theory craft and our admins, I'm sure, are working overtime to get that all in order. But as we are waiting for that, Peter, what was your favorite comp that you saw today? Oh, gosh. It's, it's so difficult to call for exactly because I've just had my entire memory wiped by just seeing boards after boards being completely annihilated by, you know, three star forecasts again and again and again. I'm trying to think back right to the back to the beginning of the day. I think for me, one of the ones that kind of stood out as being one of the, you know, less completely insanely off the charts boards was Travis's turnaround. I believe in game two with that Piltover board, managing to bring that all the way from last place to first place. You know, it wasn't in the same kind of area for the three star forecast, but it almost, well, I mean, we did get the, you know, the Felios three star at the end of it, but I think that Travis showed that you can still pull off a board that's absolutely ludicrous without necessarily having to get the absolute bleeding edge. Yeah, and it's something that we saw from Lelouch yesterday as well. And I know that these two guys are practicing a lot together. I was saying that on the last day. Uh, so it does make sense that they come up with these kind of comps where you know, oh, that's strong, but they play it like one step to the side. They change up one unit. They change up one emblem rather than what you see normally. And that allows them to kind of take precedent and go into these really crazy strong boards that aren't as expected because of how well they adapt to what the game gives them. 
we can confirm that we are working on getting Wet Jungler here for the interview. I will leak to you that he's currently the leader of the point, so we're so happy to have him and talk to him, hopefully soon TM. But of course, we also want to know who else is on that leaderboard and who made it and who didn't. I was catching us up in the green room saying like, oh, this guy got a second, and this guy got a seventh. So I don't know how they all play out, but I know that there might be some heartbreakers coming up oh, later. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as much as, you know, we get to be the semi-dispassionate observers of this all going on. Of course, you know, we've all got our favorites we want to see get through. It has got to be a heartbreaker, particularly for the players, as they see those results come in. You've got that ambiguity right up to the end. A tiebreaker might still save you. That makes, I believe, we're going to have our final results with tiebreakers taken into account. Yeah, here they are. Of course, the cutoff is going to be in the middle. So all of the players that you are now seeing have unfortunately Ooh. not made it. And it hurts. It hurts so bad. It I'm so hurt. sad. It's only the top 32 that will get through. So Salvi, Raiko, Arzu, Dark Hydra, Sukati, Memo, Potable, all of them not making it. Seems like Kevin Parker, though, on the back what? of tiebreakers is in. Is that right. true? I mean, the tiebreakers give, the tiebreakers take away. Kevin Parker gets a lease of life. Remember, these points will be pretty much wiped free going into day three. So Kevin Parker will have just as much chance, except in a very small tiebreaker situation of getting in. She can be up at the top, but it's all about seeing this next page and seeing who won out day two overall. Yeah, show us the top performers. And here they are, Wet Jungler, we already knew, leading the pack followed by Kubikson and Travis King back on top. Lyris, Ketzer, Dasik back in the top eight is something mm. I think we can all appreciate. But of course, some newer names also making their way into it. Namely, Asad Fuego was somebody we saw at the Super Brawl already. He won Dach ESL Meisterschaft and he seems to not want to stop there. So continues his impressive run this weekend is really, really good to see. I think this, you know, this is one of the factors that kind of comes into play with communities, you know, like the German community, like the French community and things, that when you are a new player coming in, I think it can feel very intimidating to say, you know, I'm coming into a space with all these incredibly accomplished players. But I think the difference is that those incredibly accomplished players are willing to help bring you up to their level and give you the chance to be able to, you know, make your own stories and get your own championships. I couldn't agree more. And with that, let's hear it from one of the absolute top players that EMEA has to offer. He's been reigning on the ladder leaderboard for I cannot remember how long ever since history. It feels like welcome, Wet Jungler. Hello. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us and congratulations for getting that first place on day two. Thank you. <laughs> How are you feeling after today? You, you've had uh, a good run? You've been playing a lot of Ionia? I know I was playing today like four games of Nico reroll and I was offered two times double trouble and both won them like and also like one game of Ionia and the other guy was uh, other game I was playing like Flex, Nyla, Mordecai so with scope weapons. That's really cool. So you hear it here first. It's not always about running for the Ionia. Sometimes clicking on Nico can work too. Well, I really want to, my jungler, I want to ask you the question which I'm asking everybody here. Could you run us through, you know, what's been your, your preparation process for the tournament, and particularly between days one and two? Um, I basically just did nothing uh, yesterday anymore. I was just sleeping. And today I was uh, working in, in the... Um, in the morning um, to help my family and then I just um, went home and then went uh, straight to the games. So I had no really practice. Wow. Even Seems more to practice. work for you. That's yeah. awesome. I'm glad you got some sleep. It's important. Some of our players are a little bit negligent there, but I said it coming in. You're also a player that has been performing really well on ladders. So how do you approach TFT generally? What would you maybe advice for viewers that are trying to get better in TFT, like if you could give them any tips? Um, just watch uh, really educational streamers. For example, I, I really watch much uh, Dishstop or Setsuko, the other and the other NA streamers. Also, I watch the German streamers like Solo Gesang and 
Kevin Parker. So I just watch uh, many streams and try to learn from them and ask for tips. Awesome. So I don't know if you've got the entire list of players for day three to hand, but uh, you know, how, do you, how do you think you're going to do tomorrow? Do you think, is this your time to take the title? Do you, is there anyone else you're thinking he's got a good chance as well? Um, I think like Dasik or Travis have, have um, a really high chance to win this. And also like the other German players like Broken or Assad. I mean, Assad was like, popping off in set nine right now. Yeah, I also hope that Kevin Parker does well since he uh, barely went to day three. Yeah, he had a little bit of a Monk Astero run, I would call it. Yeah. But we're happy to see him go in. I've also been really excited to see uh, Asad pop off, like you said. Of course, we're going to keep our eyes on what is happening tomorrow. But with that, with Jungler, we want to leave you to hopefully maybe this time prep a little bit or sleep some more, whatever you're up to. Any shout outs you want to give anyone you want to greet, perhaps? I want to shout out to the German community for uh, always being there and supportive. I see a lot of people, Germanys in the chat. Also, shout out to my family for having me here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Again, congratulations for today. And we'll hope to see you out there tomorrow with the same type of wins. Thank you. Oh boy. I, I think it never stops astonishing me how wholesome our TFT players are, but Red Jungle is much more concerned with the other German players. I think he was remotely thinking about himself there, so I think, again, it speaks to the quality of the community that keeps improving there, particularly from the German side of things, that that's, you know, that's his first concern. It absolutely is. I love that. We are trying to get you the overview on the Golden Spatula Cup points to tell you how that's looking for the EMEA final qualification. But first, we have another winner here on our desk, which is the winner of our Twitter contest, Peter. Yes, so much like yesterday, we're seeing if you wanted to buy, force or delete here. So, of course, yeah. We're really about who can come up with the most creative and entertaining answer as to this particular question. Uh, and apologies when I get this name horribly wrong. Patrika, Georgie say, I would buy Emilio so we can play football together. Force Olawe to be the keeper with all those tentacles and delete Miles as we can't tackle him since he floats in the air. Honestly, I feel this is a good strategy. There's obviously a lot of thought that's gone into this one. Congratulations on your win. Absolutely. Congratulations. And of course, there'll be another one tomorrow. I'm sure this one was maybe one with a little bit of bias, you know, saying football always does something to mm. a Spanish team. So uh, maybe that's a good hack for tomorrow, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. They always try and find a way to bring football into the equation somehow. I think Milo has been the gift that keeps on giving, along with headbutt comps, however you might refer to them. You mean Zinedine Sorrell? That's just what everybody calls it, Peter. When are you going to get with it? it it's about time. I think that's a question for the ages, Max, and the answer is going to be the answer we disappoint you. I will try it nonetheless, fighting the good fight, you know, relentlessly, just how I do. All of the cool kids call it like that. I've seen it in chat, you know, chat is never wrong, so that must be it. Now, today, we had a lot of emblems once again come through. And I think Wida was mentioned this earlier, that currently in the patch, it feels like specialists are really good again. We've had some mm. patches where they're like, you'd rather not have them unless you can make attack crown. What do you prefer? Do you like when emblems are good? <laughs> I I think personally, I am more of the, I'm more preference when they aren't just because as we saw in this game, I think it kind of like, it really limits you down to what you can play. I mean, it, yeah, as you said, our players are finding a few different ways to apply these emblems, but I'm honestly not smart enough to be able to pull off those in any of my games. So when I get an emblem, I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing for the rest of the game forever. I'd love to personally see, you know, see more hero augments and things coming through just for the variety that they bring. But for our players, I think tomorrow, you know, I think we're still going to be seeing a lot of Earth players coming in just because the reality of where we live right now is that emblems are absolutely very, very good. 
Yeah, we might even see some more creative approaches. For example, for Potable, despite that metabolic not really helping him, I think Pengu still was a good choice. We've also mm. saw the Orn coming out of Travis. We've even saw a saw we even saw i can't speak english saw a twisted fate come out today out of some of the players so i think there's still some more choices with the legends that we cannot just neglect for this moment hopefully they'll get a little bit bolder tomorrow and we might see one or the other caitlin has more dog was wishing for it mm. i still think that's a good tech but with that i believe our golden spatula cup point overviews already peter why don't you remind the class on what exactly that is so these golden spatula points are a way to kind of reward our players, particularly for either high performances, consistent performances, or both. They're a way to get into the EMEA files without necessarily actually winning a golden spatula cup, because of course, that's an instant guarantee. And we've got two of those in place already and we'll have one more by the end of it. But the majority of the golden spatula related spaces are gonna come off of the points of which things have gotten a little volatile, let's say. I think they definitely have zero points uh, will be showing on some of these players because they made it to day three. So that is going to be mm. a big, big point for them to rack up some more points. But why don't we have a look at how everything is going out with the Golden Spatula Cup points here at the top 32. And you can see the TBD. Um, Wait, I'm confused. Is the TBD that they're still getting to day three or is the zero I that they're getting? So, I think TBD I... is that they're going to tomorrow, getting some confusing yes. missed messages here. But yeah, <laughs> we're, TBD we're confused about this and as well, the hex will mean that they will get some extra points for tomorrow. So that is going to be good for all of these players like Canvas, like Ging, like Lalana. All of them still need a little bit more. And then when we're looking at the top side of this leaderboard we're going to see the players that already have a lot of extra points and are looking mm. quite good you know up there with people like scopeus and sonar we're gonna have lacoco jim ray i think we can already say that both of these are looking pretty pretty good and proper for the finals yeah i mean you know as was being discussed on twitter we've had some really good breakdowns there of how many points are essential but you're right right towards the top that's where it's absolutely at of course, it's always nice to see Coco up there as well after an astonishing performance in our previous GSC. Still in place to try and grab a few more and just flex on everyone else who can't quite get there. Yeah, flexing is always a good idea, not only when it comes to comms, but sometimes also when it comes to gloating about being good at the game. Not something that TFT players do a whole lot of, though. If you want to tune in to again tomorrow, then we're going to have our tournament start at 4 p.m. CEST for European mainland. That is going to be in less than 24 hours. And we also have our socials where you can stay in contact on Twitter. It is going to be at TFT Esports EMEA. And then everywhere else, we're even on Facebook. It's at Play TFT. Our casters, Peter, why don't you take us through them? All right, so of course you can see our good cells beneath our portraits at the moment, so we don't need to read those on out. For, of course, Morgan Stewart and Weetercast, who've been doing an incredible job across the day. For Morgan, it's Morgan Casts with an S at the end. For Stewart, because of course he is an edgy boy, it's ITZ Stewart. It's Stewart, but with a Z instead of an S, because of course you couldn't put two S's together, that would just look silly. And Wita Cast with an S as well will be the last one. I believe, or well, hopefully, those will be in the chat as well if you'd like to follow up on this. But yeah, of course, thank you to all of them who've taken part today. Absolutely. Thank you to all the players who didn't make it as well. You've shown incredible strength. We loved having you. We loved watching you. And we hope to see you in the next Golden Spatula Cup, which is going to come your way in set 10. But first, we're going to go to the EMEA finals. And before that, we're going to go to day three. So lots of action still being chewed up and chewed into for the next couple of weekends sorry i'm hungry and with that we are <laughs> going to end our show for today thank you so much for watching and we'll see you tomorrow Stay breaking my own limits, and I won't say.
I'm not gonna win it cause this crown's made for me You just wait and see All my haters getting bitter cause I'm working overtime It's my moment and I own it Stay in focus and I show it You know I'm taking the night, feeling it right, stealing the light And I stay loving myself, serving me well, as you can tell Cause it's my moment I'm the master of my fate Conquering my fears I'm in control and taking names I just speak my truth, babe You should follow suit 